Good morning. Um, County of Ventura Assessment Appeals Board number two meeting for February 12th, 2024 is called to order. Um, Brendan, could you do roll call, please? Yes, thank you. Board Member Little. Present. Board Member Wall. Present. Board Member Lunetta. Present. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Will the audience please remain standing, as well as those of you on Zoom. Everyone in the audience, as well as those of you on Zoom that will be addressing the board today, will now be placed under oath. Please raise your right arm. When I complete reading your oath, please state I do. You and each of you do solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give and the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You may not be seated. Okay, let's go over the agenda review. Thank you, Chair Lunetta. This is a long agenda review, so please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you um, in the audience or on Zoom, you should not hear your name called. I repeat, you should not hear your name called, but if you do hear your name called, 
Please make yourself known by pressing the raise hand button on Zoom, participating by telephone, press star then nine on your telephone keypad. And if you're in person, come forward to the podium. Again, that's only if you hear your name called. You should not be hearing your name called. We're gonna start with item 32. Application number 2210214, Applicant Eighth Family Trust. Continue to March 25th, 2024, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 50 through 51. Again, we have someone raising your hand. Only raise your hand if you hear your name called. Thank you. Items 50 through 51. Please do not raise your hand unless your name is called. All right. Let's just, I'm going to do a sound check because someone keeps raising their hand. Cecilia Wigan, please unmute. Thank you. Are you able to hear us I'm okay? Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you keep pressing the raise hand button. We have not called your name, so please stand by. I, you know what? I, 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 is it lowered now? Uh, I've now lowered it for you, all right? Okay, okay. it says lowered on my side. Okay, sorry, sorry, Zachary. All right, thank you. Please stand by. All right, so picking back up with items 50 through 51, application numbers 22-11055 and 22-11056. Uh, applicant 2015 ESA Project Company, LLC, continue to March 25th, 2024, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 60. Application number 22-11498, applicant Gary Guthworth, continue to April 22nd, 2024, due to a medical-related issue. Item number 70, application number 23-10047, applicant Jessica Alton, denied due to lack of appearance. All right, we have Jessica Alton raising her hand, so item number 70 will be removed from agenda review and addressed later. All right, <coughs> thank you, Jessica. Stand by. Item number 71, application number 22, sorry, 2310071, applicant Musa Tume, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 72, application number 2310074, applicant Gerald R. Maloney Survivors Trust, Ryan Maloney, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 73, application number 2310079, applicant Lydia Perez, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 74, application number 2310089, applicant Richard Galindo and Nomi Galindo as co-trustees of the Galindo Family Trust, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 76, application number 2310121, applicant John Becker, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 77, application number 2310126, applicant Mokhtar Farag, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 78, application number 2310128, applicant Brad McKay, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 79, application number 2310135, applicant Mike Coletto, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 81, <coughs> application number 2310138, applicant Simi Petroleum Incorporated, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 82, application number 2310144, applicant JA Design, continue to March 25th, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item number 83, application number 2310157, applicant Lubana Kades, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 84, application number 2310166, app Applicant Jeffrey Dilbone continued on March 25th, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item number 85, application number 2310167, applicant Shapizar Trust, denied due to lack of appearance. 
Item number 86, application number 2310174. Applicant David Bergeland denied due to lack of appearance. 88, item 88, application number 2310225. Applicant Sui Wong denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 89, application number 2310229. Applicant Joseph Saladino denied due to lack of appearance. Okay, we have Joe Saladino raising his hand, so we're going to remove um, 89 from the denial list. Item 90, application number 2310233. Applicant Rebecca Frank denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 91, application number 2310287. Applicant Wood Ranch on Medical denied due to lack of appearance. <clears throat> item 120 through 126, application number 2210685 through 2210691, applicant Regency Centers LP, removed from the agenda due to the submission of a withdrawal. Item number 127 and 128, application numbers 2210692 and 2210693, applicant TBYCI LLC as lessee, removed from the agenda due to the submission of a withdrawal. Item number 144, application number 2110375, applicant Roberto A. Gutierrez Cardenas, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 145, application number 210489, applicant Luthu L. Corsetti Tambaya, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 146, application number 2110735, applicant Karina Araujo, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 147, application number 2110751, applicant Denny's Incorporated, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 148, application number 2110932, applicant Christina Porter, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 149, application 2111469, applicant Joseph F. Gamarino, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 150, application 2211410, applicant Alex Panamero, denied due to lack of appearance. That completes agenda review. Um, item 70 is read, will be removed from the agenda review. Item 71, application 2310071, Musa Tume is here, so we're going to remove item 71 from the agenda review, and we're going to remove item 89 for Joseph Saladino from the agenda review. No other persons whose name was read have made themselves known. Just checking. All right. <clears throat> that completes the very lengthy agenda review. Uh, recommended action is to approve as read. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda review? So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, the motion carries. <coughs> okay, thank you, Brendan. Um, do we have any public comments? I believe everyone is present for an agenda item this morning. Thank you. Okay. And do we have any board comments? None. I have none. Okay. Okay, let's get going. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, I'll just, be, as the board gets started, before we go through each case on the agenda, I just want to remind, the, since we have quite a number of people online, if you hear your name called, press the raise hand button when your name is called. If you are participating by telephone, press the star then nine on your telephone keypad, or if you're in person, come forward to the podium. Um, several people um, who had been um, denied due to lack of appearance and removed from the agenda review, I just want to remind everyone there's a requirement that at least 30 days prior to today's hearing, you had submitted a hearing confirmation to confirm your attendance. Um, when you have not done so, the uh, 
case is required to be rescheduled to a later date as that deadline was missed. So when we get to those persons, you will be required to reschedule. Um, for everyone else that wishes to reschedule today, I'm just going to let everyone know since we have a lot of people today. Your options are going to be March 25th, 2024, which is our next hearing date, 42 days away, and April 22nd, 2024, which is 70 days away. So anyone requesting a reschedule, if you want to pre-check your schedule before we get to you, again, March 25th or April 22nd, and we'll check in with you as the time comes. All right, um, Chair Lynetta, I'll turn mm -hmm. it back to you. Okay. Uh, starting with item number eight. Application number 210874, Howling Nurseries, Oxnard, Inc. Thank you, Chair Lynetta. And we will be um, getting a status for items 8 through um, I'll go to page 4, 8 through 19 simultaneously. Um, we're going to have one discussion for all of those. Uh, we don't okay. necessarily need to read the cases. And a um, let's see, I have a, someone with 33813 uh, raising their hand. I don't have a name, but we'll go ahead and allow them to speak. Good morning, and who is this? Uh, good morning, uh, Brendan. It's Sean Keegan, agent for the applicant, and I'm with Altus Group. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and rename your Zoom so we got you correctly. All right. Thank you, Mr. Keegan. Um, so, board members, this is a status update. The parties wish to have a special hearing. Um, and so, if they, um, everyone is ready to go, we were, are going to discuss a, a selection of the special hearing date this morning. Um, so, Mr. Keegan, uh, based on prior discussions, we are next going to proceed with the hearing for 2020 and 2021 real property decline in value appeals. Is that still the case as to what we're discussing today? Yes, um, um, that, that's a correct characterization. I think items 8 through 12 are Howelling and CEFF. Uh, the applicant has exchanged uh, documentation with both the business division and the real property division. And um, I, maybe you have to clarify for me. I know we have a hearing date for March 18th, and I was wondering, is, is that the date that we are returning to the board or is March 18th a status hearing? <clears throat> so today, we, the next hearing scheduled after today's discussion will be when the parties present their cases in chief to the board. So um, are you, you mentioned both dates. Are you prepared to select dates for both the real property and the business property? Well, if, if that's what you'd like us to do, that, that's fine. Um, I, I just the, trying to I, I just uh, Yeah. Uh, and again, I'm just talking about items 8 through 13. Right. So for this property, it was previously... Uh, pardon me. Eight, 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 items 8 through 12. Pardon me. Okay. Right. So uh, for this property, I just want to clarify, it was previously agreed that today we are going to be discussing scheduling of a special hearing for the 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021 right. real property market decline in value cases. I just want to confirm that's what you're still requesting to discuss today. Or are you also requesting we discuss the business property? Well, we, some of those items, uh, uh, sir, are items 8 through 12. We're prepared to, um, if we're set for hearing, uh, whether it's just real property or it's both, we're okay with those being scheduled, at least the applicant is, for March 18th. Uh, we believe that there may be a resolution on a couple of applications, but um, we've exchanged documents with the real property division. Um, and March 18th is a date that's in place, right? That is up for this board to decide. The, today's discussion is if all parties are prepared to proceed, then we will confirm March 18th. So just to clarify... Okay. You, Brendan, yeah. can I chime in? Yeah, uh, we're going to go to you. I just want to okay. clarify where Mr. Keegan's at okay. with this because it's not clear. So, Mr. Keegan, you're ready for both real property and business property for 2020 and 2021. The, is it still the yes, case? Yes, sir. Those should be heard on different dates or uh, are you, we'll still check in with the assessor, but would you prefer to have those on two separate dates or one date? for all issues? Uh, one day at this point. Okay. 
So I think we got everything we need from Mr. Keegan. So then, yes, Mr. Bates, clarify if, if you could what the assessor's prepared to discuss today. Okay, yeah, so uh, just in regards to the personal property items 13 through 19, the assessor and the applicant or the agent, uh, we actually have had discussions. We've come to a resolution and I believe a stipulation will be, if it hasn't been sent out this okay. morning, it will be sent out today. Perfect. Um, so those will be resolved and the board does not need to worry about scheduling those for here. Correct. That's items 13 through 19. In regards to the real property, items 8 through 12, the agent and the assessor have been in discussion. As far as we know, at this time, um, we have not received confirmation that we are definitely moving forward. It's just that the information has been exchanged. So I'm a little bit hesitant on setting a special hearing date without knowing that from the agent um, firsthand, because I don't want to ske schedule a special hearing and then for us to, to cancel. I don't know what you would recommend in that case. So to clarify, you've received, the assessor received all the data necessary for 2020 and 2021 real property decline in value. But Correct. you're not certain where the discussions stand? Is that? Well, the assessor has completed the valuation. We've already uh, met with the agent and we've provided them our valuation. So this was as recent as Wednesday of last week. So I believe uh, we might be finding out more information this week as to whether or not. Okay. Unless the, unless the agent is certain that we are moving forward. I, I had not heard that up until right now. Um, <clears throat> well, I'd recommend, since there's no resolution currently, I'd recommend we schedule the special hearing date. Um, Mr. Keegan indicated March 18th still works for him. Does that still work for the assessor? Yes, it does. And then if it's resolved between now and then, okay. So because the personal property is going to be resolved, um, we're going to just, board is just, so let me clarify for the, everyone. Uh, I told the parties this in advance, but the reason why so many cases are on the agenda is to keep them all together. But we've specifically are only scheduled. They're all going to be rescheduled uh, with the understanding that only the 2020 and 2021 real property will be held, heard on this special hearing date. Um, and so it sounds like March 18th works for everybody. Um, <clears throat> And we had I discussed with the parties an earlier start time of 8.30 a.m. due to the length of the case. Mr. Keegan, is 8.30 a.m. okay with you still? Yes, sir. Right. And to the assessor, is that still all right with you? Yes. All right. So if um, board members, um, if it's all right with you, the request would be to continue all these cases to March 18th, 2024 uh, at 8.30 a.m. And that would be the only action necessary. And by Unless you have all, any questions. <laughs> and by all these cases, you're only talking about so 8 through 12. 8 through 19. Oh. Okay, we'll so we're going to reschedule ahead. all of them. Okay. And then if any that are resolved, okay. um, once they are resolved and the signed agreements are submitted to us, those will be closed out okay, and removed. That time. Um, if, um, if they are not resolved, there'll be an understanding with the parties that we're still only moving forward on real property and those others, then we'll have a subsequent status hearing as to what to do with the next part on, on March 8th, if, okay. um, with, if there's non-resolved cases remaining. So it, it is a, a big property with multiple years, and so that is why we're having this unusual discussion this morning. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Brandon? Yeah. Um, if it all gets resolved, because uh, talking, listening to Mr. Bates, it sounds like that is a possibility. Would this meeting not happen? Correct. If so, I, I would clarify. There's multiple tiers to this mm -hmm. um, set of applications, um, but yeah, theoretically, if the issues identified were resolved, we would cancel the special hearing. Um, if specifically, since we're talking about the 2020 and 2021 real property decline value, if those issues specifically are resolved, um, I may be, maybe be able to change the status hearing for the remaining cases to a date where your board isn't coming in just for that single issue, mm -hmm. um, because we're basically setting aside a whole day. Um, but I would work with the parties um, as necessary to identify if it's appropriate to cancel the special hearing date, if we could pick up a different issue for that special hearing date, or if we need to keep the special hearing date. Um, 
So uh, it will be, uh, if, if there's nothing substantial moving forward that day, we would reschedule it so that a board panel isn't coming in just for a few minute discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Clarifies. Okay, I'm um, looking for a motion to move items eight through 19 to March 18th, 2024 with an 8 a.m. start date. 8.30. 8.30. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Keegan, you're all set. All right. Thank you very much for your time, appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that takes us to items 20 and 21, application numbers 21-10536 and 21-10537, Chelsea GCA Realty. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Lunetta. And actually, we yes. can simultaneously also cover items 22 through 25, applications 21-10538 through 21-10541, and 26 and 27, applications 21 okay. 10542 and 21-10543. Um, this is all the same issue. We have Matt Rilla uh, with uh, the attorney's office um, on Zoom for this item. This is another status hearing. Uh, the applicant, or, has, or this, um, Mr. Rilla's firm has related litigation going on in Orange County. I had previously discussed the litigation with county council, and as it, um, while it's not in Ventura County, it uh, significantly relates to the issues before your board. And so today we're just getting a status on that litigation from Mr. Rilla, and then the expectation is that your board would continue for a reasonable amount of time to allow that uh, litigation to make further steps forward. So <clears throat> with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Rilla for an update on the status of the litigation. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Rilla, and I'm an attorney with the law firm of Vallejo, Antle, and Agarwal and Cantor. Um, as the clerk mentioned, I'm here on behalf of two applicants, Chelsea GCA Realty Partnership and CPG Partners LP, which are lines 20 through 27 on the agenda. These appeals all concern the Camarillo Premium Outlets Mall property. Um, first, I'd like to thank the clerk and members of the board for setting the status hearing and for allowing me to appear over Zoom. Um, before I go on to any, any status of the litigation, it might be helpful if I give you a bit of a summary of the background on these appeals and explain how we got here. So my law firm represents Simon Property Group, which owns malls throughout the state of California. And as I already mentioned, these appeals concern the Camarillo Premium, uh, premium Outlets Mall property here in Ventura County. Um, the applicants in these appeals are all various legal entities affiliated with Simon Property Group. The issues involved in these appeals are identical, so I can discuss both of the applicants and all eight appeal applications jointly. Um, back on March 1st of 2021, the applicants filed with the assessor several requests for calamity reassessment pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 170. In the requests, the applicants explained that the mall property was damaged as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we argued that this was because the property was closed to the public as a result of the pandemic and the corresponding state and local orders that started around March 19th, 2020. And the properties were ordered closed for many weeks. On March 4th of 2021, the assessor mailed notices to the applicants denying the calamity applications. And in response to the assessor's denials, the applicants uh, filed these appeals with the Assessment Appeals Board back in September of 2021. As I've already informed the assessor and the clerk of this board, um, our client is already engaged in litigation in Orange County on the exact same legal issue that is the subject of these appeals. And that legal issue is whether a property owner can qualify for Section 170 calamity relief in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our client already had a hearing before the Orange County Assessment Appeals Board back in 2022. The board ruled in that case that the assessor's denial of the Section 170 claims was proper. We appealed that board's decision to the Superior Court, and this litigation, we believe, will eventually provide an answer to the legal que question at the crux of these appeals. Um, it should eventually resolve the legal issue for the whole state of California because we expect that this case is going to end up going to the Court of Appeal, if not the California Supreme Court. 
Um, after we filed the lawsuit, I asked the clerk of this board to put these appeals on hold and place them in abeyance while the litigation proceeds through the courts. Um, it's my understanding that the clerk conferred with county counsel and he agreed to put these appeals on hold at that time and scheduled this hearing so I could provide an update to the board on the status of the litigation so I can provide that update now. The county and the board um, in our case have both filed their answer to the lawsuit. And the next thing that we have coming up is a trial setting conference, which is scheduled for March 1st. So at that March 1st trial setting conference, we're going to set a trial date, which I estimate will be in the next eight to 12 months, depending on the court's calendar. So uh, that's really all the, all the update I can provide at this time as to the status of the litigation. Um, so today, I guess I'd be asking that the board continue to hold these appeals in advance while that court litigation proceeds. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Ella. Okay. So given that update board, um, well, Do is, does the assessor have any comments before we discuss the potential date? Uh, no comments from the assessor. Um, so board, a uh, reason I wanted to bring this as a status, um, if your board agrees with the, or understands the discussion from Mr. Rilla, we could go beyond our normal extension period and give him a later date, or as I previously mentioned, we have uh, two upcoming dates available. So one, I, I wanted to gauge time period as to what your board was thinking for bringing this back for another update. I would think we'll go out further. I'd say go out further, yes. What are the options? Uh, Brandon. And Brandon, I have a question. Yeah. Is there a two-year waiver on file? There is, yes. Thank you. Um, so if if um, your board wants, you know, we could go six months out. We could go to the end of the calendar year 2024. Um, we could do 60 days. And so I just wondering general time period as to what your board was thinking, and then we could propose some date options. What do you think? Six months? Six months, I'd say. Think? Yeah. Six months would be fine. I just or, understand that this process could take a while. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So it would yes. probably yes. just be for another status update. Maybe six months out, Brennan? All right. Um, so these, we, because we are dark most of summer, that would put us at October 28th. Mm -hmm. um, so a little more than six months. Mr. Rilla, would you be available on October 28th for a subsequent status update on the litigation? Yes, that should be fine. All right. <clears throat> Um, all right, board members, so we just need a, a continuance to October 28th uh, for another status. Okay, do I have a motion to continue to October 28th, 2024 uh, for, a, for a status update? So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, uh, motion carries. Right, thank you, Mr. Rilla. You're thank you, Mr. Rilla. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. Okay. Um, it looks like we've got two items item 28 and item 29, applications 2110871 and 2210715, uh, Ventura Energy Storage. Yes, looks like we have uh, Debbie Lossell on Zoom for this item. Thank you, Ms. Lossell. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Debbie Lasell. I'm with uh, Deloitte Tax LLP, uh, mm -hmm. working with the uh, taxpayer Ventura Energy Storage. Uh, this is a battery energy storage uh, facility that was operational for the 2022 lean date and was under construction for 21. There's also an open appeal for 23, uh, for which a hearing date has not been scheduled yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, the assessor handling the appeal on the side of the county uh, changed in January of this year. Uh, we've had two uh, meetings with the assessor and, and uh, have exchanged some information for the 2021 appeal year, and there are some preliminary findings uh, for 22 and 23. Uh, we're, we're, we're still uh, discussing the issues, but uh, given... Uh, the recent change in personnel, uh, I, I, I think both sides were amenable to uh, continuing this and uh, hopefully uh, resolving uh, 21 very, very shortly and then working to resolve 22 and 23 together. But uh, I guess I'll, if um, 
uh, Mr. Vernon from the county has any comments or if I've characterized anything incorrectly, uh, please, please, please go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Lossell. Uh, to the assessor. Uh, this is Steve with the assessor. Um, yeah, I agree with the agent. I think the only thing that I would like to add is for 22, it looks like we have not received any data. Um, but for 21, uh, yes, our appraiser, Joe Vernon, has been working with the agent and um, and there might be a possible resolution there. Okay, so would you need a data proviso then for the 2022 tax year? Okay, um, 30 days from today's date? Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Lussell, do you have a, uh, a date preference? We have currently March 25th and April 22nd. Uh, could we could we pick April 22nd uh, with the, the understanding that it is our intention to keep working towards resolving these in advance of a hearing? Yes. And would you be able to provide the assessor with any necessary data for the 2022, um, 2022 tax year claim? Uh, within 30 days of today's date? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024, with the data provided so that any necessary information is provided to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, that motion carries. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lossell. Uh, thank you. I uh, uh, appreciated the that I could connect via Zoom. Uh, do I need to stay on the line for anything else? I do not believe you have any other items on today's schedule, so you're all set. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Okay. Um, item 30, application number 2210008, Robert Baker. Mr. Baker, please come forward to the podium. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Baker, we don't need any documents at this point. We're just looking for an update from good, you. Yes, good morning, Mr. Baker. Are we moving forward with your case today? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, and is the assessor prepared to move forward today? Yes, the assessor is prepared. We anticipate our case to take about 30 minutes. Okay. And the applicant has requested and paid for written findings of fact in this case, so this would be our first hearing going forward today. Okay. Uh, Mr. Baker, do you have an estimate of how long you think your presentation will take? I would say 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, we will come back to you after we review the other Thank items. You. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Item number 31. Application number 22-10057, Erica M. Boyer. Yes, um, I'm, if Michelle Veronese is on Zoom, please press the raise hand button or star then nine. I see Erica Boyer on Zoom. Ms. Boyer, um, if you want to uh, address this, you can go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, faintly, but Hello? yes, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? All right, let me see if this works better. Uh, good morning. Yes, I am Michelle Veronese, attorney, rep, uh, representing applicant Erica M. Boyer in application 22-10057. Um, and I'd like to uh, provide the uh, appeals board uh, with this information that I've spoken with the assessor, Joe Phillips. Big thank you to him for his good work and diligent work. And we have confirmed that this matter has been resolved and all actions needed to be taken by the assessor have been completed. And so as such, we would like to uh, withdraw our appeal for application 22-10057. And also a big thank you to the clerk for his assistance in this as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Board members, as this has been withdrawn verbally by Ms. Veronese, uh, no further action is necessary by the board. Thank you, Ms. Veronese. 
Thank you, Ms. Varians. Thank you kindly. Okay. That takes us to item number 33, application number 2210376, Pocatomic. I do not believe anyone uh, checked in for this item. If you're present on Zoom, please press the raise hand button. All right, no one has checked in for this item. Recommendation is to deny due to lack of appearance. Um, do I have a motion to deny due to lack of appearance? So moved. I second. Uh, no objections, that motion carries. Okay, item number 34, application number 2210571, Philip P. Nemi. <clears throat> Thank you, and as you were not here for the swearing in, I understand you were in traffic. Um, we're gonna place you under oath real quick. Please raise your right arm. We need you to solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give and the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Are we moving forward with your case today? We are. Okay. Um, and to the assessor, are you prepared to move forward with this case? The assessor is uh, planning to move forward. We anticipate our case to take about 10 minutes. Okay. <coughs> and about how long do you expect your, case, your uh, presentation? Ten, ten minutes. About 10 minutes? Ten, okay. 10, 15, if you okay. move slowly. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, and sorry, ma'am, can we get your name real quick for the record? Sure, it's Kathy, and my husband, um, he, he can't speak, so I'm speaking for us. Um, is Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y, and you. last name, Z is in zebra, O-T-N-O-W-S-K-I. Thank you. Uh-huh. And your Mr. Nimi is identified on wife. the schedule. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I just want to confirm, um, you are not requesting written findings of fact in this matter, Correct. <laughs> correct. Yeah, I don't even know what that means, but we're not. Yes. <laughs> and was the assessor? The assessor is requesting, yes. Requesting findings of fact? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can have a seat. We'll, okay. we'll return to you. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, item number thirty-five, application number twenty-two, one zero seven six three, uh, Shanae D. Collar. I'm not seeing anyone on Zoom for this item. If you're present, please come forward or press the raise hand button now. Again, if participating by telephone, press star then nine. Seeing no one come forward, recommended action is to deny due to lack of appearance. Do I have a motion to deny due to lack of appearance? So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, that motion carries. Okay, item number 36, application number 2210872, Timothy Holder. Yes, we have Fabiola Carls on Zoom for this item. I've allowed her to unmute. Are you there, Ms. Carls? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Are we moving forward with this case today? Uh, we would like to provide a status report. Uh, this is Fabiola Carls for Timothy Holder. Um, we have exchanged information with the assessor's office. There was information that was pending from the DMV that we received on Friday. We have forwarded the information to John Werner, the assessor's um, uh, office representative, and we would like a short continuance so the parties can uh, resolve the issues prior to the next hearing. Is this acceptable to the assessor? The assessor is in agreement with the continuance. Um, it looks like data has been exchanged and uh, just needs to be reviewed. Okay. Um, Ms. Carls, we have uh, dates available March 25th and April 22nd. Either one uh, it works for us. I will defer to the assessor um, so that he can review the data. Uh, since data is, has already been exchanged, I would prefer the March 25th date. Okay. Uh, March 25th. Is that March 25th um, acceptable, Ms. Carls? Yes, it is. Okay. I'm looking for... 
a motion to continue to March 25th, 2024. Um, so moved. I second. And hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Carls. Thank you so much. Okay, item number 37, application number 2210894, uh, Wigan Farms. We have Cecilia Wigan on Zoom for this item. Are you there, Ms. Wigan? I'm here. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, good morning. Are we going forward with your case today? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward to ask for a uh, continuance. I was working with Joe Vernon, the assessor. He reassigned me to Michael. Uh, Sorry, I have to get all the notes here. Uh, Michael Gilger, I spoke with him this week. We need to get out and he wants to do an assessment on the boat. I'm just not prepared to do the repairs on the boat. Taking months and months to even find the issue. I, we're in the middle of it all. So I'm just not prepared at this time, but I, I am working on it to be prepared. And I would like to ask for the continuance 70 days out so I can get things together and be prepared for the April 22nd. Okay. Uh, would this be accessible, uh, acceptable to the assessor to continue to March, uh, April 22nd? Yes, the assessor agrees with the April 22nd continuance date. Uh, we did have a change in, in staff. Okay. So uh, there is a new appraiser assigned to this case. Okay. Um, but it looks like we're still waiting on the documentation. So if we can request the proviso 30 days from today. Okay. Um, okay. Did I need to ask a question because I did reach yeah. out to Michael uh, Gilder and he told me that if I have any questions and he can't really answer them that I need to get to this need to get to the clerk of the board's office to make sure that I'm clear. So who would I be uh, contacting? What's a name or a person so I can know what you need to get prepared in the next thirty days and move forward properly? Can I have some advice? Yes. Uh, that would be whoever the assessor is assigned to the case. Mr. Bates, can you clarify who she needs to contact? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so Michael Gillinger is the appraiser. Uh, the appraiser that you just mentioned, he is the one that would be receiving the documentation. He might have just been referring to today's hearing um, regarding the clerk okay. of the board. But regarding data, that would Understood. be our I, office. I just don't need all this. I'll get back with him and make sure that he knows so I, I can find out what he needs me to get ready for him and we'll move forward together. Thank you. That direction. And Ms. Wagon, would you be able to provide any necessary information to the assessor within 30 days of today's date? Um, I, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what he needs, so I will do my very best. How about that? And, I'll, and I, if it doesn't work out, who would I contact if I need more time? Just to work with him? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'll, I will give it a good faith effort. I've already been in touch with him. We've had a couple conversations last week and some emails, so I am working on it. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 with uh, data proviso um, information to the assessor by 30 days from today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, the motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Wigan. Thank you very much. Okay. And let's see. Brendan, looks like we have, uh, is it 38, 39, and 40 through 43? Yes. So these items are all represented by Beauty Lassen and Miller. We have Michael LeBeau on the uh, line for this item. They are, the first one is real property and the, uh, the other two blocks are business property. So I'm not certain if we want to discuss them all together or separately, but we'll see what Mr. LeBeau has to say okay. about that. Okay. Mr. LeBeau, are you there? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Are we moving forward with Michael any Lebeau? Of these? Oh, but, but I'm sorry. Let me make my appearance. Michael Lebeau, Buley, Lasley, and Miller for the applicant movie co entertainment lessee, also with Carmike Cinemas and American Multi Cinema Inc. Thank you. Thank you. And are the, we moving forward with any of these cases today? Uh, the applicant is not moving forward with any of these cases today. The applicant has, uh, I believe, reached the settlement with the assessor's office regarding all of the personal property cases. 
the only case that might go forward would be the real property case, which is, um, I believe, 2210915. Uh, the applicant in this case, me, I'm sorry, the applicant's agent, me, uh, I am sitting in my remote office with uh, a COVID diagnosis, oh. and I uh, request a continuance due to that. I cannot make this appearance in person. Okay. And... And the so, remaining ones we expect to have settled. So to clarify, it's 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 um, item number thirty-eight only that you're requesting the continuance for. I'm requesting a continuance for all of them. The the remaining ones we need to uh, 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 execute stipulations and give them okay. to the assessor's office. Okay. And that that procedure is in process. And we have uh, two dates available: March twenty-fifth and April twenty-second. Just a moment, Mr. Chairman. April 22nd would be the preferred of the two. And to the assessor, um, is an April 22nd continuance acceptable? Yes. So for item 38, the assessor agrees with the continuance. Uh, if we can add a proviso for data 30 days from today. Okay. And then um, the applicant hand. Yeah. Applicant agrees to that date. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. And and for the personal property for items thirty nine uh, and then forty through forty three, uh, car mic cinemas that uh, um, we actually have stipulations in progress for this one, and okay. we actually do have other information about about that, but I'm not really sure that it's necessary to probably discuss. But we are handling the stipulations. Okay. So we don't need data on that, but a continuance would be. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's um, start with 38. Um, looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 with a data proviso, uh, data be provided to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, the motion carries. Now for um, items 39 and 4043, uh, we just need to set a continuance date, um, March 25th. Does that work for both parties? Or would you prefer April 22nd? Um, I would actually just prefer, well, you know, it, uh, yeah, I'd prefer the April, well, the April 22nd just to, so that they all have the same okay. date. Then looking for a motion to continue items 39 and 4043, 40 to 43 to April 22nd, 2024. So moved. I second. And hearing no objections, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. LeBeau. Hope you feel better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Thank you to the assessor's representatives and Mr. Clerk. Have a good week. Good. Thank you, too. Okay. Okay. Let's 44 see. through 47 can be handled. Simply. Okay, yes. Actually, 48, sorry. 44 through 48. Items 44 through 48. That's application numbers 2210955 through 2210959, Lowe's Home Centers. We have a. Mac in zero two on Zoom. I'm assuming that's Natalie Marike. Is that correct? That's correct. Good morning. Um, this is Natalie McCary, attorney with Bakery Drinker Biddle and Reef, appearing on behalf of the applicants. Good morning. Are we moving forward with your cases today? Um, so we would like to request, if possible, a continuance to April 22nd. Um, I'm a new attorney with the firm, and um, there was a bit of confusion with hearing notices with my predecessor leaving. Um, so we have made some headway on um, the first of these cases. We've shared our initial valuation with the assessor's office, um, and we would just like a bit more time um, to share that, to share information on the additional appeals. And to potentially seek resolution um, before hearing. Okay. Um, and to the assessor, you accept, is a uh, continuance acceptable? Yes, yeah, so we agree with the applicant. Data has been exchanged. We just need time to review that. Uh, so a continuance okay. date of April 22nd works for us. Uh, Ms. McCary, is April 22nd work for you? 
Yes, thank you. That's wonderful. Okay. Um, and does the assessor need a data proviso? Okay. Yeah, we can add it just in case. Okay. 30 days? Yes, yeah, since it's April, 30 days from today. Is okay. And um, Ms. McCary, is, uh, is that acceptable to you? Any data that the assessor may need, you, can you provide it to them within 30 days? Yes, that's. I, I would like to note that um, the assessor's appraiser that I've been working with, Mr. Joseph Phillips, and I had discussed um, focusing on one appeal. Um, so we, um, you know, just, just to resolve the first appeal and then move on to the rest. Um, but we will try and, depending on those discussions, um, you know, provide information for all the remaining appeals as well. So I just wanted to note our, our, our strategy. Okay. Thank you. I'm looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024, with a data proviso that any additional information is provided to the assessor within the next 30 days. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Thank McCary. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Is it too late for us to ask for items 45 through 48 to also be included? Or did that, we already that, include it? That applied to everything. Yeah, that applied okay. to everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, item number 49, application number 2211038, John and Kathleen Devon. Mr. Devan, please come forward to the podium. Thank you. Good morning, John Devan, appearing. Good morning. Are we moving forward with your case today, sir? Yes. Okay. And approximately how long do you expect your presentation to take? I imagine my time, if I get to it, will be a half an hour. They're denying jurisdiction, and I have to go out in the hallway and speak with them on the issue and see what they have. Okay. It'll be real quick if there's no jurisdiction. Okay. To hear it. And um, to the assessor, are you prepared to move forward? Yes, the assessor is prepared to move forward. We anticipate our case to take about five minutes. <clears throat> okay. And Mr. Devan has paid for written findings of fact and requested those. So this will be findings of fact. I, I did inform Mr. Devan this will likely, be, as we have two other cases moving forward, that we will probably get to this after lunch. So I let him know if, if he'd like, he can come back around 1, 1.30. I can also give him a call when your board goes to lunch to inform him as to the exact um, return time. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Grant. Thank you. Okay, item number 52, application number 2211136, Liberty Finance Partnership. We have Ken Smotries by telephone with us today. Mr. Smotries, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, you're a little low. If you could speak loudly, that would be appreciated. And I'll turn it back to okay. you. Okay. There we go. That's better. Good morning, Mr. Smotrees. Um, are we moving forward with this case today? I would like to request a continuance to the April 22nd date. Okay. Um, to the assessor. Does the assessor... Um, yeah, the assessor agrees with the continuance, and if we could just add the data proviso. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smotries, you said April 22nd date, correct? Yes. And will you be able to provide data to the assessor within 30 days of today's date? Yes. I provided some last week, and they came back with additional requests. So we're working on that to get that, uh, get that information to them. Okay. I'm looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 with the data proviso that any required information will be provided to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Smokeshees. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Okay. Item 53, application number 2211329, North Shore Healthcare Holdings. Just a second. Good morning. All right. 
I believe, sorry, my computer crashed. Um, <laughs> I think it's back up now. I believe we have Nathan Gangloff with Altus. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Are we moving forward with this case today? Uh, no, I believe that this is going to be a, a post comment request. Continuous request, please. Okay. Um, is it assessor? Um, is that acceptable to the assessor? A continuance? Uh, yes, a continuance is acceptable and also a data proviso since um, our office has not received information from the applicant yet. Okay. Um, and to the applicant, um, the, we have March 25th and April 22nd, and the uh, assessor is requiring um, the, they be provided with data within 30 days. Okay, very good. Uh, would the April 22nd date uh, be available? The assessor, yes. Okay. Right, great. Looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 with data due to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, item number 54, application number 22-11330, CarMax Auto Superstores. I think Nathaniel Bradder is on Zoom for this item. Is that correct? We have a few people from Ryan LLC, so I just want to make sure. Is it you, Mr. Bradder? Good morning. Yes, okay. Nathaniel Bradder representing the applicant from Ryan LLC. Good morning, sir. Um, are we moving forward to this case today? No, we are not. I am going to be asking the board to invoke jurisdiction to amend this application. Um, the following application was filed on a CarMax. However, there was a mistake made where we only included one parcel. This economic unit is made up of three. So we would like the board to invoke jurisdiction to in have the appeal include the other two parcels that have been left out before this appeal can be heard. Okay. Um, to Brendan. So um, the board is required to hear the and determine the value of the entire economic unit upon appeal, but is only um, able to adjust those where there's been appeals filed. So regardless if there's appeals filed or not, your board still has to consider the value of the entire economic unit. Um, so I would advise that we continue this um, to allow for the case in chief to be presented. And then as part of that presentation, Mr. Bradder should present a legal analysis as part of his presentation to show why he would believe your board has jurisdiction to adjust the non-appealed parcels. Um, we have not provided, uh, Ryan LLC has not provided significant um, legal references to show that your board would would or would not have jurisdiction to invoke as he's requested. So uh, we would just request that be part of his presentation. Uh, at current time, we believe your board is only allowed to, like I said, they have to um, hear the entire economic unit, but may only adjust those where appeals were filed. Um, and so without further legal citations uh, and then review by county council, we would say that the request is probably not valid. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just suggest we just set a hearing to discuss this in greater detail. Okay. Uh, Mr. Breder, is, uh, is that acceptable to you to set a date for continuance um, where this can be discussed further? Yes, that, that is acceptable. Okay. Um, I just have one question. So as part of my presentation, I would provide that legal basis. And then would the board make a decision on the spot while hearing the value of the case? Most likely because the board would take that under submission and decide as part of their mm -hmm. decision. It, um, 
if the entire economic unit can be adjusted or not, if applicable. Uh, it may not even be a question if the board you know, sustains the assessor's position, then they don't have to weigh in on that second question as to if the additional parcels can be um, adjusted or not because it wouldn't apply. But that's likely mm -hmm. what would happen is the board would not make a decision on the spot. They would take it under submission. And then when they come out with their decision, determine if it could apply to multiple parcels or the single parcel on which the appeal was filed. Understood. That makes sense. And just a follow-up question. So that would make um, a stipulation difficult with the assessor's office. Is that correct? Because yes. it would depend on... Okay. That yeah, we would sense. deny any stipulation Thank you very much. for the parcels that were not appealed. Okay. Understood. Um, Thank you. Then that is all. So if you if you'd like, we could. I guess we should probably check in with the assessor. We mm -hmm. could set a hearing just for the board to determine jurisdiction, where Ryan LLC would come in and present their legal arguments as to why your board should take jurisdiction over the additional matters, um, if necessary. Um, so is that kind of what you're requesting, Mr. Bradder? Is the board first determine jurisdiction? Basically. Yes, I think that would be the best case. Yeah. Basically, to bifurcate the hearing. Mm. Okay. Split it apart. I think it would be wise to hear the juris the uh, jurisdiction issue yeah. first. First, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 And does the assessor have any comments? The assessor agrees with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the the jurisdiction hearing, if cited with the applicant, would allow for a stipulation to. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so we would be um, we would be bifurcating the hearing, hearing the uh, the issue with um, jurisdiction first. And Mr. Uh, Brader, do you have a preference with the date? We have two dates available: the March twenty fifth, April twenty second. Preferred. Okay. And is that acceptable to the, to the assessor? Yes. Okay. I have a question. Is this April 22nd hearing just for the jurisdiction? Yes. yes. And we will hear the valuation at some later date. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 um, for the to resolve the question of uh, jurisdiction. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, that motion carries. I'll just note, Mr. Bradder, if, if you're able to send over your analysis to the clerk of the board to show that uh, the law says the board does have jurisdiction, if that's clear, we will confer with county council and we could um, review and discuss that with the county council and the assessor beforehand and potentially weigh in in advance if it's abundantly clear that the board does have jurisdiction. Uh, it's just at this point we have nothing in front of us to show the board has jurisdiction. Um, so if, if you want to send that to us in advance, we will review it. Understood. And you said to the clerk of the board? C correct. The clerk of the board is responsible for jurisdictional matters that have to do with okay. application filing. So this would fall into where the clerk of the board would need to analyze if additional application filings are valid or not make a presentation to the board. Understood. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Okay. Um, item number 55, application number 22-11337, Bright Peninsula Road. We have Dylan Hoyes on Zoom for this item. Thank you. Yes, hi, good morning, Dylan Hoyes from Ryan. Good morning, sir. Are we moving forward with this case today? You know, we, we're we gonna request a continuance on this. Um, it is our understanding that the owners are uh, looking to commission uh, an appraisal, a third party appraisal. Included. As we've gone through the process, we've concluded that that's probably the best course to take here. Um, it's a land, it's a land deal with a couple of things going on with it. And, um, 
We think that's probably the best. So as a result of that, we would request that this one, um, we would request if it could be reset to April 22nd, that should give us enough time um, just for this case. And then I'll speak to the other cases after this. Okay. And to the assessor? The assessor agrees with the April 22nd date. Uh, looks like we have not received data on this. So if we can add a proviso 30 days from today. And to the applicant, will would 30 days from today's date be acceptable in terms of providing information to the assessor? Um, we can be we can facilitate some of the information by then. Uh, I hope to have the third party appraisal completed by then. It could be slightly after that, but I'll certainly uh, continue to keep um, the appraiser, Mr. Zach Clifford, uh, uh, apprised of, of the status of that. Okay. Um, and we'll try to get it. We'll try to get it by then. If we did 30 days prior to the hearing date, would that be accessible or yes. acceptable? Yes. Okay. Yes. That'll give you an extra 10 days or so. Um, okay. Uh, looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024, uh, with data due to the assessor um, by 30 days prior to the hearing date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Hoyes. And Mr. Hoyes also has Thank some you. other items on the agenda. If oh. we just want to jump to those while we have him on the line, that's going to be items 61 through 66. Okay. Um, application numbers 22-11575 through 22-11577. SHM Anna Kappa Isle. And 64 through 66. Okay, and 64 through 66. And as I stated, this is for Mr. Hoyes again. Yes, uh, yeah, Don Hoyes, agent for the applicant. Um, we provided the information, uh, believe we provided the information, but it was, um, I think about three and a half, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago or something. So I, I do believe that, uh, you know, for both sides, um, we probably, we probably needed to get continued out to the next hearing date of March. Was it March? Um, March 25th. 22nd? March 25th. 25th. Uh, just for us to both go through the information that has been provided so far. Uh, again, I've been in contact with Mr. Zach Clifford on, on these as well. Um, and I believe the intent here is for us to just move it to that 25th day so we can you know go through the information that's been submitted. Okay. Uh, to the assessor. The assessor agrees with the continuance of March 25th. Um, that is correct. We did receive late data, less than 30 days. So we just need time to review that. Um, I would like to just add a, a proviso just in case if we do, if we are missing something, um, that would probably be 30 days prior to the March 25th date. Okay. And would that be, is that, a, is that doable for you, Mr. Hoyes? Uh, yes, sir, it is. Okay. I'm looking for a motion to continue to March 25th, 2024, with data due to the assessor uh, 30 days prior to the the appeals date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, that motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hoyes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It takes us back to 56. Mm -hmm. Okay, item 56, application number 22-11385, Carefree Communities. We have Charlie Young with Duchar McMillan and Associates on Zoom for this item. Are you there, Mr. Young? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Are we going forward with your case today? Hi, good morning. Um, we would like to request a continuance to April 22nd. Um, the consultant who originally filed this appeal has left the firm. Um, we have an incoming California consultant starting next week. Uh, so we would just like to be allowed time um, for onboarding and review for the new California consultant uh, and for them to work with the assessor. We, we understand information has not been provided, so we are amenable to um, providing the information 30 days from today. Okay, thank you. To the assessor? The assessor agrees. Okay. Okay, looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 with a data proviso that uh, data is provided to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. 
Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. And it looks like we have, is it says 57 through 59, Brendan? That is correct. Um, that hearing is going to go forward. And since it's going to be our fourth hearing, the, the day I did dismiss the applicant to come back okay. uh, after lunch. And once your board uh, begins hearing Mr. Devan's case, I will let them know that their hearing will be coming up soon. They are requesting written findings of fact. And, and that hearing is expected to take about an hour um, I don't know if the assessor has any additional information, but uh, yes, moving forward, fourth hearing of the day, findings of fact requested. Okay, and the, to the assessor? The assessor is prepared to move forward. We anticipate our case to take about 45 minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. App, uh, items 64 through 66, application numbers 2211578 through 2211580, SHM Ventura Isle LLC. Sorry, Mr. Chair, we did actually just take care of that with Mr. Nope. Boyce, so we're at item 66. <laughs> Sorry about 68. that. Thank you, Brennan. Um, application or item 67 through 68, application numbers 2211672 and 2310011. Uh, Carola L. Buhe. Ms. Buhe, come forward to the podium, please. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Are we moving forward with your case today? Yeah, I'm looking for a reschedule a date because I have a bunch of documents I need to give to Joey this Thursday. I have okay. a meeting with, to okay. appointment with him, please. Okay. Um, to the assessor? Yes, we're in a agreement with the continuance, um, but the assessor feels perhaps a discussion with the board needs to happen on this one, uh, and it's because um, there's an, an owner on the deeds that we need information from, um, and the applicant has shared with the assessor that there's no longer any contact with this mm -hmm. either. We're not sure if they're truly an owner or not. We need some information from them. Uh, the applicant said this other person is not going to interact with the applicant or the assessor's office in any regard. Uh, so we thought perhaps a um, subpoena may need to be issued in right. order to force her cooperation okay. in this process. Um, I do have the deeds here that might kind of clarify that for the board. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Um, to Brendan. <coughs> Sorry, to clarify, so is the assessor prepared to discuss the request for subpoena today, or do you want more time to go um, over the documents Ms. Buhe has and then come back to the board to discuss that further? Um, I would like both the subpoena as soon as possible, please. Yeah, perhaps we can have the subpoena discussion today. Um, Okay. I, I didn't prep the actual subpoena document, but mm -hmm. uh, I thought we'd have more of an, a kind of informal discussion on how to move forward on it with the board, uh, whatever you okay. guys think is best. Um, what do you think, ben? Uh, Perhaps we can look at the deed and make sure the person's name is on the deed that we would issue the subpoena for. Okay. But I think we can formalize the subpoena information quickly. Okay. You want to do that? All right, so we'll go ahead and do Thank you, Brennan. Then that way it can move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Would the applicant like to tell us the person? Do you need a copy? Yes, okay. please, situation. Okay. Let me see what you have. Assessor's exhibit yeah, A. Yeah, suppose been... okay, that's, this needs to be in her name and my name. And she's, she didn't put my name. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, if I could explain real quick. Yeah, that's uh, fine. The first page that you're looking at here, this was a deed recorded in July 9th, 2015. Uh, you'll see that the in this deed, 
the only person being granted ownership is a Sharon Geyser. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second deed that you have is recorded on November 4th, 2021. And it's showing Sharon Geyser is granting to Carol Bouhey, um, who is the applicant today. Right. Um, so uh, Carol has filed an appeal um, basically saying she's always had ownership. Yes. And she has some supporting documents to show that. But we also need um, some information and a statement from Sharon Geyser regarding this recorded deed in 2015, mm -hmm. why... Uh, Carol's name is not on this deed. And, um, you know, we basically need to ask her some questions about that because the deed, under the law, the deeds are assumed to be correct right. unless there's a preponderance of evidence showing these aren't correct. And in order to do that, we do need some information from Sharon Geyser to confirm that uh, what Carol is stating is true. Um, so we're trying to determine. Okay. You know, the ownership for this time period. Um, okay. Help me out, Joe. I'm looking at the dates here. I'm, I, I'm seeing the quick claim deed in 2015. I have an agreement. My signature is there, both. And the date, could you talk about it? Right. The, yeah, we're, we're, yeah okay. we're, we're just discussing the deeds real quick. Yes. Um, so on the, on the first page, you'll see I highlighted at the top, it's July 9th, 2015. Right. That's when it was recorded. And you'll see MTI Capital is granting to Sharon Geyser. Right. Um, the applicant has stated and is prepared to provide documentation showing her name should also be on this deed. At that date. At that date. Okay. Uh, and then we have our 11-4-2021 deed where we see Carol come on title. Um, or Sharon grants to Carol. So okay. <clears throat> it's the applicants, the applicant has appealed stating she's had own, prior ownership in the property. And so we just, we need um, Got it. some information from Sharon Geyser to um, corroborate that. Basically. Yeah, okay. um, I may have refinance for uh, 2021. I, my name was still in the title. This is why I made a refinance, why she's, talk about because she sold me the property. Okay. Which is not true. Oh, okay. Okay. To, um, can I in yeah, interject? Yes. Um, in terms of the board's subpoena power, I, I'm not entirely sure for what the assessor is asking for right this minute, but the board has the authority to grant a subpoena for documents. And it sounds like maybe they need some documents and they have authority to grant a subpoena to compel the witness to testify at a hearing. Okay. So we can't compel a witness to talk to the assessor in advance of the hearing or have a deposition or anything like that. So that, that's what your Those board can do is, okay. mm -hmm. a, you know, compel them to attend the hearing or have documents. And my recommendation, depending on what the assessor wants, is to be, because we don't have the subpoena in front of us, mm -hmm. is to be as precise as possible as to what the board is authorizing the subpoena for. Okay. Um, another thing is, for all these years, I was the person to pay the taxes on the property okay. for 22 years. Okay. No Sharon Geyser. Okay. Understood. Absolutely not. Um, so, do we want to um, do we want to trail this and uh, allow the assessor time to come up with their um, uh, their verbiage for the for the subpoena, and perhaps we could deal with this at, um, later today. Um, yeah, we could try to do that. I'm not sure, uh, due to the heavy um, agenda today, I might not be able to um, create the STIP today. Okay. I mean, not the STIP, the uh, subpoena today. Right. Um, but yeah, there there is one specific document we would be requesting of Sharon, and then potentially uh, attending a future hearing date, uh, requiring her attendance. Okay. Um, so those those will be the two things we would be requesting on the subpoena. Okay. Trisha, do you have any comment? Okay. Um, or Jim. I'm just anything? I'm just thinking the best way to facilitate for the applicant mm -hmm. to, um, for her to you know have to wait for us to trail it. Uh, can we set the continuance date and? Um, Trail, uh, trail the item. First, set the continuance date, okay. and trail the item. 
just for the assessor to come back with the verbiage on on the subpoena. So, so that we then can do the it today before we would, to yeah. Wait. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is we'll set a date for continuance. Uh, we'll we'll allow the assessor time to come up with their um, their wording for the subpoena. Uh, we that way we can approve the subpoena today. Okay. Um, as far as the continuance, we have uh, upcoming dates of March 25th and April 22nd. Either, either way, for me, is fine. Okay, uh, to the assessor? Um, let's do April 22nd. Yeah, okay. 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 Do I have a motion to continue to um, April 22nd, 2024? So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, that motion carries. However, this agenda item is still open. Right. For the board's review of the subpoena. Yes. So okay. we'll come back to that aspect um, later today. But Brendan, is she? Do we need anything further from Miss um, Payne? I don't believe so, because it sounds like you're agreeable to whatever the assessor intends to subpoena from Miss. Geyser, correct? You're, yes, yes you're no, Sean helping. Geyser. Um, I do have a question. Uh, yes. The deed says your the property is deeded to Carol. Your appeal says your name is Carola. Yes. What is the deed incorrect? It's the same. I can, oh. Yes, I'm the same person. I, uh, but le legally, should it have an A at the end? Is the deed incorrect? I don't know why, because every, all my papers say Carola, and that document say Carol. I have no idea. Okay, so your legal name is Carola. Yes, sir. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. All right, so I think you're all set. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very, very mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on to item 69, application number 2310027, Latigo Hillcrest, LLC. We have Nimi Kalamovich, I apologize for mispronouncing that, on Zoom for this item. Yes, hello. Good morning. Are we moving forward with your case today? I want to request a continuation. Okay. We are... We have exchanged documents with the appeals and Zachary Clifford, and we're waiting on the stipulation. So we're just requesting a a continuance until we can sell on the value. Okay. And to the assessor? The assessor agrees with the applicant, um, so we do agree for a continuance. And does it, the assessor need data? We don't need data. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Kamanovic, uh, the dates we have are Mar uh, March 25th and April 22nd. Uh, March 25th is good with us. Okay. Looking for a motion to continue to March 25th, 2024. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, the motion carries. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, item 70, application number 23-10047, Jessica M. Alton. We have Jessica Alton on Zoom for this item. As I mentioned previously, we did not receive confirmation of appearance at least 30 days prior to today's hearing as required. So Ms. Alton will be required to request a rescheduling to a later date. And we'll just go ahead and check in with Ms. Alton. Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good morning. So, uh... We need, to, we need to con, um, schedule continuance for your case. We have dates of March 25th yes, um, and April 22nd. Um, April 22nd would be great. Okay. To the assessor? The assessor agrees with April 22nd. If We, we have not received data on this case, so if we can add a proviso. Okay. Um, 30 days from today? Correct. Yeah. Um, Ms. Alton, will you be able to provide data to the uh, assessor within 30 days of today's date? Yes, I will be. Okay. 
Looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 with a data proviso, uh, data provided to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Alton. Real quick, Ms. Alton, Thank you. since we had not received any yes. required paperwork, just want to make sure you've been receiving our letters and emails regarding the appeal. Um, I have not gotten the letters, but I did get the emails and talked to somebody like two weeks ago. Okay. So I believe I have a contact. Okay, you have a contact with the assessor's out. office? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so just reach out to them. You should have received a letter from the assessor clarifying the necessary information that is subject to what we just mentioned needs to be provided in the next 30 days. But if you're not clear, just reach out to that contact. Um, you should have received numerous letters and emails regarding this appeal. So I just want to make sure that that communication gap gets closed. Yes, I will talk to them about that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, item 71, application number 23-10071, Musa Tume. Yes, we have Mr. Tume here in person. And again, we did not receive a... Uh, the form to confirm it's his appearance. So. so we need to schedule a continuance. Yeah, uh, just check in, Mr. Tuma. I know you've uh, appealed the last few years, and, and then you just usually need some clarification and don't proceed. So are, are you pursuing this appeal still? Do you still want to go forward with it? Yes. Yeah. OK. 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 <coughs> um, so we'd need to reschedule, and you have not reached out to the assessor yet this year, correct? Yes, or not. No. No, he hasn't. No translator. He hasn't, mm -hmm. but for the, the the notice, he just went up to the, the fourth floor yeah. to the clerk, and all she did was point us down here. Yeah. Okay, so let's reschedule you to a later date, and then you can work with Mr. Clifford, who's been assigned to your case at the assessor, and then at the next hearing, we'll make sure, as we've done in the past, to provide an interpreter, um, since we know you'll be there. Since we didn't get the response, we just assumed you weren't proceeding this year, so uh, we don't have the interpreter like we normally would have had today. Um, so if that's all right... Um, did, do you guys have a preference between March 25th and April 22nd? March 25th and April 22nd is going to be Maravignum or Savignum. Maravignum or Savignum. I'm going to tell you about the real Savignum. The 70 days. The okay. April 22nd. April 22nd. Okay. And uh, to the assessor? The assessor agrees with the continuance for April 22nd. Um, uh, if we can add the proviso for the missing data uh, 30 days from today. Okay. Um, but also to the applicant, I would encourage a conversation with Mr. Clifford since you're here when you finish up here. If he's wearing the black jacket with the hand lifted up. So uh, he'll be able to let you know exactly what, what we, what we need what's needed. Thank yes. You. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Okay. So thank we're, you. We're, have a nice weekend. <laughs> thank you. Um, looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024, with uh, data due to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. It's so moved. I second. And hearing no objections, motion carries. Okay, application um, item number 75, application number 2310106, uh, Javad Hatami Ramsha. I do not believe anyone has checked in for this item this morning. Seeing no one, I do not believe we have anyone on Zoom for this item. Recommend action is to deny due to lack of appearance. Um, looking for a motion to deny. So moved. I second. No objections. Motion carries. This is to 80. Okay, item 80, application number 2310136, La Flor de Mayo Market. A stipulation was received this morning and passed around to your board for review. 
Uh, if your board uh, agrees with that stipulation, recommend action is to go ahead and approve it today. Okay. Yes, I Agreed. reviewed it. You reviewed it? Yeah. I, I reviewed it as okay. well. I reviewed it as well. Um, looking for a motion to uh, approve uh, stipulation. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Takes us down to item 87, application number 2310196, Asma Furniture Yes, and we have Asma on Zoom for this item. Thank you. Hi there. Good morning. Are we moving forward with your case today? Uh, I believe we are deferring it to April 22nd. I already am talking to my assessor, Audrey. Mm -hmm. Uh, the assessor? Yes, the assessor, uh, the assessor is fine with the April 22nd date. Um, looks like we are missing data, so if we can add the proviso 30 days from today. And to the applicant, will you be able to provide the assessor with um, any required data within 30 days of today's date? Uh, I sent all the data last week. Um, okay. Can I get a confirmation? I don't know. Yeah, oh. yeah as far as um, our um, our record show, we didn't. She um, if she sent them, then we would just need time to review it. Um, okay. And sometimes when they see the documentation, okay. they have further yeah. questions. Right. So okay. So if there's any additional information the assessor may need, uh, we're they're requesting it within 30 days of today's date. Okay, I will okay. do that. I, okay. So my my communication is primarily with uh, Audrey Ramirez, I believe. Correct. Sorry? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, we're looking for oh, a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024 with uh, data due to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 89, application number 2310229, Joseph W. Saladino. We have Joseph Saladino on Zoom for this item. Thank you. Yes, sir, I'm here. Good morning, sir. Are we moving forward with your case today? It's, uh, Chair, this is another uh, one. No, I'd like. No confirmation. I'm of sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just clarifying that the, that you did not submit your paperwork at least right. 30 days prior, so a, a reschedule would re, be required, and I apologize. Please continue with your comments. Yes, I was simply going to ask for a continuation to the March 25th date. I've been in touch with the assessor's office, and I understand that my case was assigned to Scott Bradley. Can I confirm that? The yes, the, uh, this is the assessor. Uh, your case has been assigned to Scott Bradley. Okay, I'll be in touch with Scott regarding the paperwork. And uh, does he, is the assessor um, in agreement with the March 25th continuance date? Yes, we agree with the continuance date. Um, if we can add the proviso, though, 30 days from today. Okay. Well, actually, 30. it would need to be based on the March 25th date. It would need to be 30 days prior to March 25th. Got it. Uh, Mr. Saladino. So that would be in approximately two weeks or so. Yeah, Can we switch days. it to the April date then? Is that acceptable to the Yes, assessment? that's okay. acceptable. Yes, we can do the April date. And uh, the, data, the data would be due to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. Okay. Okay. Looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024, with data due to the assessor within 30 days of today's date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Saladino. Great. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, Mr. Saladino, I just want to clarify. Um, it sounds like you've been in touch with the assessor's representative, Mr. Bradley, correct? No, I've not spoken directly with Mr. Bradley. Okay. I've spoken to the office. Um, somebody by the name of Audrey. Okay. Um, so I just want to confirm. Um, so you still need to reach out to Mr. Bradley to confirm what you owe the assessor. And then my office sent you several emails 
uh, regarding today's hearing and, and the requirement that you submit paperwork at least 30 days prior. Uh, it sounds like you did not receive those. Is that correct? Um, emails, I don't believe I received. I did receive some paperwork. Okay. And yes, yeah, so I, I did receive it. Okay, so you've received the assessor's request for information that they sent you by U.S. mail, but you did not receive any of the emails that the clerk of the board sent you, correct? I don't, don't believe I have, no. Right, so I just advise check your um, junk mail from any emails from aabclerk at ventura.org. Again, that's aabclerk at ventura.org to ensure you get our communications in the future. Um, you will receive reminders um, regarding the upcoming hearing on April 22nd. Uh, but as we discussed, just reach out to Mr. Bradley to clarify anything you um, need to provide the assessor. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, Brendan, what do, looks like we have um, and, several. <laughs> yes, so um, we're going to, so item, next we're going to address items 92, 93, 94, 95, um, 96 through 98, 99 through 103. We're going to skip 104 and 105. That's going to be handled by a different employee. Um, we're going to discuss 106 through 113, uh, item 114, item 115, item 116, and item number 117. So basically, uh, we're going to discuss items, let's cross several pages here, 93 through 119, except for items 104 and 105 we're going to discuss separately. So for those items we're going to be discussing currently, we have Tanner Brawl with DePascali, Kelly and Company on Zoom for this item. Mr. Brawl, are you there? I am. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> uh, good morning, sir. Uh, are we going forward with your case today? Cases? Um, we, <clears throat> we are uh, requesting a, um, a, a postponement, and I have to apologize. Um, there was a kind of a miscommunication within, within our office, and um, Brendan had sent an email to us on Monday uh, reminding us of the hearing that was scheduled. Uh, for today, um, we actually, there was a kind of a clerical hiccup on our side. We didn't have it calendared uh, for that day. And we kind of had anticipated that we were going to receive notice of hearing. Um, and so <clears throat> it wasn't actually on our calendar. This It, it was it was our mistake. Um, and I have to apologize to the assessor's office, the board, and, um, and Brendan as well. So um, due to that kind of clerical hiccup on our part, not calendaring it, We'd like to request a, a postponement um, to the April 22nd hearing. Um, I do know that we've sent um, information to the assessor's office on um, a number of the appeals that um, I'm appearing on this morning. Um, but I, I I would like to check in. And again, with the with kind of that clerical hiccup, I haven't um, completed my discussion with the assessor's office. But I, I would like to check in with them at at. Um, in conversation to see kind of what else they they would need from us i i do feel like we've sent over most of the information if not all of the information on on various cases that we have scheduled this morning so i i would like to know kind of what else they would need um for for the various cases we've got various properties of course scheduled um in front of you today a hotel some shopping centers um and there's also a golf course as well so there, there's a there's a mix of, of property. So if the assessor's office needs further information on any of them, you know, if they can let us know what specifically they need, that would be great. And to the assessor. So I would like to mention that out of all these cases, uh, there are two appraisers. There's one assigned to some, then another appraiser assigned to the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we also have a mix where the majority have no data, but some of them have minimal data that have been written. Where we've been, where we've received, um, we would like to go at the April twenty second date with data due thirty days from today. Um, I would like to encourage the agent to reach out to to the appraiser. I'm not sure if they're aware of. Well, we um, I know we've reached out, so they probably should be aware of which one is Joe Phillips and which one is yes. Zachary Clifford. But if there are any okay, questions, okay. So, so 
I don't know. If we so should. Joe Phillips, I, I've I've spoken with in in, in the past, but Zachary Clifford, I, I don't think we've we've made a um, okay. we've connected with him. So I can I can take both of their uh, Joe Phillips. I, I've spoken to prior, but um, I can get Zachary's information as well. And we we actually brought on a new uh, consultant to our company as well. So he recently came on. So I can connect. He'll be handling some of the cases as well. So I can connect him with both the appraisers as well. Okay, sounds good. <clears throat> Before your board takes action, I apologize. There was another page with cases items 129 through 132 and 133 through 134 are also going to be part of the board action that you approve right now. So I apologize. I missed that. Um, the one thing I just note, um, you know, this will be, I think it's the ninth continuance on the 2021 right. cases. Your board had previously added the... Um, you know, caveat that any further continuances will be discouraged. So I just want to confirm that it, if your board grants the request to continue to April 22nd, with the data be provided with the assessor in the next 30 days, if for the 2021 year appeals, you'd also like to include that caveat that any further continuances will be discouraged. And that's all I have to say. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yeah, please. Thank you, Brandon. Um, it looks to me like, to the assessor, that substantial data exchange has not occurred. Is that correct? Correct. Sorry, Madam Chair. That, that, same, that seems, so that's kind of, that's interesting to us because I feel like that, that maybe that, that's where the disconnect is because I, I know we've sent over large amounts of information. So I don't know if the appraisers have changed and you know, the the information needed to get to somebody else because we've sent over, I, I, I've seen and I've personally sent over um, financial data valuations or internal valuations for certain properties. So I know that information has been sent. Maybe there's a disconnect on who is reviewing the information. Um, and because on our side, I, I feel like there has been it, it, more data shared than than minimal. That's just kind of our position. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm looking at the the volume of yeah. cases here, and I'm wondering if uh, this applicant should be looking at a special hearing date. Mm. I can see all of these cases taking up an entire hearing. Yeah, there's quite a few. So. Um, we wouldn't be uh, opposed to that as well. I think that that actually would be a, a good idea. It is it is it is a big um, load of cases, and and it's a mix uh, as far as the cases. I think the hotel case um, would would take, um, you know, um, a, I don't know exactly how long that would take if we put it forward, but um, it would take a little longer. Okay, um, okay. so Mr. Chair, I'm. May I ask uh, Brendan yes, what our next special hearing date yeah. is? Well, the the and I hesitate because one of the reasons we're here today is like the assessor indicates they haven't received a lot of data, so we don't know if all these cases are going to move forward, if any, until the assessors receive the data they requested under four four one D. And so I hesitate if we set a special hearing to date today, but then the data issue is clarified, we might not have quite so many cases. So maybe a better solution would be to set a, not put the proviso that any further continuances would be discouraged, do a shorter continuance and allow the parties to clarify the missing data between each other and then set a special hearing date at the next hearing when everybody is more concrete on on the data, right? Because okay, that's I'm, something I'd hesitate is once the data issue is clarified, we might not need special hearings. Um, okay. I don't, I don't know. And I don't think. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Um, my, I'm trying to close. I feel like we should be able to. Yeah, I feel like we should be able to come to a resolution. I mean, I'm hopeful we should be able to come to a resolution on on some of the the appeals. Okay. Okay. Um, so then, I would I would encourage the March twenty fifth 
And just as status the, only. As status only. Right. And at that point, we will, if necessary, we will set a date for a hearing certain period with no further continuances. Is that agreeable? Is that agreeable, Mr. Brawl? That's, that's agreeable with us. To the assessor? The assessor? Yes, the assessor agrees. Okay. 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 So uh, we're looking to continue uh, to March 25th, 2024 uh, for a status update only. And I think with still the proviso that requested data be provided in, in the next 30 days. Oh. So that way at March 25th, if there's still anything outstanding, we can discuss it then. Got it. So looking for a motion to continue to March 25th, 2024 with the data proviso that data be provided to uh, the assessor. Next 30 days. Within the next 30 days? Yes. Okay. Because the expect to clarify the reason for that is it's uh, the parties aren't expected to address the their cases in chief on the twenty fifth, so that's I think why we'd be okay the assessor getting the data closer yeah. to that yeah. that time. Understood. Understood. Also, um, I know we're pressed for time, uh, but would it just to help with communication with the assessor and the agent? Would I be able to just quickly go through these items and just state who the appraiser is and? what the status is on that would that yeah it, it. um i can just go through that really quick sure let's just do it real quick okay. yeah i would say um item 92 the appraiser is zachary clifford and that we do not have data item 93 the appraiser is joe phillips and we have minimal data um, items 94 through 95 the appraiser is joe phillips and we have minimal data uh, for items 96 through 98, the appraiser is Joe Phillips, and we've received minimal data. Uh, items 99 through 103, the appraiser is Joe Phillips, and we have received no data. Um, for items 1, 106 through 113, the appraiser is Zachary Clifford, and we have not received any data. Um, for items 1... 14, uh, that the appraiser is Joe Phillips, and we have not received any data. Um, item 115, the appraiser is Zachary Clifford, and we have not received any data. Um, items 116, the appraiser is Joe Phillips, and we have not received any data. Um, items 117 through 119, the appraiser is Joe Phillips, and we have not received any data. Thank you. Okay. And the, the next two we on have the a top of the next page? Yeah, so 129 through 132, the appraiser is Joe Phillips, and we have not received any data. Um, items 133 and 134, the appraiser is Zachary Clifford, and we have not received data. Okay. Okay. So noted. Okay. Uh, well, thank, thank you for, yeah, I'll definitely, because um, I'm looking through the list here. I'm glad, I'm, thank you for pointing out the appraisers because that, that'll help. As far as I'm looking through the list and I know we've sent over information for for a majority of these. So I'll, I'll, I'll bridge the gap and see kind of where the disconnect is. And what I'll probably do is just send over what we sent prior um, to both appraisers and then just kind of go from there. And, and if they need more information, um, we can do information exchange prior to the March uh, 25th date. Also, uh, this is Joe Phillips with the assessor's office. Um, so we were in communication back in April of 2023. So I would encourage you to review the emails from back then. Um, in my emails, I clearly state the additional information that we need. So, um, you know, I would encourage you to go back to to that time frame and look at the emails that were sent at that time. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you. Okay. So, so I believe, Chair, you stated the motion, but I did not record a mover and seconder to continue to March 25th for a status mm -hmm. hearing with the proviso that data be provided in the next 30 days. So I don't know. If we... Okay. So moved. I second. And hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Ball. You're all set. Thank you. All right. And do we have 
Mr. And Brawl for were there two other items yes. that you said, Brendan, yes. that you were yes. going uh, to handle separately? Yeah, I spoke with Richard Ramirez of DePascali Kelly and Company. He's on Zoom for items 104 and 105. Okay. And uh, so, as I discussed with Mr. Ramirez, we are going to discuss these two separately. Uh, so, either Mr. Brawl or Mr. Ramirez can address uh, these items 104 and 105. Um, turn it to you, Mr. Right, he Chair. Can, he, he, if he's on, he can he can uh, advise the board. I'm present. Great. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Richard Ramirez with Deep Pasquale Kelly and Company, and as uh, maybe Tanner uh, had indicated, uh, I am the new uh, newer consultant that's come on board. Uh, we're requesting a, a, a continuance to the April 22nd, uh, 2024 date. Uh, these are uh, the California State Teachers Retirement uh, System uh, properties, and they've been, uh, we've had two separate uh, litigation issues, and that's why um, their portfolio throughout the state has been uh, put on hold and requested previous postponements. Those two uh, litigation uh, issues uh, have been now have been resolved uh, oh, at, and at the last at the last hearing uh, I was unaware that uh, we were to provide a brief uh, for the uh, issue here before us on on the CSHV Moore Park LLC I was just informed that by uh, the board clerk uh, that we were going to provide that brief so uh, I will provide that brief uh, as to the issue uh, beforehand, there's uh, maybe some confusion uh, whether or not the board has jurisdiction to hear our legal argument. And I will provide a brief as to uh, why the board does uh, have jurisdiction uh, to hear the argument uh, before. We have also uh, uh, filed under a couple different issues. So we would also then request uh, that for application uh, 2110925 uh, that that application be uh, bifurcated until uh, our legal argument uh, uh, is heard, uh, which is uh, item I uh, on the uh, application. Uh, and so that, that's the basis for, and I do apologize. Um, you know, I just wasn't aware uh, from the previous hearing that we had uh, agreed to um, submit that brief uh, with, I think within uh, 30 days is what I, I was informed. Okay, thank you. And just before we go to clarify for the board, yes, first, um, as Mr. Uh, Ramirez indicated, potential bifurcation, first, your board would be determining whether or not they have jurisdiction, so that'd be hearing one. Again, um, they're gonna provide a brief, and in the event it clarifies the issues, um, all parties could agree if a jurisdiction hearing is not necessary, but as he mentioned, there's just clarification needed on their position. Um, so first we would resolve the jurisdiction issue, then um, we would resolve, um, if your board determines they have jurisdiction over um, what they requested in item I on the application, um, which is a, a sort of an exemption, then your board would hear that as a second hearing, and then the third hearing would be to determine the actual value if necessary. So it would be bifurcated into three. So for today, we're just talking about setting the first of those three hearings, which is the jurisdiction clarification. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then I have a question. Yes, sir. What were the, so there was the uh, legal issue, there was the valuation issue, but what was the middle issue again? So on the application box, I, other was checked, which is, is like a catch all, and they put, owner slash member slash property wholly exempt per California Constitution, California State Teachers Retirement System Agency of the State of California. And that's where the jurisdictional issue comes in is under that type of exemption, does your board have jurisdiction to hear that type of exemption? Yes or no. If uh, So first we'll determine exemption. If your board determines they do have jurisdiction over that, then we would hear their case as to why they believe the California State Teachers Association is exempt from reassessment. Okay. Um, if your board determines they do not have jurisdiction over that issue, then it would be cut down to two hearings, and then the second hearing would be just valuation because your board would, by denying jurisdiction, would be not addressing the exemption issues. So okay. um, that, since it's an other catch-all, not a default state 
allowed selection on the application. That's why this issue of, of clarification and jurisdiction has been risen. Um, that's not to say once the clarification's been provided that we won't, be, we won't be able to discuss with the assessor and county council and resolve the jurisdiction question. There's just a lot of questions been hanging out there about it and mm -hmm. the county has no clarification on their position. So that's what this brief that uh, Mr. Ramirez has indicated will be provided will hopefully clarify. Okay. Okay. Uh, does the assessor have any um, input? No input. I think just a clarification on the on the brief that is going to be provided. If we can just add a proviso for that. Okay. Okay. So we need to set um, a day. Are we, Mr. Ramirez? You you requested uh, April twenty second, correct? That is correct. All right. Um, and the assessor would like data within thirty days. Of today's date? Yeah, 30 days from today. Okay. So the assessor would like, uh, just to clarify, they would like the brief in 30 days. Correct? Correct. Yes. I have, I have, no, I have no other data other than submitting a brief. Okay. Okay, so to clarify, Brendan, we're continuing um, this is for both uh, item 104 and 105, correct? Correct. And we're continuing to April 22nd. Um, because it's bifurcated, do we, are we? So the other hearings would be set subsequent depending on your, on the outcome okay. of that first hearing. So, okay. uh, yeah, we just are setting all the, the cases in whole are being moved and basically they're bifurcated with, so that there's the understanding that we do not need to address and your board will not address the specifics of as to why it should be exempt or not, or or the valuation. It's just the jurisdiction. Just the jurisdiction. Unless it's clarified beforehand and everybody agrees okay. that the board does have jurisdiction. But um, again, we're and I've discussed with this. Both of us are in the dark as to the applicant's position, mm -hmm. and so that's why it's hard to say can that jurisdiction question be resolved or not. Right. Uh, but if everybody agrees, we can. Skip that. It's just, no one's seen anything from their side to okay. know where we're at. With it. Okay. So we're yeah. okay. Can, can can I just request um, till March twenty second to provide my brief? So thirty days. Thirty prior. days prior to the. Uh, yeah, that'll be. Yeah, fun. yeah. Thirty days prior. Okay. Yes, the assessor uh, agrees with that. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to uh, continue to April 22nd, 2024, with um, data due to the assessor uh, 30 days prior to the uh, to the meeting. Correct. So moved. I second. Hearing no objection, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Okay, um, that takes us to item 135, application number 2310258, Charles and Patricia Rasmussen. Yeah, and actually, Chair, uh, we can handle items 135 through uh, 143, so the remainder of this agenda page all together. This is all represented by ProTax LLC. We have Thomas Payne of ProTax LLC on Zoom for this item. Thank you. Thomas Payne speaking. Thank you. Good morning, Thomas Payne sir. is the, um, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, clerk and county council. Uh, I'm requesting um, a one-time uh, continuance on these in order to exchange information with the assessors who might uh, have their names and emails. Uh, shall I read the applications in question? Uh, no. Uh, you, um, you have a copy of the agenda, correct? I I do, and the date I'm requesting is 4-22-24, if it's acceptable, with a 30-day proviso. 
revise it. Okay, and this is for items um, 135 through 143? Um, all your cases on today's schedule, correct? Uh, yes, I mean, I've got them all in uh, numerical order, but uh, yes, all the cases, there's nine in total. Okay, and to the assessor? Yes, uh, uh, up to this day, up to today, we have not received any data for any of these cases. We do have uh, these assigned to two different appraisers. Okay. Um, so I can do what I did on the other one and just brief. Like, yeah, let's do that real quick. quick. So for, um, just want to make sure the applicant is prepared to. Are you talking about who's assigned? Yes. He, yeah. He already has received the list of oh, who's he assigned. Okay. He, that's what he confirmed. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah, so because we haven't received any data, if we can just add a proviso. Uh, yeah. I missed the actual date. Is that the April? Uh, April 22nd. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we can, just due to, the, due to the amount of cases, we can do 30 days prior to the okay. hearing. Okay. 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 Um, looking for a motion to continue to April 22nd, 2024, with data due to the assessor uh, 30 days prior to the hearing date. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Thank you. Okay. Wow. That's it, right? You did it. <laughs> did it. <laughs> <laughs> Little, I, I estimated two hours. We're at two hours and five minutes. Nice. All right. <laughs> uh, would your board like to quickly take care of the administrative matters on the agenda? Yes. Starting with, uh, if we go to the last page, there's item 151. We just need your board to receive and file the findings of fact that have been issued by Assessment Appeals Board Number 2 since your last hearing. So recommend action is to receive and file the findings of fact. So moved. I second. And no objections. Motion carries. Thank you. And then item 157 is the stipulation agreements, uh, items 158 through 180. These were emailed to your board on Friday for review. Um, we do have Sonia Rosales, items uh, 163 through 164 on Zoom. And we had another applicant. It looks like he's left. Um, this is a stipulation agreement, so Ms. Rosales does not need to be present today. Um, but let's just check in with her. She's raising her hand. Ms. Rosales, uh, did you have any comments for the board? No, I just wasn't sure if I was supposed to be present or what the process was in this case. Got it. Yeah, your appearance this, today is waived as that agreement was signed, so nothing is necessary. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks to the board, too. Okay. So, board, unless you have questions, recommendation is to approve. I uh, received and reviewed the stipulations to I my board too. members. I did. Okay. Uh, looking for a motion to uh, approve uh, stipulations. So moved. I second. Hearing no objections, motion carries. All right. Okay. Um, let's take a short break. Um, and then, Brendan, do we do we have an order uh, for the yes, cases so today? Yes, so we're going to hear Mr. Baker first. Um, that case is anticipated to take about an hour. Um, so I don't know if, um, as I mentioned, I uh, so Mr. Baker's first, Mr. Uh, Nimi um, and Ms. Satinowski is second. Um, I don't know if we want to go ahead and pre-dismiss them until after lunch. I can call them when your board starts lunch. And then we have John Devan, which I have we have already dismissed to come back after lunch. And then last we have Andreas Salant. Uh, again, I, I told them they can come back this okay. afternoon, uh, and I will follow up when we have a better idea as to when those cases will start. So I don't I don't know. Does your board want to dismiss um, um, the case for Philip Nemi and, and ask them to come back after lunch? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Come forward to the podium. Since our case is about 10 minutes, could we flip with Mr. Baker? Mr. Baker, I'll buy you a coffee if you'll <laughs> trade with me so that, you know um, I'm saying so that we, I mean, it'll, it's going to be fast. A, a case typically, uh, like yours, would take a minimum of 45 minutes, but if the board 
Uh, wishes we can change the order? Uh, Six, yeah, so for 10, 10 to 15 and yeah. 10. Um, well, I'm looking at the clock, too. Of course, we, we want to schedule a lunch here. And, uh, is the, my board members have any input on this? My preference would be to get uh, this case out okay. of the way before lunch. Thank you. Yeah, with that? Mr. Baker said yes. He okay. did. <laughs> okay. But I'm going to buy him a coffee, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take a short break, uh, just five minutes, um, and then we'll, we'll return and you'll go right. first. Okay. So we're going to do uh, the case for Philip Nimi first, and then Mr. Baker will be first after lunch. Is that kind of where we're? I think that seems okay. prudent, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Baker, if you'd like to leave, I'll give you a call up on the phone number on file when the board goes to lunch, but you're more than welcome to stay as well. All right. Okay, so let's we'll return. 11.45.
right. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Chair, we're back on the record. Okay. Thank you, Brennan. Um, we are hearing um, application number 22-10571. Um, I'd like... Uh, I've handed out copies of the application as well as Assessor's Exhibit A and B for the board's consideration. The assessor is requesting written findings of fact in this matter. Um, as this is an owner-occupied single-family residence, uh, it's a January 1, 2022 decline in value. The assessor has the burden of proof, so we'll just let them get into their overview and the case all at once. Perfect. Um, and so that's oh, it. Okay. To the assessor. Good morning, board. I'm Audrey Ramirez with the assessor's office. Um, as Brendan stated, this is a uh, Prop 8 decline in value appeal for, as of January 1st, 2022 of an owner-occupied residence. Um, the address is 706 North Signal Street in Ojai. Uh, the subject property is a custom SFR in downtown Ojai um, of the neighborhood excuse me, the downtown Ojai neighborhood, um, or what it's also referred to as Ojai proper, um, in the Ojai, uh, that was originally purchased in 11-11-2005 for uh, 982.5. It was um, accepted as fair market value and enrolled pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 75.10a. Um, as uh, the Revenue and Taxation Code Section 51 states, um, we're to enroll either the lesser of the property's factored base year value or its full cash value as of the lien date. Um, the 2022 factored base year value is $1,265,212. Uh, a Prop 8 valuation was conducted and determined that the estimated fair market value of the subject was $1,453,000 as of January 1st, 2022. Therefore, the Prop 13 value was enrolled as it was a, a lower of the two value indicators. Uh, so for our um, valuation, uh, the valuation itself, the breakdown um, is on... Uh, page three and four of Assessor's Exhibit A. Um, it did include four custom SFRs. Three of the homes are located in the same downtown Ojai neighborhood as the subject and are less than a quarter mile away. Uh, the fourth home was provided by the applicant um, as it is comparable in age and size to the subject, but is in a different market area than the subject in Miners Oaks, which is located approximately 1.4 miles away from the subject. Uh, the assessor is using this comparable to the age and size of the property, but would not typically use this as a comparable due to the location and lot size. Um, the subject is estimated to be in average condition and is appraised accordingly. Uh, per conversations with the applicant, condition is not an issue um, with the home. Uh, comparables one through three um, are adjusted for their inferior living area. Comps number two and three are adjusted for their inferior year built in age and also are adjusted um, for being in superior condition. Comps one, three, and four are adjusted for their superior lot sizes. Comp number two is adjusted for having a pool, and comp number three is adjusted for having a guest house. Um, additional adjustments were made to the four comparables that included for inferior or su superior bath counts, inferior or superior garage sizes, and other exterior improvements such as decks, patios, and storage areas. Uh, the estimated <laughs> fair market value of the subject um, is the $1,453,000 based on the comparables used. The subject's 2022 Prop 13 value is $1,265,212 and falls within the range of the adjusted sales prices of these comps used and is lower than the estimated fair market value. Uh, so based on that information, a Prop 8 reduction is not warranted for the 122 lien date. 
Um, as our appraisal indicated uh, that the estimated fair market value of the property is higher than the factored base year, uh, the assessor um, requests that you sustain the Prop 13 value enrolled of 1,265,212 as of the January 1st, 2022, excuse me, January 1st, 2022 lien date. <clears throat> Um, again, uh, page three and four is just a breakdown um, of the differences and the adjustments made um, to the comparables. I just wanted to reiterate the comps one and th uh, through three were comps that the assessor um, considered to be comparable, and comp number four is the comp that was provided by the applicant. Uh, so pages five and six are just a few um, photos of the subject. Uh, so the one on page five is just an exterior shot of, from Google Street View in November of 2022. Um, and then on page six is some interior um, photos of the subject. Um, again, condition was not something that the applicant was considering to be um, why they were disputing the, the value enrolled. Um, so seven, page seven through 25 are just the photos of um, all the comparables that we are considering. Um, I just wanted to point out on comp number one, um, I did highlight an, an asterisk, a little note that um, the listing information about the square footage um, was provided by that listing agent and is not what the uh, not what the assessor has um, as their building records. Um, so if you refer to comp number one on the grid, we actually have the square footage to be uh, 2,302 square feet, where in the um, listing it, it says it's almost 2,600 square feet. So just wanted to let you know that that was based on what the agent listed and not um, building records. Um, again, comp number one, we considered it to be in um, you know, similar um, in, in characteristics, it's just slightly smaller, um, similar condition, uh, not really updated, just well maintained. You can tell that, you know, the bathroom is still um, outdated. Um, again, just well maintained. Um, comp number two um, is fairly close to the subject property. Um, it was recently remodeled. Um, therefore, we did consider it to be in um, superior condition. Um, it is considerably smaller. It is the um, one comparable that has a pool. Let's make adjustments there. Um, Comp number three, again, it's from the same area, um, market area as the subject. It has some updating um, that had been done, so therefore we considered it to be in superior condition and adjustments um, were made accordingly. It is the smallest of the um, comparables that we are considering. but it does have a guest house that we're accounting for as well. And then comp number four again is the information, um, is a comp considered by the applicant to be comparable um, with some photos from the listing there. And again, on the very last page, um, you can see um, a map of where the subject lies, the map, uh, of comps one through three, which this, the assessor are using as comparables, and um, where comp number four um, lies in comparison. And with that, if you have any questions. Oh, 
I apologize. Oh. We have Exhibit B. <laughs> Give me just one second. Okay. So um, Joe Phillips with the assessor's office. I'll talk about Exhibit B just a little bit. Um, so we wanted to provide a list of the comparable properties that the applicant provided to us that the assessor chose not to use. Um, so you'll see we have kind of this table with various descriptions as to why we chose not to use these comparables, why we deem them not comparable to the subject property. Um, <clears throat> so those are listed in detail. I won't go into detail about every single one, but what I did want to talk about was on the last page of Exhibit B, you'll see the map. Um, OHA is a very unique area and it has very unique location issues whenever we're appraising these types of properties. And it's important as an appraiser to be familiar with all the different location issues and how the market treats various locations. Um, so with that said, right now what you're looking at is the north section of downtown Ojai. Um, first of all, downtown Ojai is considered a highly desirable neighborhood. Um, many people want to live downtown within walking distance of the shops and that sort of thing. So that right there, if you're choosing any comps outside of downtown Ojai, there's going to be a considerable location adjustment needed there. Uh, the next thing I wanted to demonstrate was our subject, as I highlighted there, is along that North Signal Street. Um, this is a street that the market places a lot of value on. It's a higher end street and neighborhood. You'll, if you look at the lot sizes along that street, you'll notice all the lot sizes vary considerably. Some have large lots, some have small lots. And a lot of these houses are higher end houses. Um, and that's where the subject is. It's kind of towards the bottom um, of, the, of that street, but it's on that north signal more desirable street. Um, the other yellow highlight there is Grand Avenue. This is a big dividing line for market value. If you're below Grand Avenue, in general, these properties are going to sell in the marketplace lower than if you're above Grand Avenue. Grand Avenue is seen as, by the marketplace, uh, or above Grand Avenue is seen by the marketplace as more desirable. And you can kind of tell from the, all the different lot sizes being various, they have a lot of different um, types of houses. They're all custom built houses. Um, <clears throat> and then the blue highlights are many of the comparables that you'll see listed um, on, in our exhibit are located along these streets. And I just wanted to point out, if you look at these streets, and look at these lot sizes, you'll notice they're extremely track-like. Um, many of the suggested comps, the applicant said, are along these very track-like neighborhoods. Even though these may be classified as custom-built single-family homes, they're extremely um, similar along these roads to each other. The lot sizes are all, they uh, all appear as very track-like properties, which is not the case for the neighborhood the applicant is located in. Um, so these are kind of the general reasons we kind of wanted to touch on as to why we didn't consider some of the comps provided by the applicant. Um, as we know, location, 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 that's extremely important. And for Ojai, this is doubly important because the market actually does treat individual streets differently based on location. Um, and so it's very important that you capture that when you're doing an appraisal. You can't just pick any comp located anywhere in the Ojai Valley and say it's comparable to your property because the market can treat it vastly different based even on what street you live on. So that's just what we wanted to highlight and our reasoning for not using some of these comps. And you'll see in the comments we give um, some detailed descriptions why we feel it's not comparable and why we feel the comps we did select were far more comparable 
to the subject property. Um, and with that, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I have a question. Is it yeah, now a proper time? Mr. Phillips, um, are there any traffic issues associated with Signal Street? So yeah, actually below the subject property, you'll see, um, you see how Grand kind of curves down into Signal Street there uh, on the highlight. So that section of Signal Street is quite busy. Um, it's kind of the direction many local folks take to get to their house, drive home. So that section there below Grand is very has a lot of high traffic, but that section of North Signal that the applicant is on, um, the assessor observes no traffic. The only traffic you're gonna see is just the normal um, people who live on that street going there. Um, and, you know, during the day, there it's almost typical residential traffic that you'll see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question too. Um, on on your map, can you tell me which uh, which of these can you which of these parcels is the subject? Um, I assume we're starting right there at the uh, Signal and Grand, and oh, moving yeah. north. <clears throat> so if you look at the last page of Exhibit A, and kind of do a side side by side there, so it'd be not the parcel on the corner, but the very next parcel up from it. Yeah. On on the um, uh, east side? Uh, yeah, be on, so okay. if you look at North Signal on the east side, it's not the corner lot, but the one right above it. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? No? Okay. Um, does the applicant, does the applicant have questions for the assessor's presentation? No, I, I, I yeah, I have, I have no questions, but I definitely want to respond to a number okay. of things that were said. Okay. Um, well, then now's your turn. <laughs> so we'll start with the traffic question that was just asked. And um, our part of Signal Street is probably one of the busiest um, streets in the downtown Ojai area because the shelf road hiking is at the top of our street. So I will tell you, I get mail very rarely delivered on time because there are always cars parked down at our, all the way up the street, but um, for people who are hiking on shelf road. We also have a homeless encampment up um, off to the Platte water side. So we've got people walking up and down and driving up and down that street um, <laughs> relentlessly. And in fact, we talked um, as neighbors to try and get speed bumps um, because people speed, you know, people who don't live there speed up the street consistently. And um, uh, we were told because it's a fire, there's some sort of a fire issue um, because of the shelf road grade up there that um, it would be a long and drawn out battle. So we didn't, we didn't do that, but we moved in with a baby and knew that she'd be playing um, potentially out in the front yard. So we were concerned back then when we moved in. Um, the second point they made is about um, above grand or below grand, and um, I would um, contest that as well because um, you can go on Shady Lane, which is below grand, and you'll find a tracked home that they're saying um, worth more than our house um, with um, comparables. So we'll definitely disagree with that, but would also make the point that if you look at what you asked about what our property is, which is that very small one, mm -hmm. the homes that are large and on beautiful land are up above France Circle. So if you look at North Signal and you see France Circle, you'll start to see where the properties get larger and more vast. Those little houses right below France Circle, and you can see how small their properties are, which are equivalent to ours, are, are not custom homes, they're tracked homes. Um, and you'd have to, they're two bedrooms, you know, a couple baths, that sort of thing. So um, you'll see the property next to us, our neighbor, who has, you know, quite a lot. And um, I believe their valuation is lower than ours, but that's another story because they can do their own thing. So our comps, if you look at the, the, the 
I'll do it. If you, if you, um, if you look at the exhibit that we, um, you know, we put in front of you, um, our comments regarding the comparables. Um, first of all, Audrey emailed us the comparables that they were going to use. So exhibit A does not contain the comps that she initially provided. Comp one is there. Comp two on Buena Vista was ours. Comp three on daily, we never received. That was not in the email that we got from Audrey. And comp four, as she said, was one of the ones that we submitted. The ones, so if you look at my paperwork, the top um, are the comparables that were emailed to us with her comments from Audrey. The middle section were provided by our realtor, Vivian Moody, um, as you know, sales and things she thought were comps, and she's been doing real estate in that area for about 35, 40 years. And then the last were, as we say, they're properties that are similar in lot size, but much smaller homes and much, much lower values. And those were the ones I'm looking at on their exhibit B, why they didn't use them. We didn't really use them either, but the point is, is that's two of the four on um, their exhibit B. So going back to the ones that we were provided from Audrey, which are not what's in Exhibit A, um, looking at that Montgomery, she initially, and she made the correction today, where she said she provided us that that um, square footage was $25.95 um, with a lot size of 11000 and she's saying that the um, record apparently from what I'm seeing on her Exhibit A Comp 1 is 2300 um, and, uh, and, a, and, a lot, and a larger lot size. She's got 12,605 on the record. And what I want to make a comment on is in, in Ojai, it is your acreage and your view that count. And that doesn't matter if you're in Miners Oaks or in um, Casita Springs or in Ojai. It is the size of the property and it is the views that you have. So um, again, in looking through there, um, the ones that they have, and again, negating the fact that Audrey had put in her comments on the 810 North Montgomery to us, a lot smaller, but a bigger lot size. Well, again, the square footage that she provided to us was larger than our home, and the lot size, yes, was a lot larger. And in fact, um, if you look down into our comps provided by our realtor, the one that's probably the most is the 451 Wallbridge Way, and that is, be and it's still significantly, all of these properties, other than the small ones at the bottom, um, their lot sizes are, are much larger than ours. Ours is a little 8,000 postage stamp sized lot, um, but we love our home and we plan on living there for the rest of our lives. Um, and, um, and so if you look at the Wallbridge Way, that one is three bedrooms, two baths, it's 2,000, a little smaller than ours. Their large, their lot is much larger, and they're valued at 1125. And what we had said was that we thought um, with our realtor that the stipulation should be between 1,096, that's 0.3 on um, on our comments, or at the very most, that Waller Bridge Way, which was the 1,125. And so if we take the 1,125, we're talking just push it and let him. We're go. talking a difference of like $150,000, I think, is the difference in the stipulation, which to us will mean, what, 60 bucks in a back? And so I want you to know why I'm here, because we, we have had an extra extraordinary year this past year. It's been a nightmare. And um, we've had to defer several times because of elder care. But I'm here because Audrey, as a, a pr assessor appraiser, um, was very different than our experience in the past. And we've, we've done um, appeals almost every year because when we moved into the neighborhood in 2005, it was way overvalued. It was a $450,000 house that we paid like double for. Um, but we wanted to be out of Los Angeles and raise our baby in Ojai, so that's what we did. And so we've appealed every year. And every year we've got a stipulation. The last one was Joe. Um, it back in, I think he said 2019, but it was a 2020 stipulation, but it's always stipulated. So this is the first time we're seeing you like this and going through this experience. And we hadn't done it in the last several years because of dealing with our elders um, who've had cancer and all kinds of stuff. So we just haven't had the time. But the point is, Joe stipulated and I think it was for more, like the difference was more than what we're talking here. And Audrey's attitude right from the get-go when, when we first spoke was, 
She knew Ojai, she knew what it was, and she was not really interested in having a conversation. And it was a really unappealing um, experience. And so I'm, I'm honestly, for the, for the 150,000, which like I said, will yield what, uh, we'll get back 60, 70 bucks or something like that. It's not about that. It's that um, I wanted to make a point that we got you know, information that was not, um, not reflected accurately from the assessor and, um, and now changed in the exhibits. And, um, you know, and we had a realtor who we trust and value who went through and looked at it and gave us the information that we had. I'd like to add one thing. You'll have to forgive me. I have trouble speaking. I was hit by a joint driver, and I'm dealing with my speech problem. No problem. Um, something that was not mentioned is that corner property you oh, see on you. the map is a low-income housing property, and we have had to battle on a number of instances tenants living there dealing drugs in the parking lot. We have complained to the police, and they would come and talk to them. I finally had to sit one night with the lights off in our guest room that overlooks that parking lot with a video camera and physically videotape drug deals happening in that lot before the police should actually do something. And so I called them when it was happening and they were able to catch them in the act. No disrespect meant to people who have a low-income situation. The, the apartment complex provides for them. But it, because of the clientele, it lowers the value of the properties in the area. I don't think if you know Ojai, you would disregard that. And if you know Ojai, you would know that above Grand on our street, the traffic is horrible. You might have been there one day when there was nobody driving. I guarantee you, the curb in front of our house is often lined with vehicles of people who park at the bottom and want to hike to the top. I made that point. I made that point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, does the board have any questions for about the presentation of the applicant? No. no. Are they complete? Are they? Complete? Is that is that complete your it presentation? Does. That does. Thank you. That you say no, Jim? Cor correct. I have no questions for the I have applicant. No questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, okay, to the assessor then. Does the assessor have questions for the applicant? Yeah, can we have a brief five five to ten minutes um, just to review real quick? Yeah, okay? yeah, we sure. can do that, sure. Okay, sorry about that. So we'll take a short break. Um, ten minutes enough? I believe that should be good. Okay, we'll take a quick ten-minute break, um, come back here at uh, 1230.
Okay. To the assessor, are we ready for uh, questions? <laughs> yes, thank you for the time to review. Appreciate sure. that. Um, so my first question to the applicant is, um, I don't see it in your presentation here, but were any uh, adjustments made for the differences between your comparables and the subject property? Yeah, the point of the comparables, um, the, the point of our comparables from the, um, from the uh, realtor is that they are all um, valued lower than ours and yet have much larger lot sizes. Many of them have more bedrooms. So her point in giving us these comps was, <laughs> you know, your place is smaller and, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, square footage of lot and, um, and smaller sometimes, like I said, with bedrooms and baths, which is, and yet all of those places are valued lower than yours. And she said it, it just didn't, it, it didn't, the assessor's arguments made no sense to her when, so I guess in answer to your question, yes, it was looked at because our house hasn't been updated. Um, you know what I mean? And some of the ones um, on this sheet have been updated um, in terms of the interiors and things like that. Ours is a 1995 home inside. Um, so yes, adjustments were made in the, in the way that you think of adjustments, I guess. So so you did make adjustments to the sales prices for the differences? Yeah, again, the adjustments are made in our favor, right? Because these properties are larger and in many cases have more bedrooms and bathrooms. So ergo would be um, valued more because they have more property than ours. Because property and, and like I said, in views is what counts in Ojai. So location doesn't have an effect on property values? Well, location where you put large properties with views is going to be, yeah, that's the location. That's that's going to be, like there's one, there's a property um, that's over by uh, the right aid, if you know where that uh, like Red Stallion Plaza is. And it, 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 it would to me be a very busy, crummy area. And yet the house is on a large property and has views, so is valued more than ours, even though I wouldn't want to be next to that Red Stallion strip mall. So, and in Miners Oaks, that's another one. I mean, I know a number of women from the Ojai Women's Foundation who live in that area, and they have ginormous properties um, but it, you know, and their houses are valued more, even though it's Miners Oaks. So, so. Are, do market participants treat Miners Oaks differently than downtown Ojai? I, I, I think, like I said, what you're looking for in that whole area, in the whole Ojai Valley, is property and views. So, as I said, it doesn't matter if it's Miners Oaks, Ojai downtown, proper, above grand, below grand, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Which is why on our street, when you said there's high value properties, they're way up the hill at the top of the street. They get the views. We're down at the very bottom. We have no view other than the apartment building next to us. That's it. I think I have a more specific question. Um, using your property um, owner comparisons, 314 South Korea Road and your property. South Korea, uh, Korea Road is 2,013 square feet and yours is 2,434 square feet. Mm -hmm. So would you make an upwards or, or a negative adjustment for it being smaller? Well, it has four bedrooms. I, I'm asking a specifically with regards to the square footage. Of the, with uh, your property being 400 square feet more than that subject or, or that com comparable, would you think that your property would sell for more 
than the Carrillo strictly on the square footage. Okay, I wouldn't say it wouldn't rate on just the square footage. That's my point. The point is it's the lot size. It's the lot size and the number of bedrooms and baths. And again, I'm not a realtor. I can only go by what my realtor has told me. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, that's all I can speak to. So, so, I, so I with don't regards look to the square the, footage, what adjustments are you making for the differences in square footage to the sales price of nine forty-five? Like you're saying, what are you? What are you asking? I'm I'm not clear. Sorry. Well, to restate it. Do market participants pay more for larger properties or living areas? Or is that not a consideration? I think it's relative to the property size of the lot, the inside of the home, right? Like what, whether it's updated or old. I think there's a lot of considerations, and, and things are emotional. I mean, I, I can't speak to what people do or don't do. I can only tell you again. What, what her years of experience, because she's been there a lot longer than I have, is that people come to Ojai and they choose their properties for a lot of reasons, but they pay for property and views. I say a potential buyer takes into consideration a number of things, the lot size, square footage of the house, but there could be houses that are smaller than ours, that have just been renovated. And so a buyer coming in and looks at that and says, wow, this is really nice. It's been updated. So you can't just say property values increase or decrease solely based on square footage. There are other factors that take place, such as views, such as lot size, such as the physical number of bedrooms and bathrooms, whether a property has been updated, et cetera. Um, I have a question for you, Audrey. Uh, this is actually- You had the opportunity to ask opportunity. me questions. Accessor gotcha, questions sorry. Right now. Sorry. We have no further questions. Okay, thank you. I um, believe at this time we'll take um, all the testimony in consideration and we will deliver. So we still have our closing arguments. Oh, well, before we do that, <laughs> closing arguments uh, to the assessor, yes? The, um, yes, the, uh, the applicant would go first and then as the assessor has the burden of proof, they would make the final okay. closing arguments. So this is your opportunity for your closing arguments. I, I think I've really said everything that I came to say, which is that um, the surprise in this for us was that um, there was no um, attempt at conversation and stipulation when we were actually fairly close in what we thought our valuation was lower, you know, by $150,000. Um, but needless to say, um, I think I've said everything we need to say. Okay. Thank you. To the assessor. Thank you. Um, I do want to um, point out a few facts that I think were misconstrued um, during the conversation and testimony today. Um, 2022 was not the first time that we had had a conversation with regards to this particular property. Um, we actually stipulated in 2021 to a reduced prop, uh, value, Prop 8 value um, in 2021. Um, so we did have several different conversations, and wasn't uh, 2022 was not the first time that we actually had corresponded and worked together. Um, so um, I actually have an email um, that uh, we stipulated to your appeal 21-10613. Um, that was scheduled for the March 7th, 2022 hearing uh, on March 1st, 2022. Yeah. Uh, it's public record, but um, we actually stipulated to a, a reduced value in 2022. Um, with regards to the um, comparables that um, I have on my exhibit and what the applicant is stating um, was the first time <clears throat> that they had heard of some of them and um, in other properties that stated that um, they were given with regards to um, the appeal. 
um, I wanted to reiterate that in an email that I had mailed, or emailed to them on uh, April 20th of 2023 that I had reached out to them with regards to their appeal. Um, and I provided the four comparables that our valuation department had used in their annual Prop 8 evaluation that determined what they had um, determined to be the estimated fair market value and therefore reinstated their Prop 13 values. And those were the two properties on Los Alamos and um, one on Cayuma and, and one on Montgomery. So those were not the ones that I had personally used in my evaluation. Um, so they were aware, whether or not they read the email and where they came from, that, that is beyond the scope of this, but I did want to uh, you know, reiterate that I did not um, change my comps. Um, what I had provided in that April um, email was what the valuation department had used um, with regards to their annual Prop 8 evaluation. Um, so those were the, the two little things that I, I, I just definitely wanted to point out that um, I very much looked into this um, property. I very much um, cared about the, the valuation at hand. Um, the previous year in 2021, we did feel that the market substantiated that a reduction was warranted and therefore we stipulated to that value. Um, we had a, you know, a second appeal for the next year that the market did not have that supporting evidence that a reduction was warranted. Um, their Prop 13 did fall within the range um, again, without actually having the property on the market with market participants, we can only estimate what the, the home would be. Um, it is the assessor's opinion. That location very much comes into play with regards to value. Uh, square footage comes into play with regards um, to value. Um, so there are a lot of aspects to a home not just the lot size um, and not just um, whether or not a property has a view. In our evaluation, the three comps that I used do not um, have a view. Um, and therefore, you know, they, they still sold for what they sold. Um, the usable lot sizes were either comparable or larger and we made adjustments for that. Um, we just very much feel because of the uniqueness of this neighborhood, it is important to stay within um, this neighborhood and, and the guidelines. We did go out to the property and, um, you know, sit in the street and, and view the traffic. And whereas the, the trail, um, you know, hiking trail, maybe up the street, um, you know, there's just, there's no way to, to, to know what the traffic would really be like. Um, and when we were there, um, it was a typical residential um, type traffic. Um, I, I, we would assume that on the weekends it may be higher, but again, um, the trail didn't come after the, the home was built, built. It was always there. Uh, with regards to the multi-res um, uh, right next door, that was always built. Um, it, it didn't come up after they transferred. These weren't new things. These were things that they were aware of when they purchased the home. Whether or not things occurred after the fact, you know, is is just something that uh, we as homeowners have to to deal with. But um, with regards to our valuation, we very much feel it is important to make the differences in square footage, room count, condition, age, all those different uniqueness um, characteristics that somebody is considering when they are purchasing a home. Um, and therefore, when we do that to these um, properties that are in this neighborhood, their Prop 13 base year value is within the adjusted value range. And therefore, um, you know, we believe that that is potentially the lowest value indicator and the best uh, value to be assessed at um, because there 
our potential is that it could have been higher. Um, and um, as the assessor, we have to enroll the lower of the two value indicators, and, and we definitely believe that um, the uh, Prop 13 value is that. All right, and I just want to reiterate a few things. Uh, for the board, the list of comparables the applicant provided, again, in our Exhibit B, we listed why we felt those are not comparable. Um, in your deliberations, I do suggest looking those over to see the assessor's position on that. Um, the main thing really is location. Uh, downtown Ojai, above Grand, these are very um, definitive market boundaries that the market observes all the time. Um, both Audrey and I have had the Ojai assignment for some time now. I've had it prior to appeals and during appeals. We frequent this area often, and I actually, I reside in Ojai. So I'm familiar with how the market treats these areas. I'm familiar with the traffic influence on the subject property. In the assessor's opinion, there's no observed traffic influence other than typical neighborhood traffic. Um, and, you know, the biggest thing is location. You can't go outside of downtown Ojai at all. Um, our suggestion is staying above Grand. That's how the market treats these areas. Um, you'll see all of our comps are very close proximity to the subject, all above Grand. Uh, none of them, we didn't use any comparables further north of North Signal. Those would likely be superior to the subject, but where you are, your location has a considerable impact on how the market will treat your property. Um, the last note I wanted to say is the adjacent multi-res property. Um, there are many, many multi-res properties scattered throughout downtown Ojai. It is the assessor's pos position. There's no observed um, market evidence to show that anyone in the marketplace treats them differently if you're adjacent to a multi-res property. Um, I haven't, in all the years I've worked at Ojai, I've never seen market participants factor that in when they're purchasing properties in Ojai because they're just frequently scattered throughout. I, I could go through and point them out all throughout here, but um, I think that would be a waste of time. But that's the assessor's opinion on that. So um, with that, I believe that is all we have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you to the applicant. Uh, we will take all the testimony and uh, evidence presented into consideration, and we um, will make our decision later in closed session. Um, Brendan will inform you of the decision at some point. <laughs> yes. um, it, it depends on how quickly your board is able to reach a decision, but um, I'll just go with the legal deadline of no later than 120 days from today. But hopefully this week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have thank you. Here. I think we needed to uh, say this was exhibit one. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, yeah. The applicant's exhibit was submitted and it's labeled exhibit one. Thank you. One. Okay. Exhibit one. Okay. okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So at this point, I think we'll break for lunch. An hour, 45 minutes? Um, minutes. What, do you have my fellow? Uh, yeah, either is fine by me. I do have to go somewhere to get lunch. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. And, um, how about we do, um, I might need a little bit longer. How about we just do 145? It's about 145. All right. I'll um, alert the, well, we have Mr. Baker who will be next at 145, and okay. I'll let the parties following him know their approximate return times. Thank you.
Okay, we're back in session. Uh, I believe we are item 30. Item 30. Um, uh, Mr. Baker, okay. Yes. I've handed out copies of the applicant's application. Um, this is an owner-occupied single-family residence in Oxnard. Um, today your board is hearing the uh, um, change in ownership as of December 1st, 2020 and uh, December 19th, 2021. It's unclear who has the burden of proof in this circumstance, so I'd say let's get an overview from the assessor and hopefully that clarifies the issues and who has the burden of proof. Okay, sounds good. And so to the assessor, can, could you please provide an overview of the case? Unless, if you're accepting the burden of proof, I can hand out your case now. We're just not clear on who has the burden of proof, so. <clears throat> just for clarification, uh, the change in ownership in question is regarding the February 19th, 2021 purchase date. I believe the other date on the application is for the original property that the applicant had moved from. Uh, so I don't, that's not a date we're addressing in this application today. Okay. Unless I'm missing something, Brendan. Well, the whole appeal is filed on Prop 19 and the denial by your office. Right, can I turn your microphone on real quick, Mr. Baker? Um, yeah, I'm not certain either. So I'm looking at the appeal. Um, so, Mr. <clears throat> Baker, you purchased the subject property February of 2021, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and December 2021, or sorry, December of 2020 is when you had purchased the property that you were trying to transfer the value of to, or what happened in December 2020? Or is that when you sold the other property, or? No, actually. The ap ap application, which is one of the exhibits, when I actually, when I came into the uh, assessor's office in January of 2021, <clears throat> I spoke to uh, a person they summoned from the back about filing for Prop 19. They gave me a form to fill out, and I filled the, took it home, filled it out, brought it back. <clears throat> when I brought the form back, I was met by a different young lady. She says, you filled out the wrong form. So she gave me another form. I filled that out, brought it back sometime later, but she also told me that I had to have a copy of my driver's license and a copy of the taxes from the prior uh, residence that I sold in March of uh, 2019. So I asked her, um, I said, look, is there anything I need to be concerned about? And she says, no, you look fine. She goes, but there's a backlog of Prop 19 cases and we would like you to check in with us just to see what the status is. So I did that for several months. And then finally, uh, the, the assessor's office told me that um, they aren't getting a response from the county of LA. I asked her, I said, would it be okay if I reached out to the county of LA to see if I could get them to forward the documents to you? And they said, yeah, that's not a problem. I did. The county of LA, in fact, forwarded the documents. Uh, I confirmed that with their office. And uh, in my mind, I believe like, hey, everything's okay. It's going to go through. The money's going to. The taxes will transfer from the other property, and you know my tax base will be like five or six thousand dollars. I get a letter in the mail from the assessor's office. Um, it's actually an exhibit uh, stating that um, it was it was denied, and they uh, they cite taxation code sixty nine point five, which is in Prop nineteen. That's Prop 60. I didn't file for Prop 60. Um, so I went back and pulled down the forms from the uh, assessor's office and finding out that forms hadn't been revised until it uh, looked like sometime May of 2022. So my belief is, if I go to my first exhibit, do we have them? Yeah. Yeah, they're all in the, the no, exhibits. No. Um, so I think so let's, he's, let's, let's I think the applicant was getting into his case. Yeah, as so I want to back up for a second. So I, I'm still not clear 
And I don't know, Assessor, so I, I'm trying to clarify this. It, there was a deed on December 1, 2020, but it was reassessed October 20th, 2020. And so I'm not clear when the right change in ownership date is. I guess, Mr. Baker, though, you did not purchase this property until February of 2021, is that Right, you're talking about there were additional taxes that came to me that were predated to me purchasing the house. And, okay. Uh, and I, I, I called the assessor's office and asked them why, and they just basically said, look, it's your responsibility to pay them, so, you know, we paid them. I'm not going to go delinquent on taxes. Okay. I didn't feel it was my responsibility because I didn't actually, the house was uh, escrow closed February 19th, 2021. I didn't actually take legal possession of the house until June of 2021. I was out of state. I was up in Oregon taking care of relatives and stuff during the pandemic. Um, okay, so Mr. Baker, I just want to, don't want to get too far. So someone else had bought the house in December 2020 and basically quickly sold it and you bought it and no, but had no. to pay their taxes? No, actually, um, Mary and Jack Hogan owned the house. They were the original buyers of the house in 1993 uh, from Tymark uh, Development. They both passed away. The house went into a, a family trust. Um, their nephew, who lives in Washington, is the one that put the house on the market and um, had uh, Rick Wilson list the house through um, um, okay. Hathaway, I believe. Uh, so maybe we can clarify with the assessor. I think I'm figuring this out. Maybe it was October 2020 when they passed away in October 1st, 2020, when it, the title got transferred to the trust. I, I believe so, somewhere around there, I would imagine. I don't have the exact date, okay. so. And if the assessor can hopefully quickly verify it. But Mr. Baker, the only reason you're appealing that is because you became responsible for their tax bills. Right, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, I'm, you want to restate that so I don't say something that's not. Um, well, maybe if, if we give the assessor a second to verify what happened on these dates, since <clears throat> we're kind of certain <laughs> yeah Zachary Clifford with the assessor's office it appears that there is an October 2020 transfer and then the subsequent transfer uh, to the applicant on uh, February of 2021 okay. but the 2020 transfer was not to mr. Baker correct he just became responsible for the taxes for that transfer? I mean, you wouldn't know that part because that would be private between him and the seller. But I was trying to just confirm October 20th, 2020 was not a transfer to Mr. Baker. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. It, it, that transfer did not involve Mr. Baker. Okay. I have a question right now uh, on the application that I have here, I see a date of December 1st, 2020. Is that, what's that date? That's not a date that we have. It's on your any. website as a deed being recorded that day. So maybe that's when the trust changed title after the, I, I'm shooting in the dark here, just trying to help us put the pieces together. But based on what Mr. Baker said, could that deed just be, changing an ownership for a non-reassessable event? Not according to our records. We're not familiar with that date in terms of this property. Okay. Uh, we can check with the recorder's office to confirm, but based on our uh, chain of title history, uh, there is no transfer on that date. Okay. So Unless the applicant uh, can point to some other documentation that shows differently. Uh, so I brought up the recorder's site. 
So on 12 1 2020, there was an affidavit of death recorded. Um, and let, let me double check here. Okay, and the death was October 20th of 2020. So, okay. Yeah, so, so what that I clears suspected. it up. So, December okay. 1st, 2020 is when the deed affidavit of death was recorded, but it was effective 10 20 2020. Uh, Sorry, our, our system doesn't reflect the recording date got it. of that. Okay, yeah. and that's why Mr. Baker got something is because a supplemental assessment was issued for that, and him as the owner had to pay the taxes for that. But that's just between him and the seller, so this board wouldn't. Well, I actually, I'm, yeah, I, I don't really think it was between sellers. I actually asked the assessor's office to go back to the original owner. They said no, so I ended up paying the taxes. Right. So that's that not, would, that that's would, not the that's not the crux of the reason right. we're here today, but I'm just yeah. So we're just trying to clarify why that was on your appeal. This board, um, I guess, technically, you if you had to pay the taxes, you would be an affected party for that reassessment. But if the main issue is just tied to your December nineteenth, twenty twenty one purchase, and whether or not that should have received some type of exemption or preferential reassessment that's the main thing you're here to address right. today right yes. the other date was listed merely because you became responsible for the taxes i didn't um, put that date on there they, their office called me about my application and what they told me is they wanted me to appeal the prop 19 and also the evaluation on the property okay so i said okay fine they amended the document i didn't amend it myself okay. mm. uh, so I, I believe we have all the necessary dates clarified <clears throat> And really, the only concern for the board today would be the February 19th, 2021 change in ownership. Okay. Okay. So we're only addressing that issue. And that's the assessor's understanding, right? That was your original statement? <laughs> yeah, that, that was our understanding in okay. communication with the applicant and based on the appeal and the issues in the appeal. The only issue is the uh, when he purchased the property, February 19th, 2021. Okay. That was our understanding. Okay. Yeah. So, so back to, that, for that issue, who has the burden of proof right. for that issue? <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess I'll do my quick uh, overview, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, so the subject property is located at 2310 Pebble P Beach Trail in Oxnard. This is a single-family uh, residence. Um, it's located in a tract neighborhood. Um, the applicant is disputing his sales price uh, for the February 19th, 2021 change in ownership date, um, as well as he feels that he is, uh, he qualifies for um, a claim of persons at least 55 years of age uh, for transfer of base year value to the replacement dwelling. Uh, so today's appeal is going to cover two subjects. What's the correct value for the subject property as of the date of transfer? And do any exclusions apply? Specifically, does this fit the base year value transfer uh, exclusion apply to the subject property? Um, since the valuation issue needs to be addressed first, uh, the burden would be on the applicant since he is disputing his sales price um, for a rule two marketed sale. Um, and then the board will then determine if any exclusions apply. The assessor is prepared to address both issues today and we don't feel a need for bifurcation is needed in this scenario. Um, um, yeah, so I believe that would be the overview of the property. Okay. Uh, Mr. Phillips, can I clarify, and I, I'm guessing this is because Proposition 19 is new and we haven't had a similar issue. Normally the board would resolve any issues of exemption first and valuation second. Does the valuation determine the eligibility for exemption and that's why we have to do that first in this circumstance or? Yeah, so in this circumstance, um, well, part of the assessor's argument is that Prop 19 does not apply to this property. Uh, it is the prior older Prop 6090 that applies to this property. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is, in order to determine eligibility for that exclusion, 
the valuation needs to be established first. Um, and then once you establish the value for the subject property, that's what gets compared to the old property and determines eligibility in the exclusion. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Baker, then it would appear that you have the burden of proof. Um, we're addressing the issue of the valuation first. Well, if I may, mm -hmm. I'd really like to explain how we even got here. Because <clears throat> when I walked into their office, I never applied for Prop 60 or 90 or anything else. I asked specifically if I qualified for Prop 19. Um, and I was told that I did. So I could have delayed the closing of escrow until April, after uh, April 1st. There's um, declarations in the books from all the realtors that were involved in the case. Um, if, I, if I may just take this through, maybe I'll get to the evaluations, but if I can just walk through the beginning of this of how we got to where we're at today, um, I think it would be a little bit more meaningful for, for the board. Um, may not fit what Joe wants me to actually do, but uh, we can get there with the evaluations after I get done. But um, Okay. In January of uh, 2021, I came back to California uh, to look to purchase a property to move back after the pandemic. I looked at this one property at 2310 Pebble Beach. I submitted an offer. My realtors knew that I wanted to try and use the new law for the taxes of transferring from the house up in Santa Clarita, actually in Aqua Dulce. Um, I was told by all three agents, plus the brokerage firm and the escrow company they wanted to use that I needed to see the assessor's office to find out exactly what the criteria was to qualify. So I went to their office and uh, a young lady was summoned out of the back, told her exactly what I was doing when the property was sold in Aqua Dulce um, and the piece that I wanted to purchase. She gave me a form, I filled it out, brought it back later. Uh, I was told by a different person that I filled out the wrong form. Um, so I filled out the new form and submitted it sometime later with my driver's license and the taxes from uh, the prior location. A few months later, um, after uh, relying on their information to my detriment, um, I got a letter in the mail stating that I didn't qualify. And they cited exactly what Mr. Phillips is saying, the replacement uh, property of uh, 69.5, which has either got to be of the same value or lesser. I didn't apply for that. Um, so what I've done is I believe, as I sit here today, that the doctrine of equal gestapo which is a legal principle that stops someone from taking a legal action that conflicts with a previous claim or behavior. Essential, uh, equal estoppel is a method of preventing someone from going back on their word in a court of law. The timing of the close of my escrow was in reliance on the representation of the employees of the assessor's office. And after I had detrimentally relied on the information I had received from the assessor's office, that office took back and took a inconsistent position based on the assessment uh, of that inconsistency, and this is unfair, and I believe that the doctrine of extapo, equal extapo, precludes the office from going back on their initial uh, assessment. Um, as set forth in the California Evidence Code 623, uh, it's, it outlines the doctrine of equal extapo, and plus the Supreme Court um, has ruled on this as, as well as equal estoppel. So when I'm at the counter and I'm submitting the paperwork, I asked the young lady, I said, is there any red flags here? And she says, no. On the one exhibit that I have, which is the actual application, it shows the sale of the property um, in Aqua Dulce on three, March 19th of 1919 at $589,000. At the top of the document, it shows when the close of escrow took place was 219.21 for $822,000. Clearly, when, the, when I was originally in there, if somebody would have looked at this, they could have simply just told me, hey, look, you don't qualify for anything. You don't qualify for Prop 60, 90, or 19. It would have allowed me, um, as the purchaser of the property, to say, you know what? I'm not going to buy it. 
I'm a man that's retired on a fixed income. I'm certainly not going to take on a piece of property where my property taxes are ten, eleven, twelve thousand dollars. Here I'm looking at something that's more in the line of maybe five or six thousand dollars, which is a large increase from what I paid up in Aquadosa because I own that property for, you know, almost forty years. So, saying that, I believe that uh, that the equal estoppel applies in this case. But then, it didn't really dawn on me until just after I really started reading um, Joe's email to me in October about the justification on, on the comps on the evaluations of the property. I put in a number of comps. Actually, I, you'll see in the book, I put in lots of comps. None of them were accepted. Um, I did have a realtor, a friend of mine, Rex, look at him, who's been in the business for 30 years. He thought that uh, some of the comps were, were realistic and would apply to the property. But as I, as I looked at the evaluations that Joe put on the properties that, uh, that he maybe considered, I think it was like the third time around, I realized that this was never about Prop 19. This all along, this office processed this thing by, by a, a Prop 60, which if anybody had any training at all in the office when they looked at the documents, they would have said, Mr. Baker, look, I get what you're trying to do but you don't qualify for this. You don't qualify for 19 because it's gotta be, you've gotta basically close after April 1st, and even though you're 12 days late from the two year limit, you're 12 days outside the scope of Prop 19, you don't qualify for that either. And oh, by the way, you can't qualify for Prop 60 because the house you're buying is of more value. So here, I, you know, here I'm sitting and I'm, and I'm just dumbfounded that, that I've, I've been put in this position and I don't want to say, look at the people that I've dealt with, the assessor's office, are nice and polite. But there's something willfully lacking here with training. So as I'm talking to people in the office, like Audrey Ramirez, who was, was going to do the evaluation on this, she told me that Caleb Hine was going to do the Prop 19. So all along when I'm having these conversations, not one person, not even today, has said, you know what? We didn't process your property on, a, on, on Prop 19. We took it in, in a different route. That's unbeknownst to me. It's only by looking at Joe's email in detail and then going back to the declination letter and getting into the taxation code, which I'm not an expert on. Um, you know, maybe in other points of the law I might be, but not on this. And I look at it and I realize immediately that, God, I can't believe this. This thing was never gonna fly. So here I am today, stuck with a house that I wouldn't have purchased, stuck with taxes that I can't afford, and, and, uh, and it seems that there's no wiggle room. So Joe did bring up some issues, and he did do the hypothetical thing in his email about even if you would have um, closed April 1st, uh, your house closed in March, so you don't call. I, I get all that, and I don't disagree with you about any of it. In fact, I don't, really, the Prop 60, all of that, I don't disagree with it. But... When it comes to the evaluation to the house, I did an inspection on the house. And I know that in Joe's email, which is listed here as an exhibit in the, in the book, along with a bunch of other stuff. Should we um, label these, this exhibit? Uh, you can. I, I tabbed each one. Yeah. They told me not to. Yes, uh, so for the record, except applicants exhibit 1 through 10 have been submitted. And we'll, we'll just label that as the okay. tabbed it. Thank 1 you. through 10. Okay, you can continue, Mr. Baker. Would you like me to continue? Yes, please. Okay. Um, on Joe's email, he um, listed five properties that, uh, for the um, evaluation and comps. They're all in the, in the track that I live in. Um, but there's a, a problem with the, with the assessor's view of the house. On one of the exhibits in the back, it's probably number nine. Is it nine? No, it might be the last 110. It's from uh, Cypress Point, and it's the actual catalog of the houses that were built by Trimark. There were three builders in that track. Trimark went bankrupt. Another company came in, 
my house was uh, one of the first houses built. It was a model in 1993. The assessor's office lists the uh, square footage of that house of 1,973 square feet. The builder shows it as uh, 1,918 feet. It's actually a little bit smaller than that, but that's not gonna make much difference on doing the comps and stuff. That house that was built as a model was built as a two bedroom, two bath house, not a three bedroom, um, two bath house. And though the ones that Joe, and I don't know, it was a different builder that built these houses that he's, he cited, they may well be uh, the same, they may be three bedrooms, they could be two bedrooms, I don't really know. Um, where is that document? But all of the houses um, that he quoted, other than one, well, actually all of them, are of less value than mine. And uh, the square footage for price, if you average it out, is down to like $262 a square foot. On the ones that uh, I submitted for for uh, Joe's consideration after most of the other, in fact, all of the other ones were basically um, thrown out. Um, even though they were of less value, you know, it's 640, 676, 675. I guess that when he basically does his uh, comps to, for Prop 60, they come up to be of uh, more value. However, at Prop 19, they would be of the, you know, there wouldn't be any increased in valuation in the property. So, um, you know, I felt that those were good comps. I had an appraiser look at them, Rex, who thought they were, they were good comps. There's one at the bottom that thought that this property was uh, more inconducive with mine, but he didn't want to accept it. So, on my tab three in the book is a summary for the property tax appeal, which basically states everything that I've, I've said to you. Um, Tab four is a declaration under California Civil Code Procedure Section 2015.5, which uh, is usually accepted by administrative courts. There's no reason not to. It's signed and dated by myself. And uh, again, at the back on 17 outlines at the timing, basically restating what I already said at the timing of the close of my escrow, that. I relied on the employees of the assessor's office to my to have a detrimental impact on me, and I believe that uh, the doctrine of equal estoppel applies here. I've also included on tab five, um, who was the listing uh, realtor, uh, Rick Wilson, and um, basically talks in his in his declaration, which you guys can read. I don't I don't want to uh, bore you with all of that, but. Um, uh, he even states in number seven that the, the, the uh, front room or the front bedroom, which was going to be a bedroom, was converted into an office by the builder to accommodate buyers. The space has no closet or doors, and technically the house is uh, a two-bedroom, two-bath house. And uh, um, Mike Marin was another realtor involved, which basically states that the escrow could have moved, been moved to April 1st. But... It's a moot point because I was 12 days outside the limit, which I realize now. The time I did this, I didn't realize that. So um, the same thing with uh, Stephanie, who, who signed it as well. And then uh, there's the, uh, all the comps that I put in here. And I do realize now that there's a 90-day rule. So I, I get those should be um, um, thrown out. The other portion of this on valuation is that I had an inspection done on the house. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't there when it was done. It was done on January 13th, and I'd already left to go back to uh, back up north. But I did have the opportunity to sit down with the inspector afterwards, and um, he did share some concerns. Of course, at this time, uh, escrow had already closed, so um, he shared concerns about um, leaks in the bathroom and things of that nature, but he thought it was just moisture and all that kind of stuff. As it turned out, I had a contractor uh, walk the house, Beeler Construction, and um, they outlined... Um, a number of flaws with the house, tuning to about $70,000. Um, but Joe told me that unless I'm involved in litigation, which I think is absolutely ridiculous, unless I'm involved in litigation, their office wouldn't consider this. Well, maybe I don't, first of all, the cost of litigation 
is super, super expensive. May well exceed this. Um, but the fact is that the house was damaged. Um, so there's, there's that that impacts it as well. I don't um, necessarily understand, um, and I'm sure Joe will explain it because he is uh, you know, a professional. Um, I know that he'll explain how he gets the extra evaluation, but I noticed that when he was talking to me about my house that I sold in Aqua Dulce for 589, that uh, you, know, you can bring it up in percentages. And I think in his email, um, I'm trying to find it here. Excuse me. Right. In his email, he shows the price, I think, would be, and he'll, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, I know he will, but as he should, but, uh, I think it was like 600 and. $70,000 or something like that. So uh, he has the range down here. So it, the, you, my, my whole point really today, um, I don't know, maybe there's some way of taking 69.5 with the damages to the house and, and lowering the valuation and making it fit into Prop 60 or 90. I don't know, I'm not an expert on that. Um, but I, I, I do know one thing. Um, I came to this office in good faith, seeking advice. Joe tells me I was seeking legal advice. I spent 50 years in public safety. I know what legal advice is. Going to a building in safety to get permits or going to your assessor's office and asking for information about how, if, if in fact I even qualify for a particular program, they should have the expertise in which to basically say, yeah, you do or you don't. And it's not like anything was hidden here. Things were on top of documents in front of them. So for me personally, um, I mean, it's a real travesty. I don't know if there is a way out of this. I think there's a number of things that have happened with the property, some we won't consider today. Paying supplemental taxes, which I didn't even own the house. Asked them to go back. They were unwilling to even entertain that thought. They said, no, just pay them. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay them. You know, I'm not going to get involved in a dispute with the, uh, the assessor's office. And then I'm thinking back in my mind, well, I got Prop 19, so it's a little money out of the pocket, but I'll get it all back at the end of the day. That didn't happen. So today, uh, when I get the taxes and they reassess the house, taxes started out at like, I think the, the tax bill I got was like $8,800. Now it's almost $10,000. They go up 2% per year, even though inflation's gone up, people are bringing home less money, but yet we're gonna ask for more money and there's less money in the pot to give out. So for me, um, if I would have been armed with that information, I can honestly sit here and tell you that there is no way I would have purchased this house. Absolutely not. It wasn't the only house in the world, there's other houses. I, do, I, I have to say though, though one thing, and when Joe does his comps, and, and he starts referring to these other neighborhoods, you know, they're substandard, it's almost like we want to redline properties. And all these properties are well within a mile of my property. So to say why they couldn't be considered to adjust the evaluation of the house, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that they've got an explanation for it. That's their job, and I respect that. But at the same time, um, I, I really feel that uh, uh, the doctrine that I, that I cite is a real doctrine. It's really in the evidence code. Um, it is the law, and it out trumps the taxation code. So with that, I'll yield to, uh, to Mr. Phillips, or any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you. I don't have any questions from the board. I have no questions. Not yet. OK, not yet. <laughs> OK, uh, we'll turn it to the assessor's office then. All right, so uh, for my first questions, I want to kind of focus on the value first. Um, so your, the comparable sales you're relying on uh, are numbered eight and nine, is that correct, in your exhibit? I think it's tabs eight and nine.
your email. I'm sorry. Are you referring to your email, Joe? No, I'm referring to the comparable sales that you're relying on for a lower value. Um, it's page eight and nine of your exhibit. Right, but the, those, well, yeah, they're in the back, back there in the back. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the exhibits. Okay. Yeah. No, you're right, eight and nine. Eight and nine, okay. Um, out of these comparables, are any of them in your direct neighborhood located in the same tract as you? No. Are any of them model matches to your property? Um, I don't know if they are or not. Okay. And, and really, to be honest with you, to find a two-bedroom, two-bath house in that area within a two-mile two area is, is, is extremely difficult. It doesn't really exist. I guess I can phrase it another way. Do you, are any of your comps the same exact square footage as your property? Um, close, but no, I didn't find any exact matches. Okay. Um, I did want to note for the board, um, if you're looking at is tab eight on the second page, uh, comps one through 11 would violate the 90 day rule. And then if you look at the tab nine, uh, all comps on those on page one and two of tab nine would violate the 90 day rule as well. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then my next question is, You said you came into the assessor's office in person yes. prior to the close of escrow. Is that yes. right? Yes. Uh, do you know the date that you came into our office? No, not offhand. It was sometime early January, I would imagine, somewhere around there. Okay. So you don't know the exact date? No. Okay. Um, I, I will just want to just say one thing. You're referring to those comps in the back, but in your email, there's other comps that I sent you, which are in, your, in the scope of your email as well. Right. I was just clarifying okay, a few things fine. about your no. comps. And I openly admit that the other ones are outside the 90-day rule. <clears throat> um, Zachary Clifford with the assessor's office. Uh, did you ask any of your realtor uh, friends about the merits of the assessor's comparables since we've already shared those with you? I'm sorry. The comparables that the assessor plans to use in their presentation. Did you ask your realtor friends about the merits of those comparables? Bear with me. Are you talking about the ones in Joe's email? Correct. Uh, no, I did not. Did you get a home inspection prior to close of escrow? Yes. Did the home inspection spell out any of these repairs that you have found since? Well, there's, you know, the unfortunate thing with inspections, they are, they're never absolute. Like they said, um, hey, there's some tiles shifted in the, in the, uh, on the roof. Um, don't know if it's a problem. Um, I was told that the roof had been replaced in 2010. It didn't. It failed. I actually have the receipt for having to replace that. Um, damaged the drywall inside the house. Um, leaks in the foundation, which I did a, a patch on but the house has to be repiped. That's all part of the stuff that the, that the uh, contractor went through. And I've got copies of that too, if the, if the board uh, wants to see it. But um, yes, I did do an inspection report for a long answer. Yes, I did. And how long, do you remember how long your escrow period was? Well, they could have been as long as I wanted. I mean, they were from, well, they closed on February 19th. So I put the offer in after I looked at the house. Well, actually, after I came back from the assessor's office, I put the offer in and, um, you, know, you know, we just, they wanted to do a quick escrow, but they would have done a longer one if we asked. And so we just went ahead with the escrow. If I would have known different, I could have extended it out, but it wouldn't have made any difference because of being 12 days late. You can't, I mean, look, you're going to ask me all these questions. You're going to try and parcel around, but the reality is, no one really wants to talk about the elephant in the room and the fact that misinformation was given by your office. I look at, I'm, I'll sit here and accept 
everything that Joe lays out, the fact about um, that I didn't qualify for either program, I get that. But that's not why I'm here. I believed I did. I relied on your information. Not to this day has anyone ever said, you know, Bob, we didn't process 219 and we're really sorry. It's like you were seeking legal advice. It's your problem. I just, I think, you know, I, I spent enough time in government to know that's not acceptable at any standard. Did the assessor's office explain to you that there would be a review process of your application before any approval would take place or denial? Um, or were, did you expect the, uh, the person at accepting your application to give you approval no, at I, that no, moment? No, I, I, uh, I asked if there was any red flags and if I qualified, I was told I did. She didn't see any red flags. Did you consider that as approval? when she said that there was no well, red I flags. Well, I felt that if I got the taxes over there, I would be on solid ground. Yeah, I relied on that information. That's why I went ahead and closed the escrow. I didn't know about an April 1st date. I have no further questions. Okay. I do have, sorry, a couple more questions popped up. No, go ahead, Joe. Just for clarification, uh, your, when you purchased the property, it was listed for sale, is that right? On the open market? Yes. And both the buyer and the seller were represented by real estate brokers, is that right? Yes. Okay. And you did you negotiate a sales price with the seller? Where you know submitted an offer and they well, of course counter I, offered? Yeah, of course I did, Joe. You know I did that. Okay. Just to clarify. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm a quick I'm question. Trying to remember. Oh, quick. quick question. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, Mr. Baker. Uh, the list, I'm looking at uh, your listing sheet from your house. It says list price $799, close price $822. Were there multiple offers? Yes, and we weren't the highest uh, offer on the house by any okay. stretch of the imagination. Okay. And then um, it looks like the contract was signed um, by the seller on 1-8-2021. So January is when you opened escrow, right? I believe so. Something right around there, the 8th, 9th, something that like that. Sounds it was right. their escrow company they wanted to go to. Okay. Okay. Just double checking. Any other questions? That's it. Okay. Um, I believe it's time for the assessor's presentation. Thank you. Assessor's exhibit A, B, and D have been submitted into evidence. Thank you. All right. Uh, Joe Phillips with the assessor's office. Um, I'll be going through my exhibits starting with A, um, and I'm just going to basically start reading from page four of my exhibit A, if you'd like right. to follow along. Um, also, it, it will likely maybe be more helpful if the board refers to page six, which is the timeline of events. Um, as I read, that way perhaps it'll be easier to follow along if you're looking over the timeline at the same okay. time. Thank you. Um, all right. So the, the appeal today is the applicant submitted a claim for persons at least 55 years age of age for transfer of base year value to replacement dwelling. Uh, the assessor denied this claim and the applicant is disputing this denial. Part of the claim requires determination of the fair market value of the replacement property. The applicant all, is also disputing the fair market value of the replacement property as of February 19th, 2021. Um, so we established all that. So I'll move right into um, 
So the subject is a single family residence located in a tract called Cypress Point in Oxnard. The subject backs to the River Ridge Golf Course. The listings for the property states, in part, we founded a single story with a view. Walk to tea time for a round of golf or relax in your backyard overlooking the River Ridge Golf Course, putting green in the desirable Cypress Point community. Uh, the subject was purchased February 19th, 2021 for 822,000. The purchase price was accepted as fair market value and enrolled pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 75.10A and 110.1B. <clears throat> per Revenue and Taxation Code Section 110B and Property Tax Rule B, the purchase price of the property is presumed to be the fair market value if the property sold in an open market transaction. The subject's February 19th, 2021 transfer was an open market transaction. The property was listed on the open market and, the, and it transferred at arm's length between unrelated parties represented by brokers. Um, the application submitted, <coughs> I'm sorry, the applicant submitted a claim of persons at least 55 years of age for transfer of base year value to replacement dwelling. This is commonly referred to as Proposition 90. Revenue and taxation section 69.5 states in part, any persons over the age of 55 years or any severely or permanently disabled person who resides in property that is eligible for the homeowner's exemption may transfer subject to the conditions and limitations provided in this section, the base year value of that property to any replacement dwelling of equal or lesser value that is located within the same county or is purchased and newly constructed by that person as his or her principal residence within two years of the sale by that person of the original property, provided that the, <clears throat> excuse me, provided that the base year value of the original property shall not be transferred to the replacement dwelling until the original property is sold. The original property was located at 13237 Reservoir Avenue in Santa Clarita. The original property sold on March 19th, 2019 for 589,000. The subject is the replacement property, which was purchased on February 19th, 2021 for 822,000. The claim for base year value transfer was denied since the replacement property was not equal to or lesser in value. The applicant is requesting that the subject not be evaluated under the provision set forth by Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.5, which is referred to as Proposition 90. The applicant wants the newly passed Proposition 19 to apply to the subject property, which is governed by Revenue and Taxation Code 69.6. .6. Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.6 .6 states that the provisions set forth do not apply until after April 1st, 2021. Since the replacement property was purchased prior to April 1st, 2021, Proposition 19 cannot be applied. The applicant has also indicated that the assessor provided false information and had he been told that Proposition 19 would not go into effect until April, after April 1st, 2021, then he would have held off closing escrow until after April 1st, 2021. Had this been the case, the claim would still have been denied under Proposition 19 because Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.6 Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.6 requires the replacement property be purchased within two years of the sale of the original property. Any date after March 19th, 2021 would not qualify under Proposition 19 nor Proposition 90. Uh, part of the applicant's complaint is assessor staff provided false information regarding the new Proposition 19, and had he known the correct facts, he would have made different decisions. <coughs> Revenue and Taxation Section 69.6 .6 was not added until September 30th, 2021. Also, the Board of Equalization Guidelines on Proposition 19, which was Property Tax Rule 462.540, were not originally adopted until August 24th of 2021 and effective January 1st, 2022. 
Therefore, there was no way for the assessor to know the details of Proposition 19 at the time of the subject's purchase. It is also not part of the assessor's duties to, to provide guidance on when to close escrow. For these types of issues, the assessor always recommends the homeowners consult with their own legal counsel. The assessor performed a site check on October 2nd, 2023. The assessor was not allowed entry into the interior of the property due to health concerns. Uh, so the assessor and the applicant agreed that the assessor would rely on the listing photos for the interior of the property. <clears throat> so here's the, page six is the timeline. Uh, as you can see, original property sold March 19th, 2019. Replacement property was purchased uh, February 19th, 2021. So we reached the deadline, the two-year deadline that Revenue Taxation Code requires. Uh, Proposition 19 went into effect on April 1st, 2021. Uh, here I want to note on July 29th, 2021, <clears throat> that is a note dated in the assessor's record stating the homeowner called and was asking questions about his supplemental bill. Um, then on April 24th, 2021, that's when property tax rule 462.540 was adopted. Um, that provides guidelines for Proposition 19 from the Board of Equalization. Uh, <clears throat> September 30th, 2021, Revenue Taxation Code 69.6 .6 was added. And then on November 19th, 2021, there's a notes in the assessor's record stating the homeowner called and was asking questions about the Proposition 19. And then about 10 days later is when we received the claim to transfer the base year value from the original property to the replacement dwelling. Unfortunately, we don't have any records of the applicant coming into our office to ask about Proposition 19 prior to the close of escrow. That's not to say he didn't do that, it's just not in our records, it's not in our notes. So um, I'm unable to verify if he did or not. Um, so for valuation on page seven here, <clears throat> I'll just skip down here. We use the direct sales comparison or the market approach for our valuation. And then I'm gonna go to that now. So that's gonna be exhibit B. What I want to point out here is on page two of exhibit B, I have our first three comps here. Uh, you'll notice if you look at total living area, all three comps are model matches to the subject property. Same builder, same year built, same quality, um, same bed and bath count, fireplace, everything's pretty much the same. We have a little bit different miscellaneous improvements and some different lot sizes and a different view. So the subject is one of three houses in this tract that actually does have a view of the golf course. Uh, the other ones are considered a golf course community, but none of them have a, a view uh, of the golf course except for the subject and two other properties. So it is a bit unique for its neighborhood. And then moving on to page three, comps four and five are not model matches. They're just slightly bigger by about 200 square feet. Uh, but I wanted to provide some additional comps from the subject's neighborhood um, to further support the subject's sales price. And if you'll see on my page four, oh, it's not there. Well, if you look at page two and three, you'll see <clears throat> the range, the high end of the range is 868,900 and the low end is 710,000. Um, the subject sales price fits kind of neatly in the middle there. Um, so <clears throat> for that reason, it was accepted as fair market value. Uh, page five is the map of the subject and comps. So over to the east is where the subject from its backyard has a view of the golf course. 
and you'll see none of the comps have a view. There's a, um, if you look at that Acadian Shores Trail, if you were to drive along there, you wouldn't be able to see the golf course to the north because there's a large uh, dirt burn, um, hill that kind of blocks the view. So that's why none of the other properties here have a view of the golf course. It's just the three houses there that the, san that the subject is sandwiched between. Those three are the only ones that have a view of the golf course. And I believe it's a view of the putting green and the clubhouse and that sort of thing. <clears throat> uh, starting on page six, we have some photos of the subject property. Uh, page nine are photos of comp number one. 10 is comp number two. 11 is comp number three. 12 is comp number four. And 13 comp number five. I have the listing on page 14, which I think we've already seen. And then some listings from of the comps that I was able to get. Not I was not able to get all of the comps listings because I guess some of them were taken down after the sale. So I got the ones that I could grab and they're there. Um, <clears throat> Exhibit C is some of the references I've made. Starting on page two, we have the, the denial of the, uh, pro, uh, the 55 base year value transfer exclusion. Um, and as you can see on page three at the top there, we have the original property and the replacement property. The original property gets two years of the inflation factor. And then according to revenue taxation code 69.5, <clears throat> it gets another 5% each year of an increase. So the 589 plus all the factoring gets us to 660,858 for a comparison value. And then we see that the 822 purchase price is uh, much higher than the original property comparison value. So that's why it was denied. Page four, five, um, six, all of this is part of the application. Page seven, page eight. All right, so page 10 <clears throat> is revenue and taxation code 69.5. That's the one that governs the base year value transfer exclusion for the subject property. I highlighted it has to be equal or lesser value and within two years. Um, and I already quoted the relevant portions of that. Uh, on page 11, we have revenue taxation code 69.6. This is the new code that was established for Proposition 19. Uh, you'll see I highlighted it's for all transfers on or after April 1st, 2021. And it also has the two year requirement that 69.5 has. And then finally, page 12 was just a copy of property tax rule two, talking about how the sales price is presumed to be fair market value, unless there's a significant deviation of more than 5%. And then, um, my exhibit D, I wanted to give kind of a summary. Uh, all the comps that the applicant presented today, he did provide to me prior to today. So I just wanted to give an explanation as to why I did not use their comps. It really came down to, I wanted to stay in the subjects tracked and use model matches or properties built by the same developer and that sort of thing. Uh, all of these are outside the subjects tract. And if you'll look at the notes here, even though I didn't use them, I did apply what I would have adjusted them to. And you'll see many of them, the adjusted sales prices would in fact um, support the subject sales price as well. 
I'm not recommending using them because I feel the comps I've used are much better, but I just wanted to give the board an idea of what those would adjust to if I were to use them. Uh, the problem is they require very high adjustments due to the many differences between the subject and these comps, so I just wanted to highlight that for the board. Um, <clears throat> so in conclusion, Uh, the assessor has carried out all duties according to the Revenue and Taxation Code and Board of Equalization Guidelines. The assessor's appraisal indicates the subject's purchase price of 822 on February 19, 2021 was fair market value. The assessor requests the board sustain the purchase price on February 19, 2021, as well as sustain the assessor's denial of the base year value transfer claim according to the provisions set forth by Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.5. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, does the board have any questions? I have two questions for Mr. Phillips. Uh, will you confirm for me, Mr. Phillips, that the subject and all the comps were built by the same builder? Um, I believe Mr. Baker um, gave testimony that there were different builders. Okay, um, I don't have that at, at my disposal right now. Uh, I can't confirm if it was the same builder. I can confirm it's the same tract. Um, perhaps there were multiple builders at that time. I would have to dig into the assessor's records to find that out. Um, but it's part of the same development, same tract. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't say who the builders were. I didn't research that, so sorry if I misrepresented that. Okay, and my second question has to do with the bedroom count. Mr. Baker, I may be confusing the two cases, but are you did you mention that this was completed as a two-bedroom house? My, this, my house is a two-bedroom, two-bath house. With an office. With an office. All the other houses are designed, uh, or at least the ones that I've seen, like the one across the street, which was built by a different builder, if you can believe that, right across the street, is a three-bedroom, uh, two-bath house. But mine is, is a two-bedroom, two-bath house. It was the model for the track. So, um, had I, I see that your model matches are all listed as three-bedroom, two-baths. If they had been completed as two-bedroom houses with an office, would, this have, uh, would there have been an adjustment made for the bedroom count between two and three? Um, <clears throat> so the assessor's office doesn't typically do adjustments for differences in bedroom count. Uh, we feel we address that with our square footage adjustments. Um, it's the assessor's opinion that if we were to do a square footage adjustment and then also do a bedroom adjustment, that we would essentially be doing some double dipping of adjustments there. That's the assessor's reasoning. Uh, but to answer the question about if there's two or three bedrooms at the subject property, I'd like to reiterate, uh, I, at the field check, I was not allowed an interior inspection due to health concerns. Um, so I had to rely on the listings for the interior. If you go to page 14 of the subject of uh, Exhibit A, I'm sorry, Exhibit B, page 14 of Exhibit B, you'll see uh, the listing shows it as a three bed, two bath, which confirms the uh, assessor's record. So I did not have enough information to warrant changing the bed count for the subject property uh, since I wasn't able to view it with my own eyes and now all the documentation supported three bedroom, two bath. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Chair, as yes. a follow up to Mr. Wall's question, um, your office, is there a closet in the office? No, ma'am. Is there an inset There's where a, a closet uh, used to be? Yeah, there, there is an inset right there, um, but no closet and no doors. Okay. And it's a double cased opening. It's not a, you know, like a single door for a bedroom. So it was double cased, I guess, to accommodate people to come in. Mm -hmm. So, and there were three, by the way, there were three builders. Trimark was the first. They went bankrupt. 
And uh, there's a number of different, uh, two other builders that built homes to finish up the uh, development over a course of three or four years. Okay. 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 Um, can I go out of order and ask one question? Of course of you can. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, how did you originally hear about uh, the 55 and over exemption? Um, from a friend of mine about Prop 19, who told me that it had passed. When I inquired about it to my realtors, nobody really, even people at the escrow company, nobody had any real depth knowledge about any of this. So what I was told, they said, look, in order to find out if you're even going to qualify, you need to go to the assessor's office. So when we were down here, I came over here and talked with them. They gave me a form, and filled it out, came back. They said it was the wrong form. So I, when I left, I took the forms with me and sometime later brought them back and, and dropped them off. And, and here we are. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Mr. Baker, do you have any direct questions for the assessor uh, regarding their presentation? Uh, well, I, 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 there is one thing that, that, uh, that I am concerned about. I know that he's using, and, and Joe, I know you're using um, uh, the other properties in, the, in our development, and, and I understand why, but those houses were built by a different builder. Plus, I've submitted an exhibit that shows from Trimark when they built. I don't know about the other builders, but it shows that the square footage, because you're telling me you'd make adjustments for square footage, this property is 1,918 square feet, not 1,973. So that must have some impact. And plus the bedroom count should have an impact too on valuation. Well, Mr. Baker, actually I'm gonna, I'm sorry. Uh, I believe you'll have a chance for your closing okay, statements. Okay, We're just looking for questions at right. this stage. No questions then? No. Okay. No. Mr. Um, Chair? Yes. I just wanna clarify, because I'm realizing there's a few different values floating around, mm -hmm. and I think it might have to do with that earlier issue of the date of assessment, because the application mm -hmm. doesn't match up to the assessment. So, so Mr. Phillips, the value that matters is the 822000 as of September 19th, 2021. Is that the correct value that this board needs to weigh in on for the um, transfer? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the board is deciding the value as of February 19th, 2021, and that is the purchase price of 822,000. Uh, Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. And sorry, just so that I have a clear, mm -hmm. everything in one place, the applicant's opinion of value as of the date of sale is what? Put it on the application. Looks 625,000. 625, okay. Yes. And then what was, the value of the home that you sold? 589,000. So, sorry, can you do that with your microphone on so it's recorded? I'm sorry, um, the, the value of the house I sold was 589. Apologize. Okay. Um, I believe it's time for closing remarks. Um, Correct. We start with the assessor. Correct? Yes. <laughs> In this case. <laughs> Sorry, time for our closing, correct? Yes, please. Sorry. <clears throat> um, yes, so uh, just in short summary, the appraisal that we relied on relied on three model matches and two other homes from the applicant's direct tract. Uh, it has a name, it's called, let me say it one more time. It was uh, Cypress Point in Oxnard. Um, these comparables that we relied on um, showed that the sales price for the subject property fell within the range. Um, one thing the applicant noted in my emails that I don't think I spoke on is even if you went to the very bottom of our range, um, which I think was 710, uh, you, he still wouldn't be able to uh, qualify for the base year value transfer because that would still be higher than, um, than his, ori his original property's sales price. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we followed the revenue taxation code according to 69.5. Um, and as I explained, 
Revenue Taxation Code 69.6, .6, which is about Prop 19, uh, would not apply due to it only being effective April 1st of 2021, which was after the sale of the subject property. Um, so that's why we have to apply Revenue Taxation Code uh, 69.5 for this one. Um, so for these reasons, we asked the board to um, <clears throat> agree that the sales price is considered fair market value and that the applicant does not qualify for the base year value transfer exclusion uh, for this sale. And that will conclude the assessor's presentation. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Baker? Well, would I would go back to my opening statement about equal estoppel, which is a legal doctrine. It's codified in the evidence code section 623. And for me, the timing of the close of my escrow was relying on the representation of employees of the assessor's office after I had detrimentally relied on their information receiving from the assessor's office. That office took an inconsistent position based on the assessment and that inconsistent consistency. This is unfair and I believe the doctrine of equal estoppel precludes the office from going back on their initial representation as to me when I filled out the forms. Plus I also feel too if uh, the condition of the house was considered that it, uh, it may have an impact on, uh, on lowering the value of the property. And does that conclude your uh, yes, sir, closing remarks? Yes, it does. Um, do we have any further questions? Okay. Before your board concludes, uh, Mr. Baker, your appeal also raises challenge of the market value as of January 1st, 2022, approximately 11 months later. Do you still wish to challenge that issue and continue that matter on to a subsequent hearing date, or are you withdrawing that issue at this time? Are you talking about... Appeal pending, is that what you're talking about? Your your appeal, so box A, decline in value is selected, which is the market value as of January 1st, 2022. Uh, so nine months later, or sorry, 11 months later, the value as compared to what the assessment run rolled. Are you still challenging that for a temporary market value reduction? Yes. Okay. Um, would April 22nd work for that? Um, I, yeah, I guess that would, yes. I guess we need to I thought I already this. addressed that, though, with you earlier, but I guess not. Sorry, do you believe you presented documentation to that value today as well? No. Okay. Um, I don't know the assessor. I, do you need data on that? And is April um, 22nd okay? Yeah, so... Our communication has not encompassed uh, January 1st, 2022. Uh, so there would be similar requests for information and kind of similar process as this base year value one. So data provided in the next 30 days? Uh, yes, please. Or 30 days prior to hearing is fine as well. Chairman, so we have a request to continue the market value for January second, twenty sorry, January first, twenty twenty two, to April twenty second, twenty twenty four, with the proviso that requested data be provided to the assessor at least thirty days prior. Um, so moved. Second. All right. All right. No objections. Motion carries. All right. So that concludes. If, if your board would like to take the case under submission now. Brendan, help me out here. Uh, we have, since we still have this issue of deciding uh, uh, whether or not um, the exemption applies. The, yeah, okay, where this Prop so 19 exemption applies. We're basically um, bifurcating this hearing. Right. Yeah, exactly. um, so we'll, we'll deliberate in closed session on, both. on this. And then we'll come back in April to look at the um, January 1st, right. 2022 value. Right. 
Okay, got it. So your board will still take under submission what you've heard today for the base value and, and make that decision. Okay. Okay, yeah. So um, thank you to the assessor, Mr. Baker. We will take everything, the testimony, the exhibits into consideration, and um, we'll reach a decision, and which will be communicated to you within 120 days. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Brendan, are we going to be addressing the prior case next? So the board wanted to return to item uh, 60, yes. 34, but I understand the assessor needs a few minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, so if you could give me 10 minutes, I think I just need to go print a document real quick. Are, are you involved in item 49? Can we address item 49 and then? Or do you need uh, to do that? No, I'm not involved in 49. So do you, if you guys want to start that case and I can come back. Leave it. I'm a, yeah, I'm, board members, you okay with doing that? So item 49 is a jurisdiction hearing, which was next. Um, and then Mr. Nimi and Ms. Zatnowski are item 34, so the assessor is requesting a recess right. so Mr. Phillips could do that and then we could do 49 while that's being taken Just, care of. I, I mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking back at my notes. Um, I I 30, applicant said 30 minutes, right. assessor said five, five. minutes. So I'm we can, or we could take a 10 minute break and. I'm concerned about keeping the NEMIs. Let's ready. just do that. Let's take a 10 minute break and then. And then we'll, have your we'll be ready for the NEMIs to just go. So. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So at least turn get at 315? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs>
We're back on the record, Chair. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> so, um, Hold, sure. just a second. Right. So, just for the record, we're going to go back to item 34, mm -hmm. and uh, the board has decided to reopen this briefly for some clarifications. And so, correct. Um, County Council, any other guidance we need to clarify before we no. go? Okay. No, well, just to let the parties know that the board has not been apprised of anything. So, you don't need, don't assume that they know anything that you've discussed with Brendan. Got it. Okay, who are we starting with? Okay, so. Our applicant? Um, oh, sorry. Start with, are we starting with the, our applicant? The, I, that's what I'd advise is <laughs> go to the applicant and then let the assessor okay. respond. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> let's just, let's try that. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so so um, at the close, um, at break for lunch, I was confused at a few things that um, Audrey had said, particularly that we had worked together um, in the past, um, successfully, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to get Audrey, but she decided to leave a different direction. So Joe was there and I said, hey, Joe, I go, I'm confused because she said that we'd worked together before and I don't recall that. And he said, yes, he goes, I believe she misspoke. And he was going to then do some investigation. But then we went to lunch, and I'm like, well, she misspoke. I thought about that. And then there were two other things that I feel she misspoke about in her clothes that we had no chance to respond to. And I said, how would the governing board, if Joe does explore this a little further, how would they find out? So we sent an email to Brendan saying, you know, in the hallway, um, Joe said he believed she misspoke. He was going to check in. And there were two other things we thought she misspoke about. So um, Joe, I mean, Brendan said we should come back. And so we are. And okay. so, the th but in sitting here, of the three, one, we really, she did not misspeak about. It was because it was in 2022 that apparently she and my husband emailed back and forth and did resolve a stipulation. And, and that was something that, like I said, I had no conversation with her or no realization, but he had in looking at emails passed. So the very thing that um, Joe said, I believe she misspoke and we thought she misspoke, that was not. She did not misspeak about that. But the other misspeak too, was the um, email that you recall, I said, what was presented in Exhibit A did, was not reflected to us as the comps. And we have the email that she sent. And um, only one of the um, comps that she used in her Exhibit A is one that she gave us. Um, and the others don't appear. And the one that she did use that's in her Exhibit A what she sent us, the square footage is different. We talked about that. And both in the square foot of the dwelling and of the lot size. So um, those were the other two, like in the end in her resolve or wrap up, whatever you want to call it. She said, you know, and I sent these emails and it, it got a little confusing as to the clarity of that. So to be perfectly clear, we have an email from her with four comps. They are not what are represented in Exhibit A. Two of the ones in Exhibit A are ones we provided that support our position, we believe. And um, and then, yeah, that's that's that, those are that. So okay. I yield. A uh, quick question. Sure. Uh, so when you when there was an email exchange in 2022, was that re with regards to the 2021? Uh, no, value? no, or, uh, no, no, no. That was that was another year, and that was what she said. She goes, you know, okay. we've worked together successfully in the past, but this time we didn't agree with you. Yeah. No, it was for twenty twenty two, right? I'll, I'll clarify for the our, the clerk of the board's records indicate the twenty twenty one appeal was resolved in March twenty twenty two. That's so that's what that's, that's why a, I said twenty twenty two. The twenty twenty okay. year appeal right. was resolved in yeah. in April twenty twenty one. So you know, the the chain of yeah. resolution of the appeals on record indicate it was the twenty twenty one appeal. Okay. Great. Thanks. It was dated twenty twenty two. Right. And she referred to it as twenty twenty two, which the whole thing threw me because I wasn't involved. He did it directly with her. Okay. Okay. Through email. Thank you. And to the assessor? Uh, Brooke Hill representing the assessor's office. Um, I have a few emails here. It sounds like uh, the stipulation, the prior year stipulation is no longer 
a outstanding question. Um, and it looks like you found the email dated for 20 of 23, um, where Ms. Ramirez sent you four comparables that the valuation department had used um, to reinstate the Prop 13 value, essentially. And um, there's also an email, and I'm happy to provide this um, to you and the board if it's necessary. There's one from May 31st of 23, um, where she also sent um, the four comps, which in the email she says were the best comparables um, due to their location and some other things. And she ultimately used three of those, um, and then one that, that you had used, the one on uh, Kuyama. So I'm happy to distribute these emails if you'd that'd be great if you'd like. Um, it does get a little confusing um, for a lot of applicants that we do an evaluation internally for lean date, and then for the appeal, we normally do a, a fresh look at it. And so there are two emails reflecting the different comparables that were initially used and then later um, used. And we were operating on the initial, obviously. Uh, Mr. Vlahakas, do you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I know the applicant said yes, but Mr. Chair, do you want to allow the exhibits to be entered? In yes, the I do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Just for clarity, I'll provide both emails. Uh, there you go. Mr. Chair? Yes. If I may address the applicant. Please. Uh, just so you know, um, how we usually see the information coming forward. Um, I've heard it said before uh, how the assessor's office works is they have what they call their working papers. And, you know, their, um, their background information that they're looking at. And they may look at one comp and then decide, oh, I'm not going to use that one, find a better one. So there are working working papers that have comparables, but they don't necessarily end up using them at the presentation. So things change as they do their, their, their work, as, is what I've seen. Got it. And I'd just like to add real quick, maybe for the applicant's benefit, uh, when I said misspoke in the hallway, that was probably the wrong word. I probably should have used the word confusion because uh, I was slightly confused <laughs> in, in that moment. So not misspeak, but confusion uh, is just for clarification. Okay. Uh, Brendan, are the, yeah, so it looks like these are marked three and four, but... Are these? Uh, we'll just call them Exhibit C. The, both the emails will be Exhibit C for the okay. record. Okay. Yeah, my apologies. I thought it was going to be part of a bigger. <laughs> no package. problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Just for the record, I'm going to go back because I'm now looking at your second email. Right. Again, they don't match, and but I'm understanding with with. Ms. Little is saying, bottom line is, again, what we relied on was the information we were sent. Um, they don't match. The second one doesn't match with her exhibit either, which you're saying is something. But again, I think this speaks to a larger issue that I'm hearing today with not just our case, but the other case. And that is that, um, you know, we rely on the information that is emailed to us and that is said to us when we call as a, you know, a government entity. And when you can't rely on that, you know, it gets a little dicey out there for us. So I just offer that as a, I don't know, parting comment, I guess. But anyway, okay. thank you. And we appreciate it. And we're sorry we took as much time as we did. No, it's fine. Thank it's you. Insane. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to the assessor's office as well. Just since the assessor has the burden of proof and the right to close the hearing, we should just verify that they don't have anything else to add since they have the right to close. Got it. To the assessor's office. No, I think, I think we've covered everything. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we're on to Mr. Devan. Mr. Devan, if you want to come forward to the podium. Item 49.
Okay. Yeah, we'll call it applicant number one. All right, applicants exhibit one has been handed out along with a copy of the application. This is a hearing to determine if the board has jurisdiction to um, over to hear challenge of a denial of a land conservation act contract renewal denial, if I'm summarizing at that. So since the applicant is the one requesting the board invoke jurisdiction, um, and it's not a residential property per se, it's agriculture. I don't think there's a burden of proof and, and we would go with the applicant to explain why they have juris why they believe the board has jurisdiction in this matter. Okay, sounds good. Uh, okay. Mr. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here to, and it's somewhat confusing sometimes of why I'm here, but I'm here to appeal the, um, a reassessment of one of my parcels of land uh, that resulted from the fact that we were non-renewed out of a uh, uh, land contract. As a result of that, our property taxes on that one parcel went up. I think it's in the paperwork I gave you, about $8,000. Well, it's about 12000 for two years. And... Um, the one part, um, my ranch consisted of, it still consists of 14 parcels. 13 of them are in an LLC, and one parcel is my wife and myself only. The parcel that's in dispute is to my wife and me only. I call that parcel 165, which is the last three numbers on the, on the parcel. Now, uh, according to the... Um, law, the county, anybody that wants to non-renew that, whether me or the county, has to serve written notice on the other side. If you look at my exhibits two and three, those are the required notices. Both of them are sent to WD Investments LLC, not to me and my wife. So it's my position that that that's an illegal or improper revocation or attempt to revoke my contract. And based upon the code, since it's an improper, or if you find it's improper, the contract goes on forever until it's properly canceled. And I shouldn't use cancel because that's a technical word in yes. this Mr. area Mr. of law. Mr. before you get too far, it sounds like you're getting into the merits as to why you believe that you shouldn't have been put into non-renewal. I want to make sure we're clear. Today's hearing is just for the board to decide if they have legal jurisdiction to hear that issue of if you were improperly put into non-renewal or not. So okay. you're going I'm, a little too far. I, I just want to, in case you're going to go on into that further, I just wanted to stop. We want to go home. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the issue is jurisdiction, whether you have the jurisdiction to hear this issue. The county's position is you don't, but um, I've never been provided any information, be it a statute, a regulation, or anything that says you can't hear this issue. And I looked at the uh, Assessment Appeals Board manual, and in Chapter 5, under the title uh, Determining Values in Cases Involving Legal Issues, I think there's an example in there that's kind of on point with, with what I'm saying, and I think you have jurisdiction. I wish I could tell you why, but it, there's no writing that says you do or you don't have jurisdiction to hear this, and I don't know why you don't have jurisdiction to hear it. That's the, why you're in existence is to decide tax issues, property tax issues, and that's what this is. I was reassessed, my taxes went way up, I want my money back or to be applied to next year's taxes. And with that I rest because I have no specifics. I looked and looked, but I can't give you a code or regulation number that says 
I do or they don't. So I okay. go to the county. Okay, thank you. Just real quick, Mr. Devan, um, the, you mentioned the quote from the assessment appeals manual, and I, I've read it myself before, but I don't see that in your exhibits anywhere. Is that correct? You have not given us that page from the assessment? I have not given you that page. Okay. I read that last night. Okay. Can you just, for real clear for the record, so legal counsel can research it, what page of the assessment appeals manual that was? Page 60. Page 60? Yeah. Thank you. you uh, County Council, is that necessary? You don't need a copy, right? No, I can look at Thank you. Are you talking about the assessment appeals manual for this county, or are you talking about the assessment for the state? The State Board of Equalization, correct? Okay. I think it's the state. Yeah. This is the first time I've ever done this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I, I, I can get... got me to confess last time I was here. <laughs> All right. Okay, and so if your board doesn't to, have any questions, we could go to the assessor. Or? Yeah. Uh, do, do the board members have any questions? Or? Not yet. Not okay. Yet. Uh, okay. To the assessor, um, would you like to state your position? Yes. Do you have documents or just? Or? Uh, so we have documents. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I can discuss some of these copy afterwards. <laughs> Just don't let me forget. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assessor's Exhibit A has been submitted into evidence. Thank you. Okay. Steve Bates with the assessor. Uh, the so the uh, subject property, APN 10800090165, located at 7735 Coyote, Coyote Canyon Road in Camarillo, um, application 22 slash 1103. Assessor's position is that the Assessment Appeals Board does not have jurisdiction over the non-renewal decision. So the information that the assessor has is the Ventura Board of Supervisors adopted the updated Land Conservation Act, also known as LCA, guidelines, including the enforcement non-renewal section on December 10th of 2019. The updated LCA guidelines are included as an attachment. The pertinent text of the non-renewal protest section has been highlighted, and that I believe is um, on page 20, 23 and 24. Per these guidelines, the county's non-renewal decision can be pro protested, but only if the protest is filed timely. The guidelines indicate if a landowner if a landowner does not timely protest a county decision to non-renew a contract in accordance with the above requirements, the county's decision to non-renew the contract is final and non-appealable. The Williamson Act Government Code Section 51200, Authority of Board of Supervisors to Establish Rules Governing the Program, GOV 51231, is also attached. Mr. Devon did not timely file a protest on the non-renewal. He, contra he contacted the assessor after he went to pay the tax bills. Therefore, per the LCA guidelines, the non-renewal decision is non-appealable. Mr. Devon has taken a non-renewal has taken a non-renewal decision on different properties before the Ventura Superior Court, and the non-renewal determination was upheld. The court's ruling is attached, so we have that. Um, so that I believe, I think, just referencing the uh, Board of Supervisors was I think I mentioned it on page 23 and 24 and that's highlighted numbers two and three. And then we also have, um, after page 25, we have the uh, California code, government code 51200 and 51231. 
And after that, we have the um, Superior Court of the State of California um, ruling. And that completes our presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Devan, do you have any questions for the assessor? I have no questions for him. I just have a, a, a point to make. Um, should we <laughs> go back to the assessor for? Yeah, the board has no. Does anyone have Mr. any questions? Board has no questions. For the assessor? I have a question for the okay. assessor. Mr. Bates or Mr. Bradley, either. Mr. Devan has stated that he wasn't properly noticed that the notification letter did not go to, and I know the letter didn't originate from the assessor's office, but I am concerned that WD Investments LLC received the letter and not the uh, Mr. Devan or his wife. Do you have, is, is this a concern that we should be taking notice of? Uh, Scott Bradley of the County Assessor's Office. Um, there were, in our presentation, we mentioned how Mr. Devon had there's um, several, I think he said 13 other properties that he took before the uh, Ventura County Superior Court for the non-renewal determination. And that was a similar situation where I think he didn't receive the non-renewal. Um, so he went that route. So um, I think there is a way for him to pursue that through maybe the Superior Court for this parcel as well. But our point here is that um, the, the board cannot um, decide on the non cannot make judgment on the non-renewal decision. May I speak, please? Um, Mr. Bradley, those other parcels was, who, was whoever was on title for them, which was, I believe, n not the husband and wife as individuals, were they, was that, was proper notification given on those? In other words, I'm not sure, you may be a false equivalency here suggesting that the same method of uh, appeal is available for um, Mr. Devan in this instance because I don't see that he's been properly notified. And I understand the notification didn't come from your office, but this seems to be an odd situation. Yeah, I'm not too sure about, about that. I'm just, I know that, that the kind of the, the crux of our case here is that per the LCA guidelines for his, the non-renewal to be seen before you, there would have had to have been a formal protest. Um, which was not made. Why? I don't think it matters at this point because he's saying, well, he wasn't notified and I think that's something that can be pursued, um, but not through this route. It's Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll chime in on what you're asking, and, but I need to ask the applicant. Um, are you a um, partner or a director of WD Industry Investments LLC? I, I am. That is you. And well, it's me. It was me and other people, and right now it's just me and my wife. We bought them out. Okay. And um, WD Investments LLC receives mail at Coyote Canyon? Yes. And do you... Personally, you and your wife receive mail at the Coyote Canyon yes. address? 
Yeah. Okay. So you did receive the notice of non-renewal? No, well, it's our position we didn't, but we litigated it on those 13 parcels and lost that. They, they sent us about an inch worth of paperwork, they claim, and I've never seen it. My wife has no memory of getting it, so I don't know. Our mailbox, and we haven't had a problem with theft in mail, but our mailbox is out on, it was out on Bradley Road for a while, so I don't know. But so, the, the difference is, is that they sent it to WD Investments. We deny getting it, but the court found we got it. They don't admit or even allege that they sent it to us individually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the difference. Both of us can take, either one of us can take a writ. If they lose, they can take a writ. If I lose, I can take a writ to the court. So, okay. but you basically heard the case I'm going to make in the court. It's going to okay. be quick. I'm going to ask kind of a side question. Um, are you still farming? This particular parcel 165, are you still farming that parcel? I'm ranching it. I You're run ran cattle. You run cattle? Okay. Um, a few coyotes, a mountain lion every now and then. But no, <laughs> it's, it's a fun okay. place. And um, I'm reading the letter from Ventura County Assessor's Office, October 23rd, 2020. Um, second paragraph. It states that our records indicate that you have failed to return the agricultural preserve questionnaire for the past nine years for the LCA contract. Um, had you, in fact, been returning the agricultural preserve questionnaires? I don't know if we did or not. We did some, mm -hmm. but you know, I don't know. I didn't know there was a problem there. We're going to change the whole law and all you know, on the December 19th. Mm. But though that letter is addressed to WD Investments, not John and Kathy. So. However, the entities are the same. No, they're not the same. Uh, well, um, if, if, if I were going to send you a letter, you and your wife, where would I send it? That address on um, Coyote Canyon Road. On, pardon? Coyote Canyon Road. At the same address as WD Investments? At yes. Si okay. It's, so one of the, it's one of their addresses. Some things got sent to my office in Burbank that went to WD Investments. Why that happened, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, our, when we bought the ranch originally, our address was on Bradley Road, and then they changed it to Coyote Canyon, and then the, the people that live in Coyote Canyon wouldn't let us put our mailbox next to theirs. And then the post office had to get involved and let us receive our mail. Okay. So. Okay. And is there any current litigation uh, through Superior Court regarding no. the LCA contract? No. Okay. And any filings with the Board of Supervisors regarding the LCA non-renewal? Not Regarding this, the other case there was. There was, okay. And that's the one that got denied, right? Right. Okay. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we? <laughs> so I, I think any closing statements from the assessor and then from the applicant. Okay, to the assessor. Uh, well, just to summarize our case is um, that it does look like Mr. Devon is um, part of his his cases. He's not. He's claiming that he was not properly notified of the non-renewal, and um, but I think that's separate from what we're looking at here. Is um, as we mentioned that um, because he did not. Uh, do a formal timely protest of the non-renewal and uh, per the LCA guidelines, the, uh, therefore the non-renewal is not appealable. Um, so that's basically it. Okay. 
And to Mr. Devan, in closing? Just, just to that last issue, um, if they don't send it to me, I can't appeal. I mean, that's a very basic uh, legal principle. If somebody doesn't send you something, you're not responsible for it. Uh, that's, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, I guess we'll take everything in consideration and deliberate in uh, closed session. Do you have any questions? I have one. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have one more question. Go ahead. If I may. <laughs> okay. Um, if the non-renewal letter, I'm not sure what year it was, maybe, what year was the non-renewal letter sent out to the applicant, supposedly? In what 2020. Year? In 2020? Yes, October was, 2020. Okay. That's the date of this letter. I think tw 20. You had a 20? I'm, I'm not sure, though. I, I'm okay. under oath. I, I, okay, so the non-renewal, uh, you're going to basically come out of the contract. So as of 2020, if you had a 20-year contract, you'd have had, you know, today's, well, we're 2024, you'd have a few years left. So my question is to the assessor, do we continue to value the property um, during the non-renewal period as if it were under the LCA? I'm sorry, we weren't prepared to speak on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the answer yeah. for that. Board member Little, just to clarify, this, there will be a subsequent hearing on market value. On the valuation. Um, and if your board invokes jurisdiction, there'll be a subsequent hearing on that non-renewal. So valuation is pending. Um, I was actually just thinking about if we should set a hearing for that or not. But since the jurisdiction question is so uncertain, um, mm -hmm. I think it would be better if I coordinated that subsequent hearing based on your board's decision rather than trying to have everyone commit to that right now. So okay. depending on what your board decides, we will either have a, if the board invokes jurisdiction, then we'll have a hearing on whether or not it was improperly placed in denial or not. If the board says there is no jurisdiction, then we'll proceed to the value of the property for 2022. And that's when those questions would be addressed. We're in a new contract. Okay. We missed out two years and got renewed. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Um, we will consider all the evidence submitted and deliberate and um, be informed of our decision. Okay, so we're free to go? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, yeah, just Thank you, Brian. Yeah, just as, as I just mentioned to the board, because we don't know the outcome of the jurisdiction issue, once it's decided, then we will set the subsequent hearings up with you. But otherwise, you're all set for today. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, what, 57, 59? That's correct. Okay. Miss. Heisen, Ms. Salant, if you guys would like, you can come take a seat up here.
how does your application get the sensor implementation that you're using first? So um, that's the follow along of the application. And then um, you still request the universal timing of that, correct? Yeah, oh, we have a chance to just try to do it. Okay, so it's just ready to go. All right, board members, I think we're all set. I've handed out the application as well as a copy of Assessor's Exhibit A, and is there a B behind it? A and B. Um, <clears throat> as Ms. Uh, Heisen was not here um, this morning, I do need to swear her in real quickly, so if you could please uh, raise your right arm. You saw me from that the testimony you're about to give in the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, one quick matter of business that I realized this morning when I was printing out this application. Um, this We previously had a hearing where, where your board determined to accept this application as timely filed. There was an originally a question of if it was timely filed or not. Um, one thing I, we, we did not do um, was address um, the completeness of the application in, in section six. So if you look at the application, page two, section six, the only thing selected is other. Whereas if you look at the very last page of this package where the more recently filed application, there are boxes B1 and B2 selected. And that's because Ms. Heisen reached out and worked with my office to make sure that that later application was filed correctly. However, just to clarify, to correct the record, uh, the applicant does need to amend the, this first two applications in section six to select boxes B1 and B2 for the July 16th, 2021 change in ownership um, to make it all compliant with what they're eligible to um, appeal. And so I apologize, we did not catch that at the last hearing when we were discussing timeliness um, so again, section six, B1 and B2 need to be selected for July 16th, 2021. Just want to confirm with you, Ms. Heisen, that is your intent to in challenge that reassessment, correct? Really fast, so I'm not sure what you're asking. Okay. The, the intent is that we have an appeal for, well, there were three issues. Um, one is the parent-child, which I think we have basically resolved. Um, and another one is the over 55 exclusion, and the other one is valuation. So as long as those are in all three, then we're good. Okay. Yeah. So board members, we just need a, a motion to approve that amendment just to clear up the technicalities. So moved. I second. Thank you. No objections. That motion carries. And I will just note for the... Record one other clarification. Appeals 22-11423 and 21-11424 are both for the same notice of supplemental assessment. So only one appeal is necessary. Um, but to keep the record clear, we'll, we'll just um, take care of it as necessary based on your board's decision today. And findings of fact have been requested and paid for by the applicant. So, I think that takes care of all the housekeeping items for this. <laughs> okay. And looks like uh, the assessor carries a burden of proof and will be going first, correct? Yes? Okay. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, board members, for your time today. Um, luckily on this one, I think we have it boiled down to one issue, 
that the board is going to need to make a decision on today. Uh, but I do have to go into some detail about uh, a lot of the suggested changes that I believe the assessor and applicant are in agreement about. There's just one last issue we're not in agreement about. Uh, so I'll try to address the things we're in agreement about as quickly as possible and then get to the meat of it. Okay. All right. So, uh, so the assessment under appeal is the supplemental assessment for the subject properties July 16th, 2021, 66.66 partial interest transfer. Uh, at issue are whether the transfer was a change in ownership, and if so, whether the base value for the change in ownership is correct. This report addresses the change in ownership issue only. So um, the assessor feels that this does need to be bifurcated. The valuation would have to be heard at a later date because the board's decision today is going to directly impact the valuation and you know what the correct date of the valuation should be, and that'll change what comps we can use and that sort of thing. So the change in ownership needs to be decided first, and then we can move on to the valuation date, uh, valuation at a later date. Okay. Um, so today we're going to address the change in ownership issues for this property. <clears throat> So a bit of history here, on January 5th, 2021, the owner of the subject property, Cecil Salant, passed away. This is according to the affidavit death of trustee recorded on June 21st, 2021. The property was held in a trust titled Cecil Salant Trust dated October 22nd, 2019. This is a revocable trust that became revocable when Cecil Salant passed away. The trust stated that the primary beneficiaries of the trust were Laura Beth Heisen, Andrea Salant, and Madeline Salant, AKA Madeline Hendel. <clears throat> the trust stated each beneficiary was to receive a third of the assets in the trust. The successor trustee is Laura Beth Heisen. Finally, the trust states that the trustee has the authority to allot different kinds of disproportionate share of property or undivided interest in property among the beneficiaries. Uh, this is commonly referred to as non pro rata distributions uh, by the California State Board of Equalizations. Um, and then the last fact here is on July 16th, 2021, a deed was recorded where Laura Beth Heisen, successor trustee of the Cecil Salant Trust, granted the property to Andrea Salant. All right, so those are the kind of the facts, real quick. Uh, and then next, I want to talk about how the assessor originally treated these series of events. So the three beneficiaries filed a claim for reassessment exclusion for the transfer between parent and child. The claim was approved. Therefore, the January 5th, 2021 change in ownership was excluded from reassessment. As of January 5th, 2021, the three beneficiaries were considered the owners of the property. The assessor then determined the July 16th, 2021 deed was a 66.66 change in ownership since Andrea Salant already owned a third of the property as of January 5th, 2021. It was now the sole owner as of July 16th, 2021. <clears throat> so that's how we originally approached this. Uh, and then next, this is what the assessor is suggesting today. And I believe this is what the applicant also agrees with. So the assessor and applicant both agree on the following changes. The January 5th, 2021 change in ownership should be a 66.66% reassessable event. The July 16th, 2021 deed should be a non-reassessable event because it reflects the distribution of the property according to the trust and is only a clearing title deed. <clears throat> so the main reason for these suggested changes is due to the assessor receiving the trust distribution. Many of the Board of Equalization's guidelines for how to process trust-related transfers depends on how the trust is distributed to the beneficiaries. So when we originally worked it, we didn't quite have all the facts of how the trust was distributed. Once we got those facts following Board of Equalization guidelines, this is how we feel it should be treated. And I will go into some detail as 
as to where the Board of Equalization says this is how we are, ought to do it. <clears throat> so on January 5th, 2021, this is a change in ownership according to property tax rules 462.16B2. Um, a change of ownership does occur at the time the revocable trust becomes irrevocable. Uh, property tax rule 462.260 also says for purposes of reappraising real property, as of the date of change of, in ownership of real property, the following date shall be used. And for trusts that are revocable, the date the trust becomes irrevocable. So example one, A creates an inter vivos revocable trust that becomes irrevocable upon A's death. The date of the change in ownership is the date of A's death. And all, property tax annotation 625.61 and property tax annotation 220.761 um, also speak about this. So that's why we're using the date of the, uh, the date that the trust became irrevocable as the change in ownership and not the July 16, 2021 date. Uh, the trust allowed the, the trustee to distribute the assets non pro rata. According to the trust distribution and the close of escrow documents, Andrea Salant provided funds in order to equalize the distribution. As directed by the Board of Equalization, this is seen as Andrea purchasing the property from the other beneficiaries. Uh, and Assessor's Handbook 401, page 90. <clears throat> Furthermore, unless prohibited by the trust, a trustee who makes a non pro rata distribution may encumber the property with a loan prior to distributing the property to one beneficiary. The trustee may then distribute the loan proceeds to the other beneficiaries to equalize the value of the distributions to all of the beneficiaries. However, the trustee must be the party encumbering the property and the trustee may not encumber the property with a loan from the beneficiary who will receive the property. A trustee may obtain a loan secured by the property from a third party lender such as a bank or a beneficiary who will not receive the property as part of the trust distribution. And then it has example 12.27. 12 uh, D transfers his real property to his trust to be distributed on a share and share alike basis to children B and C upon D's death. The trustee is authorized to make non pro rata distributions. Upon D's death, the only asset is the real property with a fair market value of 500,000. The trustee distributes property to B. B gets a $250,000 loan and pays C from loan proceeds or pays C $250,000 from personal funds. <clears throat> the transfer of real property to B qualifies for the parent-child exclusion as to B's 50% interest in the trust asset. The other 50% is a change in ownership as a sibling transfer. Uh, property tax annotation 625.0235.005. Um, <clears throat> Under the facts presented, the trustee also has the power to encumber the trust property by using the property as security for a loan. It is our view that a trustee who elects to make a non pro rata distribution of trust properties, which are not of equal value, may encumber property by securing a loan and distribute the proceeds of the loan to the other beneficiaries or beneficiaries in order to equalize the values of the shares of distributed property. Additionally, the encumbrance on the property must be considered in determining the value of the share of the beneficiary who receives that property. However, a money contribution by a beneficiary of the trust in order to equalize the shares of the beneficiaries for the purpose of trust distribution constitutes payment for the interest of the other beneficiary, in effect, a purchase, even though it may be characterized as a loan. <clears throat> in our opinion, a two-third interest in the property is subject to reassessment because one child beneficiary provided consideration cash to the estate in order to equalize the shares of the, benef of the beneficiaries for the purpose of distribution of the property under the will, constituting payment for the interests of the other beneficiaries, a purchase of the other siblings' interests in the property. And then finally, property tax 625.0235.010. In this case, the trustor's revocable trust became irrevocable upon the death of the surviving trustor and the beneficiaries became the beneficial owners of the family home. In other words, Gary obtained 
One sixth ownership interest in the family home upon the death of the surviving trustor. The transfer of one sixth interest in the family home from the trustors, <coughs> the parents, to Gary qualifies for parent child exclusion under six, section 63.1. As to Gary's purchase of the remaining five sixth interests of the family home, such purchase from the other beneficiaries would not qualify for the parent to child exclusion. So, as quickly as I could, that is our justification for why um, the date of the change in ownership should be when the trust became irrevocable and that um, Andrea's one third percent that she inherited qualifies for the parent to child exclusion, but the two thirds that she in effect purchased from her two siblings would be considered a reappraisable event. So we're saying it should be 66.66% as of the January um, passing. Um, the July would become a uh, just a clearing title only deed, which would not be reassessable. It just reflects how the trust was distributed after the trust became irrevocable. Okay, so moving on to the issue at hand today, <clears throat> the part that requires the board's determination is um, the only remaining issue for this appeal is whether Andreas Salent qualifies for the claim for transfer of base year value to replacement primary residence for a person at least age 55 years for the January 5th, 2021 change in ownership. This is commonly referred to as the 55 plus exclusion. So I'm gonna be refer referring to it as that for the rest of this appeal. The applicant feels they qualify for the 55 plus exclusion, but the assessor has determined this change in ownership do it does not qualify. So, Revenue Taxation Code uh, Section 69.5 is the law that establishes the 55 plus exclusion. We've talked about this um, actually in the prior case. Uh, so, Property Tax Annotation 200.0086. This is going to be our main source for how to approach this situation of the 55 plus exclusion. This basically defines exactly the situation that we find ourselves in and why the applicant does not uh, qualify. So I would say pay very close attention to this annotation. <clears throat> so section 69.5 authorizes the transfer of base year value of an original property which is eligible for the homeowner's exemption to a replacement dwelling, which is occupied as the claimant's principal place of residence as an, and is eligible for the homeowner's exemption. The section deals with the original property and the replacement dwelling as single integrated units. The definition of these terms found in subdivisions G, three and four refer to a building structure or other shelter constituting a place of abode whether real or personal property, which is owned and occupied by a claimant as his or her place of residence, and any land owned by the claimant on which the building structure or other shelter is situation, situated. These definitions support our conclusion that the terms original property and replacement dwelling are intended to refer to the entire property as single integrated units and not to fractional interests in such property. So that's very important. What they're saying there is uh, basically, this the exclusion applies to 100% changes in ownership, not 66% changes in ownership. So, I'll keep reading. For that reason, we have generally followed this interpretation for purposes of applying the various requirements of section 69.5. <clears throat> for example, where a 50% interest in a replacement dwelling was acquired by inheritance, such as this case with the subject property, and the remaining 50% interest was purchased from other heirs, we have concluded that the replacement property could not be considered to be purchased for purposes of section 69.5. Logically, this analytically this analytical approach suggests that since we treat the original property and replacement dwelling on a single unit basis, anything less than a 100% purchase of the replacement dwelling will not qualify for the benefit. 
So it has to be uh, 100% purchased, not partially inherited and partially purchased. It has to be 100% purchased. The present beneficiary of a trust is not required to purchase his or her interest in the trust property and assets, but becomes the beneficial or equitable owner of that portion designated as his or her share by gift or device at the time the trust becomes irrevocable. So what that sentence just said is as soon as the trust became irrevocable, Andrea automatically inherited her one-third interest in the property. She didn't have to do anything to earn it. it. She automatically inherited it. That is when the lifetime beneficiary's interest terminates on the date of death of the surviving spouse, the present beneficial interest transfers without consideration to the trust beneficiaries. Even though the property and assets in this trust remained undistributed for a substantial time period after the, her mother's death, Mrs. S acquired beneficial ownership at that time. Thus, Mrs. S became the owner of a 33 and one third percent interest in the Piedmont residence where her mother died and the trust became irrevocable. The principle that the present beneficiary of an irrevocable trust is always considered the owner of the property in the trust, in contrast to the trustee who merely holds legal title, has been manifest since the enactment of the change in ownership statutes implementing Proposition 13. Moreover, the trust itself is never viewed as a separate entity for purposes of owning the real property or assets in the trust. Rather, the assessor must look through the trust to determine who has a vested present beneficial and equi equitable interest in the trust property. Based on the foregoing, the purchase by Mr. and Mrs. S of the Piedmont res residence from the trust does not meet the requirements of section 69.5 <clears throat> Mrs. S's 33 and a third percent interest was not a transfer resulting in a change in ownership for consideration since she acquired it by gift or devise as a present beneficiary of the trust on the date of her mother's death. <laughs> Even if the parent-child claim filed by Mrs. Sunder, the section 63.1 exclusion had been denied by the assessor and a change in ownership did result, uh, Mrs. S. did not purchase her interest as required under section 69.5. And instead, 33 and a third percent of the $600,000 purchase price that she and her husband paid, the trust in exchange for title to the replacement property she received back upon distribution from the trust as a result of the trust's interest acquired on her mother's death. So based on this annotation, it is the assessor's position that the change in ownership on January 5th, 2021, does not qualify for the 55 plus exclusion because one third of the property was inherited and two thirds was purchased. This does not satisfy the requirement of revenue taxation code section 69.5 that the property must be fully purchased. Purchase is defined in revenue and taxation code section 67 as a change in ownership for consideration. This is also restated in Property Tax Annotation 200.0087, which is provided for the board as a reference in Assessor's Exhibit B. <clears throat> so, finally, the assessor also checked our conclusion with the Board of Equalization. Uh, we reached out to Glenna Schultz, who is a principal property appraiser with the Board of Equalization, and she confirmed the assessor's findings. <clears throat> so I'm quoting what she wrote to us. Uh, Revenue Taxation Code Section 69.5 and 69.6 requires that a claimant purchase or newly construct a replacement dwelling. Purchase is defined in Revenue Taxation Code se Section 67 as a change in ownership for consideration. This is a two-pronged test, a change in ownership occurs, and something of value is exchanged for the real property. An inheritance does not meet the definition of purchase because nothing of value is exchanged with the descendant in order to receive real property. Additionally, nothing in either section 69.5 or section 69.6 
mention or accommodates a partial interest purchase unless the property is a multi-unit structure. Thus, property tax rule 462.540 provides. The example three, owner is the sole owner of a primary residence, which has a market value of 500,000. Co-owner purchases a 50% interest in owner's property for 250,000. Co-owner sold their original property primary residence for 200,000 meets all other requirements. Co-owner may not transfer the base year value of the, their primary residence to their 50% interest in owner's primary residence since the owner's primary residence did not undergo a 100% change in ownership. Thus, a dwelling that is partially inherited and partly purchased does not qualify as a replacement dwelling under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.6. .6. And she goes on to say, we opine the same under Section 69.5, see property tax annotations, and I've already mentioned those too. So just for clarification, 69.5, is the revenue taxation code that governs the applicant's uh, change in ownership date. 69.6 .6 would be Proposition 19, which we've discussed. Um, <clears throat> that, that was implemented after the trust became irrevocable, so Proposition 19 uh, would not apply in this situation. So we're, we're only looking at revenue taxation code section 69.5 for this one. Uh, next, we have ex Assessor's Exhibit B. <clears throat> You'll see the table of contents there. This um, basically has everything that I just referenced in my Exhibit A. Um, so the first few pages here are the recorded deeds. The first one's the uh, affidavit death of trustee. And... <clears throat> On there, that's where we get our, um, on page, well, you can't really see it. It's page six, but it's kind of blocked. Um, you'll see on there, it says the date of death is January 5th, 2021. So that's where we're getting that date from. It's from this recorded deed or this recorded affidavit of death. Uh, next is the grant deed on July 16th, 2021. This is on page seven. Uh, this is showing that how it was distributed from the trust. This is the one we're saying should no longer be considered um, a reappraisable event, but just be clearing title based on how the trust was dis distributed. On page 11, this is the, I'm sorry, page 10. Page 10 is the uh, close of escrow statement that was provided um, from the applicant. The section I highlighted there is, uh, represents the portion that Andrea Salant uh, inherited. So that's her inherited portion. And then the other portions down there are what the funds that she contributed. Um, and that, is, according to the Board of Equalization, is seen as purchasing it from her two sisters. And then the next page is the trust distribution that was provided by the applicant. And I've highlighted the, the section on page 11 and page 12, which uh, basically is meant to represent what I just said. The two, two of the sisters received the cash, one sister received uh, the property. So that's what those lines are meant to indicate there. <clears throat> um, next couple pages are the property tax rules that I referenced, which state when we're, the date we're supposed to use as the change in ownership is when the trust becomes irrevocable. Property tax annotation 220.0761 is the one, these uh, provide further clarification on that. And then um, I did wanna spend a little bit of hopefully a short amount of time on page 30. <clears throat> this comes from the assessor's handbook, the 401. So I've highlighted the relevant sections. For transfers made through a trust, the date of the change in ownership is the date the property is transferred to the irre irrevocable trust. That's what I <clears throat> read through in my exhibit A. But on page 31, I wanted to 
read a little bit more here. Um, oh, sorry, no, this is what I, I quoted. Yeah, so uh, what I wanted to point out, oh, here we are. So in example 1-2 on page 30, X transfers a property into an inter vivos irrevocable trust. His nephew B was the sole present beneficiary of the trust. Upon X's death, the trustee recorded a deed transferring the property from the trust to B. The property underwent a change in ownership on the date it was transferred into the irre irrevocable trust. There was no change in ownership when the trustee transferred the property from the trust to B. So that's basically showing why the July date should not be a change in ownership, just the day the trust became irrevocable in January prior. So I just wanted to point that out real fast. Um, and then the rest are a lot of the annotations that I had quoted. as well as some revenue and taxation code sections that I quoted. Uh, page, here we go. So page <clears throat> 54 is the full property tax annotation 200.0086. Uh, this was the most relevant annotation for our situation today. So I just wanna make sure the board sees where I quoted it from and I wanna make sure you have the entire document for your review and I highlighted the uh, uh, important sections there. So 86 continues through page um, <clears throat> let's see, 61 and then 62 is annotation uh, 200.0087. This one also kind of reiterates a lot of what the prior annotation 86 states. So that's just some further, um, further support there. Okay, there we go. So that, that will be the extent of our presentation. So in conclusion, The assessor requests the appeals board sustain the assessor's determination that the January 5th, 2021 change in ownership should be changed to a 66.66% reassessable event with one third being excluded from reassessment due to the parent to child exclusion for Andrea Salen's inherited portion. The assessor requests the appeals board sustain the assessor's determination that the July 16th, 2021 deed is a clearing title deed only and should not be considered a reassessable event. Finally, the assessor requests the appeals board sustain the assessor's denial of the 55 plus exclusion. And that'll be it for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does the applicant have any questions for about the assessor's presentation? Uh, I don't know if it's a question for, for Mr. Phillips or if it's a clarification, but for purposes of the parent-child um, transfer exclusion, um, it would be under the old law because um, the, the trustor died January 5th, 2021. For purposes of the 55, of, of the 55 plus exclusion, the pertinent date is July 16th, 2021 because that's when my sister, um, when Andrea purchased the property. Um, there was a, do, uh, do, an email uh, exchange a uh, couple of months ago. Ms. Heisen, I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you have any questions for the, for the assessor regarding their presentation? Uh, if not, well, then we can move on to your, um, your presentation. Okay, well then I'll just make that the start of my presentation. <laughs> okay. Uh, does the board have any questions for the no. assessor? I do. Uh, Mr. Phillips, I just wanna make sure I have the broad brush uh, here. Yeah. There was, um, there's two dates involved. The first date is when uh, the mother passed away mm -hmm. and the property went at that point to three children. And then there was a later deed 
that you, where, that you are saying merely clears the title where it goes to one of the three children. So am I right here that the reappraisable event was the passing of the mother? And even though it went to three children at that time, that doesn't trigger a parent to child exclusion. What the issue here is, is that one of the children received the two thirds share of each of the other children subsequent. Well, yeah, so. So basically, how the Board of Equalization guides us here is um, when we know how the trust is distributed, we basically apply all the events to the date of death. So, um, so when she passed away and then the trust was later distributed, we are saying as of the date of death, based on how it was distributed, uh, Andrea inherited her, inherited her one third and then at the same time purchased, bought out the two sisters based on the distribution. Um, and that comes from, you know, the, the annotations I referred to and a few other sections that are referred to. Um, so I think what the confusion is, if, if we don't know how the trust is distributed, we don't know the, how the trust works, then yes, we would look at it as two separate events because we're just going based off the deeds. But based on the Board of Equalization's guidelines, if we do know how the trust is distributed, then that all gets applied to the, the date of death uh, transfer based on the trust. Um, that's how the Board of Equalization kind of guides us to do that. And my follow-up question has to do with the property tax annotations. Could you tell me, I can't quite remember, do the annotations have the force of law? Uh, I believe no, they don't have the force of law. They're simply uh, basically guidelines and the Board of Equalization's interpretation of the law, their best interpretations of the law. So the annotations get are made available to all assessor's offices. The annotations are um, suggested means of, um, you know, dealing with kind of specific scenarios that can occur in property taxes, but they don't carry the weight of law. They're simply board of, basically what an annotation is, is a, um, you know, a uh, council with the board of equalization was proposed a question. They researched the law and, you know, court decisions and that sort of thing. And they write a excerpt about their opinion of what's kind of the best way to um, resolve it, the situations at hand. So, Thank you. That was sort of my memory. Yeah. Um, is this sort of similar then, and I may be reaching a little bit here, as the letters to assessors? Is that sort of the same sort of thing we're talking about? Um, yes, I believe they are pretty equivalent. They're more uh, guidelines uh, than, they, they don't carry the same root, uh, same weight as a property tax rule um, and that sort of thing. A property tax rule has a little bit more weight than an annotation in that regard. So it, it kind of goes, we got the revenue taxation code and then the next authority is property tax rules and then kind of under that is letters to assessors and annotations and that, those are kind of more descriptive guidelines about very specific scenarios that can occur. Thank you. Yeah. Nope. Really quickly from me, just a clarifying, to make sure that I'm characterizing the assessor's argument correctly. Um, January 5th, that's the reassessable event for the, the partial under the two thirds partial interest. July 16th, not a reassessable event and also not a change of ownership? Uh, correct. Okay. Yes. All right, that's all. Thank you. Okay. okay um, to the applicant, Ms. Heisen, you can. Go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My what? Your copies for the board. Oh. 
I'm going to keep one. Puppies? Yeah, I might as well keep this one with the, these tabs here. Right. Pretty Thank tabs. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, applicants exhibit, um, let's call it zero through eight have been submitted. Yeah. So including the cover page, that'll be at exhibit zero, and then through exhibit, well, actually, let's see. Based on your table of contents, you have 15 different documents in here, Ms. Heisen, is that correct? No, that's not the table of contents. I, I believe what you're looking at, I'm, oh, yeah, it's table of contents, but the exhibits, there is no exhibit list, but the exhibits are one through nine and A through C. Okay. Um, let's just call this package applicants exhibit one, and then I'll sub-identify based on her tables. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You may go ahead, Ms. Eisen. Did you say go ahead? Yeah, you're, you're All right, thank you. Good to go ahead. Um, good afternoon. Um, I first want to clarify what I was beginning to say before, and that is for purposes of the 55 plus exclusion, the pertinent date is July 16th, uh, 2021, because that is when um, Andrea purchased the um, property from the trust. Um, or for property tax purposes from the two, from the two sisters. But that's when the um, purchase occurred for purposes of the um, 55 plus exclusion. And so that date is July 16th. And the difference matters because that puts it under um, Revenue and Taxation Code 69.6, not 69.5. And a couple of months ago, um, Mr. Phillips sent me an email talking about 69.5. And I responded, why are you talking about that? It's 69.6 because the purchase was July 16th, 2021. And Mr. Phillips responded, oh, you're right. Correct. I've been corrected. And, and so it's, um, for the 55 plus exclusion, it is 69.6. Um, all right. Um, I want to just do a preliminary statement concerning Mr. Phillips' resolution of the parent-child transfer. Um, the way we um, the way the way we want to work it out is if this appeal ultimately is denied, then Andrea would agree with Mr. Phillips' proposal to do a two-thirds reassessment January 5th, 2021. Um, however, we believe that Andrea is correct about the 55 plus exclusion. And so if ultimately either here or subsequently um, the 55 plus exclusion is allowed, then Andrea would withdraw her parent-child exclusion claim and stick with the 55 plus exclusion claim. Um, <clears throat> okay, brief been handed out. So that all sounded good, what Mr. Phillips said, but in a, in a couple of minutes, we'll get to where there's a fatal flaw in it. Um, but first, let's just start with the basics that Andrea satisfies every requirement for the 55 plus exclusion. Um, when she was over 55 years of age, she sold her original property where she was owner and resident. She sold it at fair market value. The original property underwent a 100% reassessment. Within two years, Andrea purchased her replacement dwelling, including the land on which it's situated, becoming 100% owner and resident. The sale and purchase both being after April 1st, 2021. Um, both residences are located in California and both received the homeowner exemption. Andrea filed a 55 plus exclusion claim within three years of purchasing her replacement dwelling. She's never received a property tax benefit under 69.6 and she has supplied the assessor with all information as required by law. The replacing dwelling had been held in trust 
Andrea was one of the three beneficiaries. And when the trustor died, Andrea purchased, the re after the trustor died, Andrea purchased the replacement dwelling from the trust, paying the amount that was determined by a highly respected um, independent property appraiser who had deep experience in the area where the replacement dwelling is located. Um, I think most of the exhibits that I've attached are the same as what Mr. Phillips attached to his document, but I will point out exhibit A, which is the escrow closing statement showing that Andrea paid um, fair market value for the replacement dwelling. So what we have is for legal purposes on July 16th, 2021, Andrea purchased 100% of the replacement dwelling. Prior to that, she was legally entitled to 0% of it. And had she not paid full fair market value, the trustee could not have signed the deed to transfer the property to her without violating her um, beneficiary, her, her um, fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries. Um, but for property tax purposes, Mr. Phillips is correct that she had inherited one third of it. Um, and so she purchased two-thirds of the replacement dwelling from her sisters. So and the assessor does not dispute these facts. I think we just both gave the same recitation. The appeal is solely a legal issue. The assessor agrees that Andrea purchased her replacement property, but the assessor says that Andrea did not purchase enough of the replacement property. The assessor says that the replacement dwelling purchase must be a 100% purchase, or else it does not qualify for the over 55 exclusion. Um, so the sole issue in this appeal is whether the replacement dwelling must be a 100% purchase. Um, the um, Proposition 19 passed by the voters in 2020 that led to California Constitution Article 13A, Section 2.1, which was implemented by um, Revenue and Taxation Code 69.6. And then Board of Equalization came with their regulation um, concerning the, over, the 55 plus exclusion, and that is 18 um, CCR 462.540. Um, since, since, since Andrea purchased her replacement dwelling on July 16, 2021, and 69.6 begins with the words, notwithstanding any other law, the controlling law for the 55 plus exclusion in this appeal is the California Constitution Article 13A, Section 2.1, and Revenue and Tax Taxation Code 69.6. Neither the constitutional provision nor Proposition 19 include any requirement for the 55 plus exclusion that is not included in um, Revenue and Taxation Code 69.6. So that's the controlling law here. Um, <clears throat> Board of Equalization admits that a 100% purchase requirement for the replacement dwelling does not exist in any of the controlling law for the 55 plus exclusion. 69.6 um, does state that the person over 55 years of age must have purchased the replacement dwelling. But a requirement for the replacement dwelling purchase to have been a 100% purchase um, does not exist. So the legislature and the Board of Equalization in its regulation could have included a 100% purchase requirement, but they didn't. They did use 100% in other parts of the same um, statute and regulation. For example, there must be a 100% change of ownership of the original property. But for the purchase of the replacement dwelling, they did not use any 100% or any other amount that must be purchased. Um, I'll just give you a quote from a, uh, a case. It's a, it's a common theme in statutory construction. We may not add language to a statute that is not otherwise present. And that's from city and county of San Francisco versus International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 39, 151 Cal App 4th, 936. Another one, the court's function is simply to ascertain and declare what is in terms and, or in substance contained in a statute, not to insert what has been omitted or to omit what has been inserted. And that's Wolski versus Fremont Investment and Loan, 127 Calab 4, 347. So 
If you would please, in your brief, there is an Exhibit A attached, and I want to draw your attention to it, please. That's from, oops, I'm sorry. Let's talk about Exhibit B. No? Maybe we'll talk about Exhibit C. Where is example two? Oh, here it is. I'm sorry, it's exhibit C, my mistake. Okay, so the regulation includes an example two. Um, it starts with, at, at, at 462.540a, it lists the conditions that are required to be met in order to qualify for the 55 plus exclusion. Um, and under the fourth condition is example two. So let's read. Owner sells their primary residence for 550,000. Owner and two other persons together purchase a replacement primary residence for 500,000. If owner is otherwise qualified, the factored base year value of their original primary residence can be transferred to the replacement primary residence. Even though owner only owns a one-third interest in the replacement primary residence, 100% of the original primary residence changed ownership, and 100% of the replacement primary residence underwent a change in ownership within two years. Only owner is considered a claimant, even if the other co if the other co-owners will benefit from owner's base year value transfer. What do we get from that? That means that the person over 55 can get the 55 plus exclusion by purchasing only one third of the replacement dwelling. Andrea, however, purchased two thirds of her replacement dwelling. So based on example two in the regulation, um, it appears that Andrea it qualifies for the 55 plus exclusion because the same thing happened. Um, there was a 100% change of ownership of the original property and the replacement dwelling. And she bought twice as much as the person in example two. So under this example, Andrea qualifies for the over 55 exclusion. So <clears throat> talked about this with uh, Mr. Phillips. And he said, no, no, no. The reason the person in example two qualifies and Andrea does not is because in example two, someone, someone purchased 100% of the replacement property. And with Andrea, she purchased two thirds and inherited two thirds, no one else. So basically, the practical impact of that is that even though Andrea purchased twice as much as the person in example two, and even though Andrea now owns 100% of the property, she doesn't get the exclusion. Whereas this other person in example two, who purchased only one third of the property and owns only one third of the property, does get the exclusion as to two other people who aren't even over 55. So the inequity in that is obvious. But let's look at this theory that you qualify for the exclusion as long as someone purchased 100% of the property. So for that, I want to draw your attention, please, to, let me make sure I'm pointing to the right exhibit this time. Yeah, now we're looking at A. <clears throat> this is from Revenue and Taxation Code 69.6. I'm going to drink some water, I'm sorry. OK. So this is from the applicable statute about the 55 plus exclusion. Which exhibit is this? Yes, we are. And it says, notwithstanding any other law, the following shall apply, shall being mandatory. It says, any person over 55 years of age, I'm talking about the person over 55 years of age, 
who resides in a property that is eligible for the homeowner's exemption may transfer, subject to the conditions and limitations provided in this section, the taxable value of that property to any replacement dwelling that is purchased or newly constructed by that person as their principal residence within two years of the sale of that person, of that person, uh, by, that per by that person of the original property. What this is telling us is that the purchase that we consider has to be by that person who is over 55 years of age. It's not talking about anybody else. It's not saying someone has to buy 100%. The statute that controls this says that the purchase has to be by that person who is over 55 years of age. So the statute does not state that the relevant purchase is a person by the per, uh, is a purchase by the person who's over 55 years of age and by someone else. It does not state the relevant purchase is a purchase by anyone or someone, nor does it state that the person over 55 years of age must purchase 100% of the dwelling. All it says is that the person over 55 years of age must purchase the dwelling, and nobody else is considered. So this theory that you get it if someone purchased 100% is in direct conflict with Revenue and Taxation Code 69.6. So now, going back to example two, and this time looking at it with a lens of the applicable statute, 69.6, we don't consider a purchase by anyone except the person who's over 55 years of age. And in example two, the regulation which has the force and effect of law, unlike annotations, as you said, Mr. Wall. Um, in example two, the only person we look at, the person over 55 years of age, that person purchased only one third of the replacement dwelling. And that person got the over 55 exclusion. Based on that, those two pieces of authority together, both having the force and effect of law, Andrea qualifies for the over 55 exclusion. I'm going to go back and see if I missed anything in that. I'm skipping around. OK. So regulations have the force and effect of law, but the 100% purchase rule is not in the regulation. A long-standing rule of statutory construction says that unless there's a catch-all phrase, which there isn't in 69.6, the expression of some things in a statute necessarily means the exclusion of other things not expressed. That's Gilkes v. Zolin, uh, 6 Cal 4th, 841. So what we have in the regulation is a list of required conditions at the regulation A4. A, um, um, but the requirements in that list um, related to the replacement dwelling purchase only state a timing rule. They don't say anything about the amount that must be purchased or that it must be a 100% purchase. It's just not there. <laughs> Therefore, the rules of statutory construction tell us that no such requirement exists. What is in the regulation at example two is that the person over 55 years of age who purchases less than 100% of the replacement dwelling can qualify for the 55 plus exclusion. <clears throat> the only way to harmonize example two with the express language of Revenue and Taxation Code 69.6a is that there is no requirement that the person who is over 55 years of age must purchase 100% of the dwelling. 
the assessor's alleged 100% purchase requirement could only be possible if the words by that person were not written into 69.6a. And the statute would have simply stated that the replacement dwelling must be purchased or newly constructed without identifying any specific person who purchased. Yet the words by that person are in the statute. Here's another quote. Courts should give meaning to every word of a statute if possible and should avoid a construction making any words surplusage. That's Reno versus Baird, 18 Cal 4th, 640. The assessor's 100% purchase requirement would, put in, conju in conjunction with um, the regulation, would impermissibly leave the statutory words by that person as mere surplusage. And we can't do that. So this means that a 100% purchase of the replacement dwelling is not required. And the fact that someone, in example two, purchased two thirds of the replacement dwelling is immaterial. Um, so the person in example two who's over 55 years of age did not purchase 100% and qualifies. Andrea, with the identical facts, except that she purchased more of the replacement dwelling than the person in example two, with the, with the identical facts, qualifies for the 55 plus exclusion. And that really is the end of the story. Um, the statutory language has to control over what a conflicting annotation says. Excuse me, I have to drink again. I'm talking too much. Okay. It's important to note that what I'm saying is based on the express language in the statute and the express language in the regulation. Unlike the assessor's 100% purchase requirement and the buy someone rule, um, they are based only on inference. So between inference and the express language of a statute, we're bound to go by the express language of the statute and the, and the regulation. Now let's look at intent. That's another exhibit. Let me make sure I give you the right one. OK, this time we're looking at exhibit B. And this is the last exhibit we'll look at. This is from the California Constitution concerning the 55 plus exemption. Limitation on property tax increases on primary residences for seniors, the severely disabled, wildfire, natural disaster victims, and families. It is the intent of the legislature in proposing and the people in adopting this section to do both of the following. The second one is irrelevant to this case. Number one, the intent is to limit property tax increases on primary residences by removing unfair location restrictions on homeowners who are seniors over 55 years of age that need to move closer to family or medical care, downsize, find a home that better fits their needs. And then there's number two, which is immaterial to this. Um, here's another quote. As with any statute, we strive to ascertain and effectuate the legislature's intent. And that's People versus Castaneda, 23 Cal 4th, 743. So under the intent of the Constitution, um, what we want to do is make it so that seniors and other vulnerable po populations who are listed in here, so that those vulnerable populations can change their primary residence without suffering a loss of their property tax base. And that's what Andrea is trying to do. She chose the house she chose. Um, primarily, she had been living um, in her original property for 30 years. She's getting older. She's a widow. There's only one other family member 
immediate family member in the Southern California area who lives nearby, and that's me. And the replacement dwelling is a lot closer to me than Andrea's original property. Um, the replacement dwelling is also closer to her medical, um, where her medical insurance has their facilities. It's a one-story house instead of two, which when you get older is good. So for a number of reasons, um, the replacement dwelling is more suitable to, for her needs. And that's what the intent of the legislature and the voters who passed Proposition 19 wanted to help happen. So she meets the intent of the statute. <clears throat> On the other hand, the 100% purchase requirement, not found in any law, violates the voter and legislative intent, um, and it unfairly and without valid justification attempts to claw back a benefit that the voters in the legislature intended to provide to the vulnerable populations who are listed. Excuse me. I'm really sorry. It'd be nice if it no problem. <laughs> okay. The amount of the exclusion. So, as seen in the regulation, um, 18 CCR 462.540, example two, even if the person over 55 years of age purchases only one third of the replacement dwelling, the 55 plus exclusion amount is not reduced by the amount of the replacement res of the amount of the no, I'm sorry, not reduced by the amount of the replacement residence that the person over 55 years of age did not purchase. That's why those two other people in example two who were not even over 55 years of age also benefited from the exclusion because it applies to 100% of the dwelling. So, because Andrea purchased twice as much of her replacement dwelling as did the person over 55 years of age in the example two, Andrea qualifies for the exclusion, the 55 plus exclusion, and the exclusion amount is not reduced by the amount of her replacement dwelling that for property tax purposes, she did not purchase. Um, while we're talking about intent and things like that, I wanna mention something. Question might arise, well, why allow the additional benefit of the 55 plus exclusion to a person over 55 years of age who doesn't even purchase 100% of the dwelling. Well, example two says you do. But I think the, the reason is that the 55 plus exclusion confers no additional property tax benefit that the person over 55 years of age does not already have at their original property. So, what it does is it prevents them from losing their property tax base. It doesn't give them anything extra. And that's from the formula for um, determining the amount. Uh, you look at the, at the um, compare the two values of the original and the um, replacement dwelling. And if the replacement dwelling has the higher full cash value, then the replacement dwelling's new tax base is the same as that of the original property, plus the difference between the full cash value of the two residences. So you keep the same benefit, no more and no less. Um, and if the replacement dwelling is of lesser value, then the same property tax base transfers over even though it's the properties of lesser value. So you still keep the same benefit. There is no additional benefit at all conferred that the person does not already have. We're giving them nothing extra. All we're doing is preventing them from losing a benefit that they have. <clears throat> but if they do move, their property tax might increase if the new residence is worth more than the last one. Okay, so beyond any doubt, the statute says that Andrea qualifies, the statute plus the regulation put together. But you might be wondering, well, where did these annotations come from? And so I read them, and I looked at their reasoning. 
And while it doesn't matter because the statutory language controls, I want to go into some of it. Um, for the by someone theory, there is no reasoning. It is not written anywhere, meaning there has never been any analysis or any public notice of a by someone theory. And it's in direct conflict with the controlling laws, which include no such restriction and which have an express intent um, and rules of statutory construction contradicting the addition of more restrictions, like the by someone restriction. As for the 100% purchase requirement, it is nowhere in the constitutional provision, Article, uh, uh, Article 13A, Section 2.1. It's not in the controlling statute, 69.6. It's not in Proposition 19. And it's not even in Board of Equalization's own regulation concerning the 55 exclusion, which is, again, 18 CCR 462.540. Not in there. It's not even in any of the 690 pages of the regulations history file, which I obtained through a CPRA request. Not there. So the Board of Equalization admits that a 100% purchase requirement cannot be found in any law. To support its 100% purchase requirement, Board of Equalization points to two regulations. 200.0086, as Mr. Phillips said. And what I read, they also point to 200.0087 and the legal opinions behind them, which I believe are what's included in your packet from Mr. Phillips. <clears throat> None of those, by the way, say anything about a by someone theory. Board of Equalization also pointed, in what I read, to um, Letter to Assessors 2006 slash 010 Q&A J1, but J1 only says an inheritance is not a purchase, uh, which, of course, Andrew agrees with that, um, or for property tax purposes, um, but that's not the issue. The issue is whether a replacement dwelling purchase is required to be a 100% purchase. So the only one that's even getting close to addressing the issue is um, 000.0086. I said that right, 200.0086. So annotations do not have the force and effect of law. Reliance on an annotation or LTA's advice is not considered reasonable reliance on written advice for obtaining relief from failure to pay property tax. In an instance of inconsistent, inconsistency between a statute or regulation and an annotation, statutory or regulatory law is controlling. Because interpretation is an agency's legal opinion, oh, this is a quote, um, however expert it is, let me start over. Because interpretation is an agency's legal opinion, however expert, rather than the exercise of a delegated legislative power to make law, it commands a commensurably lesser degree of judicial deference than quasi-legislative rules, like the regulation. And that's Yamaha Corp, versus, uh, Yamaha Corp of America versus Board of Equalization. Uh, 73 Cal App 4th, 338. So the two annotations interpret the prior statute, 69.5. Um, they do not interpret the statute that's involved in this case for the 55 plus exclusion, um, which is 69.6. The two statutes are similar. Um, but the statute in, involved in Andrea's appeal has some crucial differences from the prior statute. First, it has greatly expanded coverage. Houses worth more than the, um, than the original property, property are, now, are now included in the exclusion. And the exclusion now has statewide application. You can purchase the replacement dwelling anywhere in the state. You're not restricted to buying a dwelling in your original property's um, county. So the added statement of intent, which is not in the prior statute, um, the intent to benefit people in the vulnerable populations, plus the greatly expanded coverage, make the Board of Equalization's erroneous inference of a 100% purchase requirement all the more egregious. 
And the Board of Equalization admits in, its, in the legal opinions that it is merely an inference where they get this 100% purchase requirement. Um, so looking at the annotation's reasoning for their inference of a 100% purchase requirement, it doesn't pass muster. Um, Board of Equalization bases its inference on its assumption that Revenue and tax Taxation Code 69.6 treats the replacement dwelling and the original property as single units. Um, the legal opinion, uh, C03301990, which annotation 200.0086 in part relies on, points to the definition, this is where they get the, the idea that it's uh, single units, uh, points to the definition of replacement dwelling and original property as including the, as the property and the land on which they're situated. Based on that, and that alone, Board of Equalization infers that both residences must be treated on a single unit basis. Then, Board of Equalization uses that to say that less than 100% purchase of the replacement dwelling is disqualified. But those definitions do not state those definitions of the original and the um, replacement properties as being the, the building and the land. Those definitions do not state any single unit status or requirement. They just say it's the building and the land. Board of Equalization does not explain why defining a residence as a building plus land on which it sits means that it cannot be partially purchased or partially purchased and obtained by gift or inheritance. In fact, most buildings are bought and sold with their land. They can be bought and sold in fractional parts, and they can be acquired in part by gift or inheritance. So the single unit um, inference also conflicts with other parts of controlling law. Here are just some examples. The single unit inference conflicts with annotation 200.0092, which allows the 55 plus exclusion for some fractional pur purchases and not for others when some of the fractional purpose, uh, purchases occur outside the statutory two-year period from the original property sale. That's not single unit treatment. The single unit inference conflicts with RTC 69.6 E7, which recognizes the building and new construction as separate parts of the same replacement residence and applies the 55 plus exclusion to them separately. The new construction can be valued after the replacement dwelling is first valued, separate treatment. The land can be purchased and a new home constructed later and still qualify for the exclusion. That's 69.6 B5A. But if the, construct, if the new construction is completed after the two year period, that part will not be part of the 55 plus exclusion. That's um, 69.6 C2B, two little i. None of these are treating the replacement dwelling as a single unit. So how they got a single unit interpretation from that law that doesn't treat it as a single unit is beyond me. Board of Equalization points to the original property, the, the, the requirement that the original property must undergo a 100 change of ownership. They use that to support the single unit inference for the replacement dwelling. I don't think anybody would agree that a requirement concerning one item, here the original property, can be inferred to imply to a completely different item, here the replacement dwelling. Board of Equalization admits that the 100% change in ownership can occur in parts on different days. That's not single unit treatment either. Uh, the legal opinion C128-2000, also underlying annotation 200.0086, says that without a 100% purchase requirement, point of equalization and assessors could not, that's a quote, that they could not perform the equal or lesser value comparison that they're required to do to determine the exclusion amount. They don't give any reason 
that this is so difficult for them. In fact, the comparison is not more difficult without a 100% purchase requirement. RTC 69.6 D7 defines full cash value of the replacement dwelling um, using its full cash value determined in accordance with RTC 110.1. RTC 110.1 uses the fair market value as determined pursuant to set RTC 110 and calls that the base year value. RTC 110, in turn, generally defines full cash value or fair market value as we understand it, it always, um, that it's the, the amount the property would bring on the open market in an arm's length transaction, with a rebuttable presumption that, it, that the purchase price might be something different than the um, fair market value. But these terms, um, wait a second. So the property that's being valued is the replacement dwelling, um, and that's 69.67, and defined in 69.63 as including the structure and the land on which the, the structure is uh, situated. None of these terms, the term, the, the um, fair market value, full cash value, base year value, none of these terms change depending on whether the person purchased 100% of the property, 50% of the property, a third of the property. None of them are affected by the presence or absence of a 100% replacement dwelling purchase requirement. So the required equal or lesser value comparison of the fair, full cash value of the original residence and the replacement dwelling is not impossible, and it's not even more difficult without a 100% purchase requirement for the replacement dwelling. The BOE's alleged inability to perform the equal or lesser comparison conflicts with the Board of Equalization's apparent ability to perform the comparison if more than 100% of the replacement dwelling is purchased. 69.63 states that for purposes of defining the replacement dwelling, land constituting a part of the replacement dwelling includes only so much of reasonable size used as a site for a residence, but does not include land with more than incidental non, with, with more than incidental non-residential use. This means that if you buy land that includes more than incidental non-residential use, that means you just bought more than 100% of the replacement dwelling. And the excess is not treated as part of the replacement residence. And the Board of Equalization apparently has no problem performing the equal or lesser value comparison if more than 100% of the residential dwelling is purchased. But it could not do the same comparison if less than 100% is purchased. This inconsistency, again, shows that a 100% replacement dwelling purchase cannot be inferred. BOE says that a 100% purchase requirement for the replacement dwelling should be inferred because 69.6 does not specify that the requirement does not exist. Well, the Board of Equalization is not using accepted rules of statutory construction, which says, we may not add language to a statute that is not otherwise present. That's City and County of San Francisco versus International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 39, 151 Cal App 4th, 938. So the inference of a single unit treatment also directly conflicts with example two in the regulation that we looked at, interpreting the current law, unlike the annotations, which as discussed, allows the 55 plus exclusion for a fractional pur purchase by the person who is over 55 years of age, that is under 69.6, the only purchase we're supposed to look at. <clears throat> One of the three, uh, I'm so sorry. Okay. One of the three legal opinions, which annotation 200.0086 um, is C330-1990, and it correctly admits at page two of that legal opinion 
Quote, it is fair to say that our conclusions are not necessarily free of doubt, unquote. Um, far from it. For these reasons, the annotations are not entitled to wait because they conflict with the statutory language and the regulatory language that has the weight of law and because they're inconsistent. <clears throat> Further, it's well settled that, is a quote, administrative regulations that violate acts of the legislature as this 100% purchase and buy someone theory do. Um, they go against the 69.6 and example two. Um, it's well settled that administrative regulations that violate acts of the legislature are void and no protestations that they are merely an exercise of administrative discretion can sanctify them. Administrative regulations that alter or amend the statute or enlarge or impair its scope are void and courts not only may, but it is their obligation to strike down such regulations. That's Selby v. Department of Motor Vehicles, 110 Cal App 3rd 470. Uh, it's, a long, it's a whole lot of cases that say this. Another one is Morris v. Williams, 67 Cal 2nd 733. Here, the express language, the express legislative language of 69.6a, limiting consideration to a purchase by that person who is over 55 years of age and the quasi-legislative language of 18 CCR 462-540, example two, allowing less than a 100% purchase by that person who is over 55 years of age to qualify for the 55 plus exclusion, those have the force and effect of law. The 100% purchase requirement and the buy someone theory both impair the scope of those authorities and therefore violate them. As such, the restrictions and the annotations in which they're found should be considered void. Okay, court review. A 100% replacement dwelling purchase requirement for the 55 plus exclusion could not survive court review. Property taxpayers have the right to do a trial to a trial de novo in superior court with regard to the legal issue, which is what this case is, a legal issue. And that's, I can't pronounce it, it's D-U-E-A v. County of San Diego, 204 Cal App 4th, 691. Um, so the issue in this case is legal, whether the 55 plus exclusion provided in 69.6 includes a 100 percent replacement dwelling purchase requirement. A court reviewing an agency interpretation of a governing statute will not give substantial weight to agency interpretations of its governing statutes if the agency's interpretation is consistent with the court's, is, in, is not consistent with the court's own independent analysis of the, of the same statute. For the reasons I've been talking about, I don't think a court is likely to agree that there's a 100% purchase requirement found anywhere in the law. The interpretation must be based on the agency's experience interpreting the statute over a long period of time. Uh, we were able to find no case law or enforcement action concerning 69.6 and a 100% purchase requirement. And 69.6 and the regulation, 462.540, they were both adopted in 2021, only three years ago. That's not longstanding. Um, they are similar to the older statute, but for the reasons I discussed, the new statute and the old statute do have some um, significant differences too. Also, the agency's interpretation must be necessary to achieve the purpose of the law. Here, the 100% purchase requirement is not necessary to achieve the purpose of the 55 plus exclusion, which is to provide the, tax, the, um, the property tax benefit to the vulnerable populations listed in the constitutional provision. In fact, the requirement significantly defeats the exclusion's purpose of helping those vulnerable populations. And accordingly, Board of Equalization's interpretation of 69.6 as having 
a 100% replacement dwelling purchase requirement, and its by someone theory would not survive court review. Uh, burden of proof, as was mentioned, is on the assessor. Andrea has supplied the assessor with all information required by law in this administrative hearing. And so the burden is on the assessor. And I think after, after everything we've talked about today, the assessor has not met its burden of proof. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, 100% purchase requirement for the replacement dwelling is not found in any of the controlling laws for the 55 plus exclusion or in the controlling regulation, 18 CCR 462.540. The express language of 69.6 clarifies that the only relevant purchase is the purchase by that person who is over 55 years of age. While 18 CCR 462.540 example two makes clear that a purchase by that person who is over 55 years of age can be less than 100% purchase and still qualify for the 55 plus exclusion. A 100% purchase requirement and the assessor's argument that the purchase must be by someone, both conflict with the express voter and legislative intent for the 55 plus exclusion set forth in the California Constitution, produce inequitable results, and conflict with the express legislative language of RTC 69.6 and the quasi-legislative language of 18 CCR 462.540, example two. Andrea satisfies each and every requirement for the 55 plus exclusion, and she therefore qualifies for the 55 plus exclusion. And the assessor's denial of Andrea's claim cannot stand. Um, what I just went through is a summary argument, so I would encourage you to please read the brief. It goes into a little more detail, or a lot more detail. Um, and that's what I have to say. Thank you for listening. I know it's late. Oh, it's very late. Th so thank, thank you. you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to see if the board has any questions. Uh, the applicant. This is probably just a housekeeping matter, but on your brief, bottom of page 14, there appears to be a typo. And it's just a typo, but just I want to throw this out there, that uh, in the last paragraph, 69.6 and 18 CCR 462.540 were both adopted in, you have 2001 here, but I believe you meant to say 2021. You are correct. May okay. I, do I just say I want to amend it to say 2021? I'm fine with that. I don't yeah. know the details. Yes. But yes. I've, I've redlined the official copy to reflect 2021 for the okay. board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for finding it. You read fast. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Um, I know we're not talking about the, the value here today. However, I just want, was running through your paperwork here, and I'm not sure of the sales price of the um, property that she sold, I, Leadwell, Leadwell in Winnetka. Um, how, did, how do you satisfy the uh, equal or lesser value issue? Um, it's actually greater than the new, the new property. Um, she sold her original property, I believe it was $470,000. Um, and I also believe that's in one of the exhibits. Uh, yeah, I did, I did see that on the uh, tax. And in 69.6, unlike 69.5, um, the replacement dwelling is allowed to have a greater value than the original property. Okay. 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 Before we go to the assessor, I just want to clarify because I, there's a discrepancy in the amount of decisions your board needs to make. So mm -hmm. I'm going to clarify first with the assessor. Um, assessor, you are saying that you believe the property changed ownership on January 5th, 2021, correct? 
Yes, that's correct. Based on the applicant's testimony today, it seems my understanding was incorrect. Right, um, that's what I'm going to clarify. And you're saying two change in ownerships happened on the, that date, right? The first was 100% change in ownership to three persons, and then a second change in ownership where two people were essentially bought out happened secondary on that same day? Uh, not exactly. We're saying... Uh, we're basically saying it's a <clears throat> essentially a hundred percent change in ownership, but a third of that was inherited and qualifies for the parent to child exclusion. Um, so only sixty six point six six percent of that transfer is considered a change in ownership and is reassessable. So because of the exclusion, uh, essentially 33.34% is not a change in ownership is a, and is not reassessable. Okay. Um, and Ms. Heisen, you're saying you disagree that the property did not change ownership on that date. It did change ownership on July 16th, 2021. Correct? I think it changed ownership twice with regard to the two thirds. I mean, under the, under the trust law, it changed ownership. I haven't thought about this, so <coughs> I hope I'm right. Because this weighs into how many decisions the board has to make. So Ms. Heisen, are you saying on January 5th, 2021, it, three children inherited it, and then in July, 2021, Miss Salant bought out the other two owners. Is yeah. that your position? Yes. Okay. Okay, so it, it looks like the decisions for the board are going to be what the actual change in ownership dates were, what percentages changed, and if it qualifies for the 55 plus. Exclusion. Uh, I just wanted to clarify because, as Mr. Phillips stated, he thought there was agreement on some of the issues, and it doesn't sound like there is. <laughs> all right. I'll, that's all I have. I'll let Mr. Phillips ask or the assessor's representatives ask their question. Yes, and time for the assessor to ask their questions of the applicant. Um, so we don't have any questions. Okay. Then we have uh, closing statements by the assessor. Um, I think the assessor had the burden, so it... Oh, the assessor had the burden. Oh, okay. for, yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Then we have the closing, uh, closing argument from the applicant. Um, Ms. Heisen. Okay. Um, I, I think I can only repeat what I've been saying, and that is that under the combined effect <clears throat> of RTC 69.6 and... The regulation 18 CCR 462.540, what we're left with is that there is no 100% purchase requirement. You don't need to purchase 100%, 100% um, and the person who purchases less than 100% can qualify for the 55 plus exclusion. Um, to say otherwise violates the intent of the statute and the legislative language of the statute. Um, and I don't think there's anything getting any getting around that. The annotations do not support the assessor's position uh, when you think about them. On, on the surface, they appear to, but when you think about the reasoning, they don't at all. Um, they're inconsistent, and they admit that the 100% purchase requirement is not in the law and that they merely inferred it based on what they saw as if you define something as include a, a, a property as including the building and the land, it can only be treated as a single unit, which is not how a building with land is always treated. It's you can't infer that from the fact that it's a building with land, um, and so because we don't have the hundred percent purchase requirement and Andrea meets all the, the uh, requirements of the 55 plus exclusion, she qualifies for it. I also wanna say, um, my understanding 
is that the board members, um, I, I think you're somehow connected to the Board of Equalization. And so, and so, I mean, I'm sitting here saying, I don't know if it's your boss or what, I'm sitting here saying, your boss is wrong. And that's probably hard to hear. But, but you also have an obligation to do the right thing. And so I hope you will read the brief and do the right thing, which is to allow the 55 plus exclusion for Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. And to the assessor. Thank you. Um, so uh, I had a phone call on or about January 24th, 2024 with the applicant. Uh, and that was where I got my um, understanding that we were agreeable to most of the facts and it was just the 55 plus. Uh, so I'm sorry that perhaps that was not the case today. Um, so I believe I've so stated all the sources that justify how the assessor is treating this property under the Board of Equalization's guidelines. Um, you know, when a trust is involved and it becomes irrevocable, everything points to the day it becomes irrevocable is the change in ownership. And once the assessor knows how the trust is distributed, once we get those details, uh, any subsequent deed is just a clearing title, um, making sure title reflects how the trust is distributed. I pointed that out in my presentation exhibit B, um, and a very easy way to follow that is on page 30 of my exhibit B. Uh, this is the Board of Equalization's Assessor's Handbook, and it, uh, on page 30, it basically describes that that's how, you, how it ought to be treated. So that's why we're choosing only that January date when the trust became irrevocable. It's outlined there in that assessor's handbook. Uh, and there's some other supporting documents, but this is the easiest I found to understand. So that would be the best source for that part of it. Um, and then the other source that I already mentioned was the, uh, that annotation. Uh, let me get back to it here. It was annotation 200.0086. Um, you've heard it quoted a lot today by both sides. Um, in the assessor's opinion, the applicant's exact set of circumstances are exactly what is addressed in this annotation. Um, this is the board's authority on how it should be treated based on their interpretations of the laws. Um, I just wanted to say that it's the Board of Equalization's job, they were established to provide these sorts of guidelines to the assessor's offices to establish a unilateral and equalized way of assessing properties. So these annotations, while they don't carry the weight of law, it is the Board of Equalization's job to provide these sorts of guidelines for unique situations, such as how trust should be um, um, treated and all sorts of other scenarios. The law, you know, it's gonna be a bit general and vague because it's trying to cover every single instance in the entire state. These annotations are specifically drafted to cover very specific circumstances. And that's what the board did here. The assessor, you know, we um, abide by the board's uh, authority. We trust their legal team and their legal counsel on these sorts of information. They are the authority we turn to to make sure we are doing things accurately. So for the assessor's office, the annotations carry almost the weight of law. We're, we're gonna follow their guidelines. Um, and the applicant scenario it matches perfectly to annotation 200.0086. So we feel the board has weighed in on this exact scenario and how it should be treated. The first date you see on there is March 30th, 1990. So that's stood the test of time. 
for over 30 years. If this had been challenged and failed, this annotation would be removed from their website. It would no longer be the guidelines to the assessor's office. This is still the ongoing guidelines to this day, regardless if you rely on revenue taxation code 69.5 or 69.6. For the assessor's determination, as of January of 2021, revenue taxation code 69.6 was not in effect. That's the new Proposition 19. So we have to look at 69.5. Under the applicant scenario, uh, if you were to say that um, the July date is, I guess if you're, if you're to say it's two different transfers and the July date, then you would apply 69.6, which is Proposition 19. But as directed by the board, the annotation applies to both revenue and taxation codes. So under the board's guidelines, and I've, I've quoted what the board actually sent to us in an email, under their guidelines, these annotations apply to both code sections, either Prop 19 or the one prior. So it's the assessor's position that no matter how you split it, no matter how you break it down, uh, there's no way to justify the 55 plus exclusion in this scenario. Um, so we feel we've properly supported our position. We've showed all the Board of Equalization guidelines we can on this su subject. Um, I understand the applicant's trying to refute the Board of Equalization. That's just not a position the assessor's office is willing to take. We, we trust the Board of Equalization and their legal team on situations such as this. So, um, so that's why we've suggested what we suggested. We're basically reiterating what the Board of Equalization is telling us to do in this scenario. Um, and that'll be it for the assessor. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, thank you, Ms. Heisen. We appreciate your, your time today. Um, I, do, I, I'm sorry, pardon me. Do I get a rebuttal or anything from what he said? I think that was his closing, wasn't it? He had the burden, the assessor had the burden, so he has the last closing. Yeah, that was the final closing statements. Um, so I guess the short answer is no. <laughs> but we have everything you submitted as well as your testimony. Same uh, with the assessor, which will take it into full consideration, I promise you. Um, as well as... Um, like I said, everything said today, as well as everything, um, the written material, and the board will confer in closed session and um, reach our decisions. And Brendan will inform you of the decision. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And do we need to discuss another date for the valuation <coughs> portion? Thank you for the reminder. I'm not on top of it anymore. It's too late today. <laughs> um, <laughs> <clears throat> so to discuss the issue of value, um, Ms. Heis, uh, yes, Ms. Heisen, but how long do you need to prepare for that? If, if you're, are you still pursuing the issue of assessed value as well? Yes. Okay. Um, are you are you ready to discuss that with the board in the near future? Or do you need? I can, I can discuss it with the with any time. However, um, I don't think. Mr. Phillips even wants to look at valuation until we hear the board's decision about the 55 plus because that would affect the date of the valuation, if, I, if I'm understanding that correctly, right, Mr. Phillips? Yeah, um, yeah so the, the board's decision today would have an effect on the value, uh, specifically w what's the correct date that we should be using and what exclusion should apply. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, the decision today would affect, well, most importantly, the date of value. Right. I forget. Yeah. So board, since, since the date of change in ownership is in question, which would prohibit them from beginning appraisals because of the 90 day rule. Um, I don't like doing this, but it's probably best we continue indefinitely and I'll figure it out after your board decides, uh, since it would be very hard to place a, a right. date on the, but still a moving target. Understood. Okay. All right, so we'll continue that second portion indefinitely. Okay. And I believe that's it, yeah? 
You guys trailed one more item. <laughs> Did we? Uh, Carol Abuhe. Let's see. That is 67 and 68. Oh. Mr. Oh, Phillips, you've been with us all day. Have you had a chance to prepare for this? <laughs> yeah, that was one of my concerns. I have not had a chance to prepare the subpoena. Uh, not quite sure are, how to move forward on that. Are you able to verbalize specific documents to the board that you're requesting? I, I don't know if, if you say, hey, I'm requesting X, Y, Z. Maybe we can... Uh, like, yes. I know we're going to request her appearance before the board. And how about if we just said, we say any related documents to the uh, property address? I would recommend, I, my understanding of Mr. Phillips' testimony earlier was that there was something very specific that he wanted from, yeah. I forget her name, but, and that, so I think the subpoena should, ex should specifically state, and so I think that we can do this, okay. even though Mr. Phillips hasn't had a chance to prepare the subpoena. If he says the document that he wants, mm -hmm. and then... So it, it would be a list of documents? I could, oh. I could do my best to do it off the top of my head, but... I don't want to... I, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't want him to not include everything that he yeah. wants, so it probably is better to do this on another day. Yeah, uh, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about it more, subpoenas can be requested any time in advance of a scheduled hearing, so maybe let's just plan to discuss it at the March 25th hearing or because we've already set April as the compliance right. date so we can your board is next here April, March 25th we can yeah, so we can that, talk about it with a fully drafted subpoena at that time is and that our is that board too I don't I, I don't think it, I'll, I'll we'll work with Mr. Phillips in the assessor's office to make sure it comes back to your next Board two meeting. Okay. Um, so let's not, I think it's March 25th, but let's just not put a date. Let's just say, uh, really, no, because a subpoena can come anytime that before is the us. scheduled hearing. Yeah, so. I do have that as, as uh, board two, okay. March 25th. Okay. So we basically take no action on the subpoena right now. I think we can bring it back whenever is necessary prior to the hearing. Yeah, I, I should have it. I should have it finalized hopefully tomorrow, and I could email uh, Brendan and county council and you guys can discuss ne the next steps, I guess, from okay. there. Okay. <coughs> Sounds good, okay. So with that, Emily, we don't need a formal action on that now that we've, <laughs> okay. So now I think we're good to adjourn. <laughs> okay, uh, meeting is adjourned.